You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. A shooting where? Yeah. Well, who was it that shot? Oh, you don't, huh? Well, where's the man with the gun? Where? We you are in the muster room at the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room. At the 21st precinct. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. Don't worry about that. I'll send the ambulance, too. You just wait outside and show them where it is, okay? Yeah. Yeah, welcome. 21st precinct. It's just lines on the map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and East River wouldn't know what you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their prisons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour. At 12.15 a.m. on post number 9, which covers three square blocks between 1st and York Avenues, patrolman James Joseph Cronin rang into the station house as soon as he reached his post. Then, as is required, he began on 1st Avenue the job of trying the front door of every business establishment. down at the Bronx Grill there. Oh, it's a trouble. Some guy got shot. Who? I don't know. Some guy. Well, who shot him? It's some other guy. I don't know. Were you in there? Yeah, I was in there. I didn't pay no attention, though, until I heard the shot. Bang. Like to have jumped through the ceiling there. Uh, when did it happen? Just now? Yeah, just now. A minute ago. Less. Where did the man go to do the shooting? I don't know. He ran out the door. You see which way he went? Look, he was the guy with the gun. I wasn't too curious about chasing him. Hey, in there, right here. No, okay. Yeah, right back there in the booth. I, I was sitting at the bar there. They were talking to Jerry. That's in the bar pen. Who is it, Jerry? What? Oh, hello, Mr. Cornyn. There's some mess, huh? Some thing I got here? Who is he? I don't know. I've seen him around. I call him Mac. Everybody calls him Mac. I don't know his full name. He was with him. What's his name, I don't know, Officer Mack. Well, you were out with him tonight. Don't you know his name? I met him in a bar over on 2nd Avenue. Mack, that's all I know. I don't even know that. What do you think, Mr. Cohen? You think he's had it? They don't look like any spark of life in him to me. I'll get an ambulance over here. I called, Mr. Cohen. I called in the police department. I've got to call again. You do? They said they were sending the cops and an ambulance over here. Uh, Patrolman Cronin, 21st Precinct. There's a man shot and looks like homicide at 3646 1st Avenue. In a bar and grill. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Oh, would you connect me with the 21st? Thanks. I didn't call the precinct on your headquarters. Uh, hello, Sergeant. Patrolman Cronin, post number nine. Uh, there's a man shot and looks like a homicide in the uh, bar and grill, 3646 1st Avenue. Oh, yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Well, I, had it. Well, I told you. I told him. Oh, well, now, what happens now? What's your name? Anna. Anna Boyd. Where do you live? 735 East 97. Hey, Jerry, can you turn that to the box, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure, Mr. Cronin. Right away. I'll, I'll do it. You never saw him before tonight? No, I never saw him. I was in that bar over on 2nd Avenue. Oh, uh, what bar is that? Oh, do you know the name of it? Uh, who introduced you to him? Nobody. He just got to talking, and then he invited me to have a drink. What's your name? Uh, Joe Hanks. What? Hanks. 
You didn't see what happened. No, I was drinking beer at the bar with my back and I missed Oh, it's off, Mr. Cronin. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, was there anyone else in here when it happened? No, just them back here in the booth, and Joe was at the bar. Yeah, I was at the bar. I didn't see nothing. My back was turned. Isn't that right, Jerry? I was talking to you. Well, where did this man with the gun come from? Well, he came in the front door, Mr. Cronin. You got to look at him? Sure, I got to look at him. I got to look at him when he came in. Instead of coming to the bar, he headed back there to the booth. Did he order a drink? Didn't have any time to order any drink. He didn't sit down. Just walked there to the booth where these people were sitting. Yeah, and then he come up to where Mac and I were sitting, and he stopped right there, and he says, hello, Mac, and Mac says, hello, Phil, and then he says, I don't like the one that came in, yeah. the one Mac called Phil. He says, I don't like what you've been doing, Mac, the words to that effect, and then he just pulled out a gun and he shot him, and I was sitting right there, I was sitting right across from him, and he just pulled out a gun and he shot him. How do you like that? Have you ever seen this fellow before? No, I never seen him. Where would I see him? You know him, Jay? No, oh, I can't say that I do. And you know me, I'm I'm pretty long on places. How about you? Well, I told you my back was to him. I was sitting at the bar there drinking a beer and talking to Jerry. How's Jerry? What do you think? Think he's dead? He sure don't look like he's breathing. I'm seeing breathing. Who's that? Sergeant? Yes, Sergeant. Cronin. What have we got? A shooting. Uh, did the call come through ambulance responding, Sergeant? Yeah. He don't need no ambulance. He needs a hurt. What have these people got to do with the Cronin? And their witnesses. This is Anna Voorhees, Sergeant. She was with him. This is Joe Hans. He was sitting at the bar. And uh, Jerry Gerard, this is his place. All right, Jerry. You better get on behind the bar there. Yes, sir, Sergeant. Behind the bar. And you better get over there with him. Who, oh, me? Uh, yeah, you. Okay. Uh, right where I was sitting when it happened, is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. And you sit down right here, Miss. Do I have to stay so close to him? Just sit down. All right. The only name any of these people know him by is Max, Sergeant. She said she met him in a bar over on 2nd Avenue tonight. They came over here for a drink. Then a man came into place, walked up to the table. Max addressed the other man as Phil. Phil pulled out a gun. Shot him and walked out the door. Is there any provocation, Miss? What's that provocation? Did he threaten him? Oh, no, he didn't threaten him. Did they have words? The only words Max said were, hello, Phil. That's not provocation, is it? No, I don't guess it is. Within a few minutes, an ambulance from Metropolitan Hospital arrived, and the victim of the shooting was pronounced dead by the ambulance surgeon. Within 20 minutes, a deputy medical examiner had arrived and completed a preliminary examination. Before the body was removed to the morgue, it was fingerprinted by a detective from the homicide squad and searched by patrolman Cronin, the first member of the force on the scene. All personal property, with the exception of clothing, was removed from the body to be taken to the station house and turned over to the desk officer. How about his back pockets, Cronin? Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Oh, wait a minute. The tally. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Help roll him over so he can look in his back pocket. Yes, sir. Okay, I got it. Oh, he's on Thank you, sir. Comb. Here's a wallet, Lieutenant. All right, open it up. Any money? Uh, $12 in bills. Two fives and two ones. Any cards in there? Um, yes, sir. Here's a union card. Oh, a social security card. That's the name. Frank McLeese. M-A-C-L-I-S-E. Hmm. I use a selected service registration card. Under the name of Frank McLeese. How old are they? Uh, card dated... Uh, 1946, Lieutenant. Well, he's 18 years old in 1946. What's the address on the card? Uh, 3722 Lexington Avenue. That address probably isn't good anymore, Lieutenant, in 1946. Yeah. Well, here's an operator's license, Lieutenant. Motor vehicle? Yes, sir. What's the address on that? Uh, 821 East 80th Street, Lieutenant. Anything else in there? No, sir. Yes, Captain, over here. All right, Colin. Go ahead and make your inventory. I'll look at the stuff in the station house again. Yes, sir. Get an identification on him, man? Yes, Captain. According to the cards in his pocket, his name is Frank McLeese, M-A-C-L-I-S-E. Resides at 821 East 80th Street, or did until recently. It was a motor vehicle operator's license for that address in his pocket. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to the girl yet, man? I'm going to right now. Well, this shouldn't be too hard for you. No, I don't think so. 
Well, who told you to pick up a strange man in a bar? How did I know he was going to get shot? That's the trouble, all right. Mm. Well, she's worried, Jess, to get to work at 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, I do, and you know what time it is now? It's almost 2 o'clock, and I won't get any sleep at all. Well, I don't think any of us will. Captain, this is Miss Anna Voorhees, Captain Tonelli, commanding officer of the 21st Precinct. How do you do? Hello. Are you positive you're not acquainted with Max's full name? I told you. I only met him tonight, or last night, that is. The name's Frank McLeese. Does that mean anything to you? Why should it mean anything to me? That was his full name. Oh, was it? It appears to be. Well, it probably could be if they call him Max. Look, Captain, could you tell them to let me go home? They don't seem to realize how long I've been here, and I've got to get to work at 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, this case is in the hands of the detectives, Miss. Huh? Well, you're a captain, aren't you? You could do something about it. Well, I'm afraid I can. Take her into the station house, will you, Novak? Yes, sir. Station house? What do I have to go in there for? Let's talk to the bartender. Novak, I'm going to go in there. Come on, Novak. Come on, Novak. Come on, Novak. Hello, Jerry. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. Captain, how are you? Oh, I'm all right, Jerry. Why does something like this always have to happen to me? Well, it didn't quite happen to you. I mean, I mean, in my place. Boy, I never should have unlocked the door today. Today was a big nothing from beginning to end. Didn't seem to open up. The man's name was Frank McLeese, Jerry. Does that mean anything to you? Frank McLeese? Yeah, that's right. No, no, I can't say it does. I told you he didn't come in here very much, maybe two or three times before. I recognized him. I heard some of the people he was with call him Mac, you know? I didn't know whether that was his name or whether they just called him Mac, like some people call everybody Mac. Frank McLeese. Exactly, yeah. You mean a thing to me? What is this guy? Not just on me. I have to come in and shoot up a place of business. What's the matter with him? What makes a guy like that tick, Captain? I don't know, Jerry. When we get him, we'll wind him up and find out. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Those schoolrooms your children have just gone back to, are they overcrowded, understaffed, and poorly equipped? The schoolhouse itself, is it used? Thus, the homicide investigation was underway. Detectives McInerney and Howard were sent to the East 80th Street address found on a card in the murder victim's wallet. The building there was an old law tenement. On a mailbox, they saw the name Frank McLeese. The super of the building admitted the detectives to the flat. There, they found little that would aid them in the investigation. The super knew nothing about his tenant, other than the fact that he lived alone and that he was once an employee of some dry cleaning establishment. Other detectives of the 21st Squad and of the Homicide Squad were busy trying to trace the killer, about whom they knew one principal fact. His first name was Phil. At 3.25 a.m., sector car number two and the sergeant's car answered a call to 590 East 77th Street. A resident of the building had complained of a disturbance in the hall. The disturbance was over by the time the officers arrived, but after they talked to a Mrs. Cortella, about whom the complaint was made, Sergeant Waters put in a call for the detectives. Detectives Vitale and Novak arrived at 3.40 a.m. and walked up the steps to the second floor. What did he say? In the rear? Yeah, in the rear. I don't know if he's there. That door's standing open. Yeah. Sergeant Waters. Yeah, come in. Hi, Sergeant. Sergeant? Mr. Cotella? Mm -hmm. This is Detective Novak and Detective Vitali. How are you doing? Hello, Mr. Cotella. How do you do? Look, I don't see what all this fuss is about with the captains. It was just an argument between me and my husband, and that's all. You said he had a gun, didn't he? No, I didn't see it. I didn't even see him. I didn't even open the door for him. He's the one that said he had a gun. Maybe he's just trying to scare me, that's all. Well, he scared you enough so you wouldn't open a door, didn't he? What would you do? Would you open the door for your husband if he was out there in the hall drunk and hollering and beating on the door and he says he has a gun and he's going to kill you? Well, would you open the door for him? Well, you bet your life you wouldn't need to do that. Well, you two certainly didn't make enough noise. You woke up the whole building. Oh, let him be away. Nobody in this building ever did anything for me, anyway. Listen, Mrs. Catella. You said he might come back, didn't you? Well, he lives here. Sure he's going to come back. Supposing he does have a gun. Now, what we ought to do is have these detectives find him before he does come back and see whether he's got a gun or not. Don't you think that'd be a good idea? 
guess it would. You're telling me you had a picture of him. Why don't you go get it so we can show it to the detective? Oh. It'll give him an idea of what he looks like. Well, if you just wait here, he's bound to come back. I don't see where he's got to go. He's got no place else to go. Why don't you get the picture? Oh, all right, if you want it. Yeah, we'd, uh, we'd like to see it. Well, see if I can find it. It's in here someplace in the bedroom. What's it all about, Sergeant? I, uh, I just wanted to get out of here a minute. Yeah? One of the neighbors said he did have a gun. The neighbor saw it. And you know what the husband's name is? What? Phil. Oh. Phil Patella. Oh, yeah. Yep. And he fits the description of that guy, all right. Did you ask her anything about that, too? No, I didn't mention it. I thought I'd wait until you fellas got here. Nice. Thanks a lot. Oh, listen, uh, did you see my car down the street? I told Eisman to pull it around the corner in case the husband didn't walk him back here. What's around the corner? You didn't ask anything about the shooting? No, I figured she might know where her husband went. She doesn't know about the shooting. Maybe she'll tell you. Well, I found it. Good. Oh, it's only one of them snapshots. I made it myself out in the park last summer. Maybe it was the summer before. I don't know. Well, look, there, you see? There's trees in the background. I made it in Central Park. About uh, how tall is your husband? Oh, he's about... Five, nine, or ten, I guess. Mm-hmm. Has he still got that mustache? Yeah, he still got it. <laughs> he was a prize the way he takes care of it. I wish he'd shave it off. What's his first name, Mrs. Capella? Phil. How old is he? He's 26. He was 26 last June. Do you know where he got that gun? Well, listen, I don't know for sure that he had a gun. He only said he did. I didn't open the door to find out. There wasn't any reason for him to lie, was there? He could lie without a reason. Before he came up here with a gun, what time did you see him last? Well, it was about 6.30 last night. He came home from work, and I gave him some dinner, and he went right out of the house. He was pretty mad about something. I don't know what it was. He just went right out of the house. That gun he was supposed to have, did, uh, did he keep a gun in the house? Well, I never saw it. If he had a gun, he must have got it someplace tonight while he was out. Where were you when he came home? It was 2.30 in the morning. I was in bed asleep. And he woke you up? Oh, sure he woke me up. The way he patted on that door, he woke up the whole building. But that's why the cops came. Didn't he have a key? No, oh, key wouldn't have done him no good. I bolted it from the inside. Well, any man that walks out after supper and doesn't come home anymore until 2.30 in the morning deserves to get bolted out. Why didn't you let him in? Well, I didn't want to get shot, that's why. You haven't any idea where he might have gone? No. Well, if you wait long enough, he'll be back here. Ms. Catella, do you happen to know a woman named Ann Voorhees? Ann Voorhees? That's right. No. no. I don't know anybody by that name. Do you happen to know a man named Frank McLeese? Oh, sure. I know Frank McLeese. What's Frank got to do with this? How well do you know him? Oh, well, I know him pretty well. He's a good friend of mine. Well, I don't understand what he's got to do with this, though. Does Frank live at, uh... 821 East 80th Street. Yeah, that's where he lives. Does your husband know Frank? Sure, he knows it. How well does he know him? Oh, pretty well. Not as well as you do? Oh, no, not as well as I do. You know Frank McLeese better than your husband does. Yes, I'd say I do. Look, I don't want you to drag Frank into anything here. I've had enough trouble with Phil over Frank now. Enough trouble. I just don't want any more. Now, what kind of trouble did you have with your husband over Frank? Well... Phil accuses me of going with him. He says I run around with him all the time when he's at work. But he just stands there and accuses me of it. Gets madder and madder and hollers all over the place. He says I run around with him. He calls me every name in the book. Well, you don't have to put up with that, do you? No, well, to tell you the truth, there's not much I can do. It's plain fact. Oh, I see. Well, what's that got to do with it? You haven't told me that yet. Frank got himself shot tonight. Frank McLean? Yeah, that's fine. Well, how'd he get himself shot? Was he hurt bad? Well, how bad is he hurt? He's dead. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. I'm sorry, Mrs. Capello. Oh, my goodness. These fellas uh, don't need me here anymore, do they? No, uh, no, Sergeant. Thanks a lot. Oh, my goodness. I better get back on the job. Okay. I'll see you. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's awful. It's horrible. Sure is. Oh, who shot him? 
Oh, you don't tell me it was Phil. Phil had a gun, and Frank was shot. Oh. Had him up. What did they do? Did they have a fight? It wasn't much of a fight. Frank was sitting in his bar on First Avenue with this person I asked you about, this uh, Anna Bury. He was? What was he doing with her? Well, he just met her a couple of hours earlier. Oh? Phil walked into the bar, said hello to Mac, pulled out the gun and shot him. Just like that? Just like that. Oh, my goodness. Hey, he's liable to come back here and shoot me. Oh, you know, I just had a feeling when I didn't let him in. I just had a feeling that he was going to do something like this. He had trouble on his mind. If he told you he had a gun, he must have had trouble on his mind. The detectives reported the information they had obtained to Lieutenant King, and he instructed them to remain at the place on a plant in the event the husband, Phil Cotella, did show up. Two more detectives were sent over to the address to cover the outside of the building. In addition, a detailed and accurate description of the suspect was given to each patrolman as he made his hourly ring into the station house. At 4.40 a.m., patrolman Mercado spotted a man loitering in a doorway on 75th Street near 2nd Avenue. He approached the man to question him. As he neared the doorway, the man fired two shots at the officer. Both missed. The man, who appeared to answer the description of Phil Cotella, ran into the rubble left by the wrecking of a half-square block of old buildings to make room for a new junior high school. Patrolman Coley and Eisman in sector car number four heard the shots and joined the chase. While Mercado and Eisman followed the suspect into the pile of bricks and stones, Coley called into the communications bureau by radio for assistance. The area was quickly surrounded. At five in the morning, Lieutenant King, Sergeant Waters, and I held a conference on the sidewalk alongside the park detective cruiser. All right. Well, there's two things we can do, Captain. We can either go in and get him, or we can wait for him to come out. Mm, we could wait a long time for him to come out, man. All right. Stay behind cover there, McCarter. Want to get your head shut off? He's well protected in there. You can see us coming. We can't see him. That's the only thing I don't like, Captain. You want to try to talk him out, man? I don't know how much good talking is going to do with this fellow. It'll take a lot more than talking if you ask me, Captain. Well, we can try. If we stay here too long, we'll have the whole neighborhood up and on the street. That won't help us any. Oh, sure won't. We better go in after him. Okay. Who are those two men over there, Sandy? Coley and Mikado, Captain. Get them over here. Yes, sir. Coley, Mikado. Yes, sir. No, back. Sir, Coley. Yes, okay, All right, Mikado. Take a walk around. Tell all the men we're going in after the guy. Tell them to stay out and get behind cover. All right, McCarter, get going. Yes, sir. I get this. I'm only going to say it once. Yes, sir. Okay. We'll go in through that break in the fence. We're working three teams of two. Sergeant Waters, Neisman, yes, Italian Novak, and Novak, and Captain Kennelly and myself. As soon as we get inside, I want to talk to him. I want to see if I can talk him out. Watch yourself some cover and get behind it. This boy killed one man tonight, and he took two shots at a police officer. It's not going to stop now. All right, now. You all set? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go. Oh, Mr. Cotella, you want to come in? Yes, sir. Okay, hold it. All right. Now, Captain and I are going to head straight for that pile of bricks. Okay, Captain. All right with me. Italian Novak, over that way behind that stack of doors. Yes, sir. Sergeant, you see your cover. Those timbers down there. I can. All right, Captain, let's go. Okay. Mm. Oh. 
Let's move out a little bit, man. Okay. I'll go ahead. You cover me. Okay, now. Go ahead. Get you to kill somebody over a woman. Oh, I don't care about her. There are lots of women. You know what she did? She gave my best suit of clothes, my very best suit of clothes. That rubbed me the wrong way. I wondered what it was, Phil. I knew it must have been something serious. Twenty-first person, Sergeant Waters. Well, where's this? Yeah. Yeah. Is it a fire hydrant? Or is it down? Yeah. Really sprouting, huh? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or... The brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Hildy Park, Eileen Palmer, Harold Stone, Larry Haynes, Bill Lipton, Bill Quinn, John Sylvester, and Bill Smith. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. George Bryan speaking. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, who's this? Yeah. Oh, her daughter. Uh, yeah, she was here. Yeah. No, we sent her on her way. What? Where's she supposed to go? Yeah. I see. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Okay. If you don't hear from us soon, let me know. No, don't worry about that. We'll take care of it. Yeah. Okay. Right away. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and 4 lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. 
My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Immediately upon my arrival at the station house at 7.35, I signed the blotter and went into my office where I changed to uniform. Then I sat down at my desk and read reports and communications to bring myself up to date on the occurrences in the precinct during the previous 24 hours while I was off duty. At 8, I went out into the muster room and behind the desk to turn out the platoon for the day tour. Then I returned to my office to finish reading and signing the reports in time for the precinct messenger to take them to the 6th Division, which is located in the 17th Precinct Station House at 163 East 51st Street. Sector car number 2 came by the house at 9.30, and I went out on patrol of the precinct. It was 10 minutes after 11 when the car pulled up in front of the station house to let me out again. I crossed the sidewalk, walked up the three stone steps into the muster room where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. I headed around behind the desk to sign the blotter. Hello, Captain. Sergeant? Morning, first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Hello, Red. Captain? Okay, What's doing, Red? Mail. It's a quiet tour, Captain. Good. Oh. A teletype order came over. They shifted borough commanders in Queens and the Bronx. Just traded jobs between them? Oh, yes, sir. Effective 8 a.m. tomorrow. Oh. Wonder if they like the new assignment. Well, there's no sense you worrying about it, Red. Uh, no, sir. I guess there isn't. I'll be in my office. Yes, sir. How's your wife, Sergeant? Better, Captain. How much longer does the doctor say she'll have to stay in the hospital? Till the end of the week, that's all. That's good. Okay, thanks a lot. Oh, 
Siento mucho haberle causado tanta molestia. Está bien, señora. What's the trouble now, Captain? Es que no me gusta molestar a nadie. Apologizing for bothering us. Oh. Lieutenant, did a guy in a brown sports jacket just come in here? Who are you? I'm Detective Ed Weiss, my colleague squad. My partner and I were cruising by and spotted this pusher we know. I thought I saw him duck in here. Oh, yeah. Following a brown sports jacket, asked for the detective. For the detective? I sent him upstairs. He's running for me and he runs right into the police station. I'm Captain Kennelly Weiss. You come upstairs with me. Oh, yes, sir. Sergeant, take care of her until Fallon comes out. Yes, sir. Come on, Weiss. Yes, sir. Oh, Lieutenant. Yeah. If he comes back this way, don't let him get out. Well, he won't. That's the only way out, isn't it, Captain? Past the desk? Yes, that's the only way. How do you happen to run in here? Well, we were driving by on the corner, Captain. I spotted him. I told my partner to stop the car, and he must have seen us at the same time. He started walking faster. Up the stairs. Yes, sir. I got out of the car and took after him on foot. It was a one-way street going the wrong way, so my partner drove the car around the next block in case I couldn't catch up with him. Why'd he come in here? I don't know, Captain. I guess he couldn't figure in any place else to go. Why did he ask for the detective? Well, he had to ask for something to get by the desk. Vitaly, did a fellow in a brown sports jacket just come in here? No, Captain. No one just came in here. Is Lieutenant King in his office? Yes, sir, he's in there. Captain Kennelly. Come in, Captain. Uh, Matt, this is Detective Ed Weiss of the Narcotic Squad. Lieutenant Matt King, 21st Squad Commander. Lieutenant? Oh. Uh, he's got a suspect loose in the building, Matt. A suspect? Yes, sir. Well, where in the building? He stopped at the desk a minute ago and asked for the detectives. Desk officer sent him upstairs. Well, what do you want to come up here for? You got me, Lieutenant. Weiss was after him on the street. His partner drove the car around the block to the other end of the street to stop him there in case he got through. He just came into the station house. He didn't come into the squad room, did he? No, Vitaly and Howard are out there. They said he didn't. Did he come upstairs? Well, he went through the back room towards the stairs. Could have come up the stairs, or he could have headed out and back to the cells. Or down to the locker room. Well, it's the first time I ever heard of a cop chasing a suspect into the station house. Well, it's got to be a first time for everything, man. Well, there's no way out except the way he came in. Yes, that's the only way he can go. Let me talk to the desk officer in a minute. Go ahead, Captain. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Now, this Captain Kennelly. You didn't see anything of that boy in the brown sports jacket, did you? No, sir. Let's come back this way. Who's the attendant on the job this tour? Bailey, Captain. Well, you better check Bailey and see if he didn't head back toward the cells instead of coming upstairs. Yes, sir. And grab him if he tries to get out that way, will you? Yes, sir, I'll grab him. Well, let's see if we can find him. He must have been carrying, or else he would have stopped. Back through there are the beds for the detectives. Mm -hmm. But he'd have had to come into the squad room to get through there. You fellas stick around. I might need you. Yes, yes Lieutenant. The only other thing we've got on this floor is old files from the detective squad. Go ahead. Yes, sir. That door is always locked, though. Sit down that way. You are 
listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now, back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. We began an immediate search of the precinct house for the fugitive narcotic suspect. First, we went to the top of the building, the fourth floor, where the old records of the precinct dating back to the 1880s were stored. We looked behind stacks of old blotters and arrest records, behind filing cabinets and cartons filled with reports made by long-forgotten police officers about long-forgotten crimes. When we were satisfied that the suspect was nowhere on the fourth floor, we came down the narrow, winding stairway to the third floor, where the precinct youth patrolman, the hack inspector, the safety officer, and the civil defense patrolman have their offices. Only one of these men, patrolman Jaffe, the hack inspector, was in his office at the time. His attention had been attracted by no one coming onto the floor during the last few minutes. But he said he'd been on the telephone talking to the license bureau and he may not have seen the suspect. We searched each of the offices thoroughly. We searched the washroom and all the storage closets. Well, he's right in there, Captain. He crawled behind everything. I don't think he came up here. He's going to be someplace. Vitaly. Yes, sir. Come on. White. Yeah, here, Lieutenant. Let's go. Well, there was nothing in there but air raid warden helmets. Well, the guy isn't up here. Not unless he crawled up in the back of the plaster. You're sure there's no place he could have gone on the second floor, Lieutenant? Well, the only two doors are to the detective squad and the detective's old file room. If he didn't come into the squad, he would have been seen. And he didn't come into the record room. Well, then he didn't come upstairs at all. When he walked into the back room, he went down instead of up. Let's go look for him. Yes, sir. Who was he kidding coming into the station house, Weiss, huh? I guess it was the only place he could go. He knew if he went down to the end of the block that my partner would be around there with a car waiting for him. The station house is the biggest building in the block. And he knew what he'd find in here. He didn't know what he'd run into in any of the stores. He might have thought that if you missed him and didn't see him come in here, you wouldn't figure it. He might have thought that, yeah. He sure did a lot of thinking. Just a second. I'm going to tell him I'm going downstairs. I'll be downstairs. Okay, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Okay. You figure he was carrying when you saw him? Oh, yeah, he must have been. If he didn't have anything on him, he'd have stopped and talked to us. He had nothing to worry about if he wasn't carrying any goods. These guys are full of conversation when they got no stuff on. But when they're loaded, they make for the nearest exit. Well, we'll take a look in the locker room. What's the layout down there, Captain? Well, there's the lockers. Beyond that, the room with the beds. And there's the washroom with showers. Huh? Did anybody have been down there? There shouldn't have been. Not this time of day. Uh, wait here a second. I want to go out and talk to the desk officer. Yes, sir. Hello, Captain. Is him, Captain? No, Red. He wasn't upstairs. We're going to try down in the lockers. Yeah, he might have gone down there, Captain. You keep your eyes open here. Yes, sir, Captain. No sign of him out there, eh, Captain? No, I haven't seen him. Let's go downstairs. Sorry to put you fellas to all this trouble. It's a novel experience for me looking for a guy in a station house. Get the door up, Tommy. Yes, sir. Go by the lockers first. There's a couple of empty ones there. All right. Open them up. You might have dropped the stuff in there. No, nothing in here. Try the other one. Nothing. All right, I'll tell you what. You two go look in the washroom. The captain and I will go in where the beds are, okay? Okay, Lieutenant. Come on, White. That's this way. All right. Okay, Captain. Yeah, man. This fellow sure can crawl into the wallpaper, can he? Yep. Got to be down here someplace. I don't know where else it could be. Where's the light? It's a wall switch. On the left. Have to open the door. Well, we'd better stand back and reach in. If he's going to do any shooting, he'll have a good shot at us standing in the door. Yep. Okay. Okay. 
I'll get the light. down look under the bed. Nope. How about those two carpets? All right. This guy ought to get 10 years. Yeah, 20. 10 would be too good for him. What's in this closet? Bed linen, I think. And blankets. Where do you live now? 
Oh, the super was lying. He knows I live there. He was lying. Why would he want to lie? He likes to lie. He gets a kick out of it. He likes to get people in trouble with his lies. Where do you live now, Arthur? Oh. Where? All right, up in the Bronx. I moved to the Bronx. Where in the Bronx? 2142 Vernon Avenue. Are you sure of that? Well, sure, I'm sure. I wouldn't tell you if I wasn't sure. Between what streets? Between Metzger and Naomi. Which house is it? It's on the corner there, right on the corner of Naomi. What kind of building is it? What do you mean, what kind of building is it? It's a house. How many stories? Four. Four floors. What floor do you live on? The second. The second in the rear. You live there by yourself? Yeah, all by myself. I got the room all by myself. Just a furnished room? It's uh, two rooms. It's a living room and a small bedroom. You know the building, Captain? Yeah, I know it. Well, I, I got the key for the place. I got the key in my pocket. Uh, you, you, you saw the key when you searched me there, didn't you? Yeah, I saw the key. Well, that's, uh, that's the key to that place. Well, what are we going to find there, Arthur? What do you mean, what are you going to find there? I mean, have you got any goods up there? I told you I was out of that business. And that, that's from penicillin, huh? All right. It's not from penicillin. It's not from penicillin, and you're not out of the business. Yeah, I'm out of the business. Oh, look, I'm only using. See, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not pushing. Not anymore. Are you working out it? Yeah. Where? Well... Here and there, odd jobs. For instance? Well, I pick up a day's work here and there. How do you expect me to know specifics? Arthur, what did you do with the stuff? I didn't do nothing with it. Because I didn't have any. You came into this station house loaded with H, Arthur. Now, where is it? Oh, now, what do you want from me? I didn't. What we want from you is what you did with it. Where'd you throw it? I didn't have any. Now, look, we're going to search this place from top to bottom, Arthur. We've been crawling around in dust behind old filing cabinets and under beds looking for you for half an hour now. If you make us uh, crawl around some more, you're going to owe me a new suit. Well, I'll crawl around if you want. What do I care? What are we going to find up in that flat, Arthur? I don't know. Dirty laundry. You've got the works up there, haven't you? You've got enough stuff to take care of yourself, haven't you? That's good enough for a conviction. Now, what did you do with what you had in your pocket? Yeah. Yeah, you guys are going to keep uh, pestering me until you get an answer, aren't you? You want to know the truth? Yeah. <sighs> All right. All right, I'll give you an answer. Of all the times I'm walking down the street loaded to the gills, and this time they make me. A car pulls up, I make them, and they make me. I see this here guy get out, and he takes out after me. What am I going to do? Here I am, loaded to the gills, every pocket. Why did you come into the police station? Wait, wait. I saw one of them come after me, and I saw the other one stay in the car. I, I knew what he was going to do. He was going to go around the block and come meet me the other way. So I didn't know any of those stores. The only thing in the block was, heaven forbid, a police station. So I figured I'd take my chance. I'd go inside. Where else could I go? I figured the guy that was walking behind me might figure that was the last place in the world I would go. He might figure the last place. He might just pass it up and go on down the block. So I came inside the police station. Again, yeah, you were standing in there when I came in, huh? Yes, I was right there. Talking to some Spanish lady. Yeah, that's right. So I asked where the detectives were. That was the first thing that uh, came into my mind. And you said, upstairs. So I figured you said, upstairs, so I'd go downstairs. So I came down here, and there wasn't anybody in the locker room, so... So this is where I came. What did you do with the stuff you had in your pockets? Well, it was a shame what I did with it. A plain shame. What? I took it back there, and I... I flushed it down the toilet. Did you? Every last nickel's worth of it. You know how much I had? I had $180 in that stuff. I just made the buy this morning. $180. Oh, 
good, cold, hard United States cash. Where'd it go? Down the drain. Down the drain. Every last nickel's worth. Oh, boy, the luck I got. The biggest buy I ever made. Five minutes later, I get hooked. I'm on my way. Just when I was getting set up good in business. Oh, I don't know. It just ain't worthwhile. Nothing's worthwhile. Nothing. You break your neck to work. You make a buck, and where do you wind up? You wind up making heroes out of four cocks. Big heroes. Arthur, if I had to depend upon you to be a hero, I'd quit tomorrow. First Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Oh, wait a minute, what's the address? Yeah. All right. Now, what's the trouble there? Has gas leaking? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or... The brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan on the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Brian Rayburn, Billy Redfield, Harold Stone, Santos Ortega, John Larkin, and Frank Moss. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. Emmy. 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 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Oh, wait a minute. What's the address? Yeah. All right. Now, what's the trouble there? There's gas leaking? From what apartment? Well, how do you know it's leaking? Yeah. Yeah. I see. You are in the muster yeah, room at the 21st Precinct, something. the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. The officers will be right over there. Right away, yeah. You wait outside for them and show them where you think it is. Okay. Twenty first precinct. Just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the one hundred and seventy three thousand people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the twenty first. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and 4 lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It had been a busy night in the precinct. Before midnight, there was a three-alarm fire in a tenement house on 76th Street, a mugging in the 77th Street station of the Lexington Avenue subway, a pedestrian struck by an automobile on Park Avenue, and an armed robbery of a bar and grill on 3rd Avenue. With the exception of the mugging, in which case the victim took a cab to the station house, I had rolled on each of these calls. Following the last, the armed robbery... I got into sector car number two, in which I was on patrol as recorder. I instructed the operator, patrolman Daniel Mercado, to return to the station house. And he proceeded in that direction under the L structure along 3rd Avenue. I don't know, Captain. When he say they were 17 or 18 years old? Yep. 17 year old picking up bars. Yep. Hear about somebody over 20 getting in trouble lately? It's an exception. What's the matter with these kids, anyway? I wish I knew, Mercado. Guns and knives and 
gang fights and muggings. How will they have to get before they learn? Well, I've got to have somebody to teach them before they can learn. That's right. I guess that's the answer. That's over 681. Okay. That's one for the 21st. Ah, 681 and 78. Minus an average. Okay. At 792, East 83rd. A gas leak in the building. Emergency squad and ambulance. Make the run, Mikado. We're almost on top of it. Yes, sir. Then fall. Yes, 
she's dead. The murders are off, Captain. More four of them were on. Any of them. That's Mrs. Apple. All right. Mercado, get the emergency squad up here. Yes, sir. Right away, Captain. What do you think, Captain? How far gone is she? She looks pretty far gone to me. You better get over and stick your head out that window, John. Get yeah. some air. Where's the phone in here? I don't know. In the living room, I think. Hey, you don't think it's going to explode, do you?
What do you say she is, Captain? About 35? Yeah, about that. Think they're going to be able to do any good? Well, they haven't done much good so far, Sergeant. No, they haven't. Look around on this side, will you? Okay. Ah, uh, husband ought to be here by now. Oh, I don't think he's had time to get uptown. Guess not, Captain. Oh, uh, here's a detective. Hello, Captain. Matt? Lieutenant King? Hi, Fitz. Hello, Sergeant. How are they doing, Captain? No response yet, man. Any folks there? Did he leave a note, Sergeant? No, sir. None that we found. All four burners were wide open, Matt. The oven jet was on. The oven door was open. Wasn't any accident. Keep a leg warm, will you? Yeah. What's the name, Sergeant? Mrs. Margaret Heppel. Age? We don't know. Oh, looks about 35. Where's Mr. Heppel? Well, the phone rang almost as we hit the door, man. The phone? Yeah. Lucky the roof didn't blow out. Mm, sure is. Who was it? The husband. Oh. Was it? Yeah. Did that affect you so good? He said he was at a sales meeting at the hotel after. Hmm. He's on his way here now. Why did he call, did he say? He wanted to talk to his wife. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look around, Captain. Seth, you and the sergeant stay here. Okay. Hold it now. We'll switch over tanks. Okay. How's she doing? Any response yet? Uh, no, sir. Not yet. Okay, switch them over. Keep it going. Keep it going now. She, uh... She took those, too, man. I guess she wanted to make a good job of it. No telling how many she used out of the bottle. What are they, sleeping tablets? Well, that's what they look like. We haven't touched them. Seth, come over here and get these sleeping tablets together. This window was closed tight, Matt, but not locked. Mm -hmm. What's in the other rooms, Captain? Find any notes there? Mm, We didn't see any. You want to take a look? Yes. All right, uh, keep that pressure there. Who discovered it, Captain? That's it. One of the tenants smelled gas in the hall, called to the super. Super rang in with it. Mercado and I were heading back to the house from that armed robbery. We were just around the corner when the call came over. We got here first. Pretty nice furniture. They must not be too badly off. No, I guess not. How'd you get inside? We kicked in the door. Oh. Wasn't the cane on the door? No. But it was locked. Hmm. You did kick it, Captain. 210 pounds kicked it in. Sergeant Warner. Captain, the husband's on his way up. I seen him get out of a cab. Okay, so John. I hurried up to tell you. How is she? No response yet. Oh, that's too bad. This is Lieutenant King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad. John Parazzoni, the superintendent of the building. All right, please don't make you look, Connor. Where is she? All right, Mr. Heppel, just take it easy, will you? Where is she? The officers are working on her with respirator equipment. There's nothing you can do. I just suggest that you stay out here with us. There's something I can do. There must be. I know how you feel, and I know that you want to help her all that you can. Well, of course I want to help her. Then I suggest that you stay out here and let the officers do their work. How is she? Do you, do you think she had a chance? Well, they wouldn't be working on her if she didn't. Now, Mr. Happel, why don't you come downstairs to my apartment? They'll let you know what's going on. Won't you, Captain? No, I don't want to get down there. I want to stay here. You can stay here, Mr. Happel. Right here. But is she going to be all right? That's what I want to know. Is she going to be all right? Well, we're doing our best. That's all I can tell you. You should see what they got in there. You should see the equipment. Just tell me honestly. Do you think she has a chance? She's got a chance, Mr. Happel. A good chance. Oh, uh, Mr. Heppel, this is Lieutenant King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad. Detective Squad? Yes, that's right. Well, what are the detectives doing here? What do we need detectives for? We roll on every unusual occurrence. In a case like this, we investigate to see that there are no suspicious circumstances. (laughs) You didn't find any suspicious circumstances around here, did you? No, we didn't. That depends on what you'd call suspicious. Uh, John, why don't you go down and tell all the tenants that they can go back into their apartments now? Oh, I told them all already. Uh, well, go downstairs anyway. Well, what's uh, the... Go down to your own apartment. Uh, all right. I'll get out of my own apartment. 
What does he mean? It depends on what you call suspicious. He didn't mean anything, Mr. Hebel. He must have meant something. He said it. He said it. We didn't. Listen, can I can I just go in there and have a look at her? I'd, I'd like to look at her and see what I can do to help. There's nothing you can do, Mr. Hebel. You're positive about that? Because if there is, I want to do it. I'm positive. Mr. Hebel, what time did you leave the apartment tonight? Well, I guess it was about 7.15, 7.30. You have dinner here? Yeah, sure, I had dinner here. Did your wife give any indication that she was in a depressed mood? No, she didn't. She didn't at all. Was she feeling all right when you left? Of course she was. She wasn't feeling all right, it wouldn't have gone. You told the captain that you were at the hotel after the sales meeting, is that right? Yeah, that's right. The meeting was called for 8 o'clock, so it must have been 7.15, 7.30 when I left the house. So what do you sell? Well, I, I work for the supermarkets. You know, I'm sort of a promotion man for a bakery. I go around to the supermarket, see that the bread and the cakes, the cookies are all displayed. Nice, the root man is servicing the supermarkets okay. That's my job to tend to that. Did you work today? Yeah, sure, I work today. I work every day. Listen, couldn't, couldn't you give me any indication of how she's going to be? I'm worried. I'm awfully worried. We understand that. I'd like to be able to go in and see her. I wish you'd let me. Mr. Happel, there's nothing you can possibly do that's not being done already. You've got plenty of chance to see her. But she may die. She may be dead now. Well, if you insist on going in, Mr. Happel, I'll take you. But I think you're better off waiting out here with us. Well, all right, if that's what you think. What time did you get home from work, Mr. Happel? Oh, it must have been about a quarter to six. I think it was just about a quarter to six because I went in and got washed up and turned on the radio. To the six o'clock news. I listened to the six o'clock news. Was your wife home when you got here? Yeah, sure, she was home. What did she say to you when you got home? I don't know. I don't remember. I don't know exactly what she said. Did you notice whether she was troubled about anything? No. But I told you if she was troubled about anything, I wouldn't have gone to the sales meeting. What time did you have dinner? Well, it was about 6.30, I guess. The news was over. I sat, read the paper for a few minutes, and she called me to come in. What did you have for dinner? Uh, meatloaf. Just meatloaf? No, that was the main dish. She had a vegetable, some coffee, something else, some dessert, some cake I brought home. What did you do after dinner? I helped her with the dishes. Do you help her with the dishes every night? Well, most every night. Did you have any kind of an argument with her before you left? What do you mean, argument? Were you quarreling? No, we weren't quarreling. Why do you ask that? We weren't quarreling. We had no argument. I just helped her with the dishes, put a fresh tie on, and I left. Go to the sales meeting, like I told you. I don't know what makes you think we were arguing. I was just trying to find out why she would do this, Mr. Hebel. You don't seem to have any answer. Oh, I don't. That's the truth. I don't. Has she ever tried anything like this before? Uh, Margaret? Yeah. No, she hasn't. Not that I know of. I'm sure she hasn't. You know, they're taking an awful long time in there. I, I wish you'd do something. I wish they'd get something done. But they're not going to give up hope, are they? No, they won't give up hope. Not while there's a chance. Has she been in good health, Mr. Apple? For my wife? Yes. Yeah. She's been all right, I guess. Just all right? Well, like anybody else, she's had her bad days. She's feeling bad, you know. Has she been under the care of the doctor? Well, as a matter of fact, she has. Is she really ill? She never told me what was the matter. She went to this doctor three or four times. Whenever I asked her about it, she wouldn't say anything. I didn't think it was much. She wasn't in a despondent mood when you left the house? No, no, she was all right. She was fine. Are you sure about that? I'm positive. You don't have any idea why she'd do something like this. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. She was worried about something. What? Well, she's been worried about her sister. Her only sister. Her sister's been in a sanitarium upstate. You know, she's got a, a, a bad chest, TB. You think she might have been despondent over her sister? Well, I didn't say that. Look, you're asking me to search my mind and see if I can think of something else to be despondent over. 
That's the only thing I can think of, her sister. Now, please, please, let me go in. I want to see her. I've, I've got to see her. All right. Okay, man. Sure, Captain. It's okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Heppel. Yeah? Why did you telephone home? What do you mean? As soon as the police officers got in the apartment, the phone rang with you. Oh. Why'd you call her? Oh, I... I don't remember now. Oh, I, I wanted to tell her I'd be home in about a half hour. I want to know if she'd like me to bring some ice cream, something like that. Sometimes she asked me to bring ice cream home. That's why I wanted to find out. But can we go in now? Okay. Has she been taking sleeping tablets, Mr. Heppel? We had some around here. If she couldn't sleep, she took one. It's nothing like a habit. Just occasionally, you know. If she couldn't sleep, sometimes I took her myself. She's in the kitchen. This is Mr. Heppel. Is she going to be all right? They're working, Mr. Heppel. All right, let's try it a little bit more. Uh, I know they're working with you. She's going to be all right. I've got to know that. I've got to know she's going to be all right. That's good. That's good. We're getting some response. We're getting some response, Captain. Good. All right. Get back out of the way, man. Give them some room to work. Thanks, Captain. Thanks a lot. You can make that mixture a little richer now. Okay. That's it. That's it. That's good. What do you think? She's coming around. Looks like she might be all right. Got two pulse. Good pulse. Okay. Good work. Well, she's coming around, Mr. Heppel. Is she? They say they think she'll be all right. Are they sure? Well, they're pretty sure, Mr. Heppel. Captain? Excuse me. Okay, put it on supplemental. Yeah. What is it? He's conscious, Captain. All right, cut it. I want to take the mask off. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mrs. Heppel? Uh, Mrs. Heppel? I'm, I'm dizzy. I'm very dizzy. You'll be all right. Uh, very dizzy. She'll have a shot of caffeine to counteract those sleeping pills as soon as she gets in the hospital, Captain. I don't feel very well. Mr. Heppel. I feel terrible. Yeah. Come here. Very bad. How is she? Is she all right? Excuse me. Oh, Margaret, what uh, happened? What did you do? Uh, Ed? Uh, I'm sorry. Why did you do it? I feel terrible. Don't try to move, Mrs. Heppel. Why did you do it? I... I don't know. I was just tired. Very tired. Oh, Margaret, honey. All right, Mr. Heppel. You better let them get her to the hospital. Oh, very tired. All right, open up that stretcher. Now, <laughs> Captain, I'll see you at the station house.
21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Bryna Rayburn, Harold Stone, Bill Lipton, John Shea, Joseph Julian, and Phil Sterling. Written and directed by Stanley Niff. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. 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 Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Shooting where? Well, who's shooting? Well, are there police officers there? Yeah. Well, where are you? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. Don't worry about it. I'm sending more officers over there. That's right. They're on the way, okay? Okay, thanks. Twenty first precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the one hundred seventy three thousand people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the twenty first. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the twenty first precinct. The twenty first, one hundred and sixty patrolmen, eleven sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I had finished my night tour at 8 a.m. and was not due back on the job for 24 hours. A precinct commander's duty chart is arranged so that there's at least one captain on the job in each division at all times. He reports for his day tour at 8 a.m. and is on the job until 6 p.m. Then, normally, he is off duty until the beginning of his night tour at 4 o'clock the following afternoon and works until 8 o'clock the next morning. But on duty or off, the precinct is still the captain's responsibility, and he is subject to call by the desk officer in the event of any major crime or unusual occurrence. Nothing out of the ordinary occurred in the precinct until 10.18 p.m., when Detectives Novak and Fitzpatrick of the 21st Squad, who had been investigating an apartment burglary, were returning to the station house, heading downtown on Lexington Avenue. So, what good is a manager without a team? That's not the point. The point is a good manager has to have a chance to build a good team. You can't expect a guy like Dressen to come into a club like Washington and build a pennant winner in one year. He's got to have a chance. He's got to have a chance to build the young players up and make a team out of them. Now listen, when the light changes, take a right. I want to stop by that delicatessen and show them a few pictures I'm carrying. Oh, George's? Yeah, there have been some delicatessen stick-ups down in the 15th, too. I had some mug shots pulled on a couple of boys they think might be right for them. I'd like to have George take a look at them. Okay. You take a guy like Dressen. Yeah. What's he going to do with Washington in one year? He didn't perform any miracles out there with that Oakland, California team in one year. Fitch. Did he? What? Hold it here. What's the matter? That looks like Dutch Soaker. Who's Dutch Soaker? He's that friend of Harvey Brider's. Oh, yeah. They yeah, parked the car. There he goes into that bar and grill. Hello, Dutch. Yeah. Oh, hi. How have you been? How have you been? Oh, I can't complain. Let's see, where do I know you from? Where do you work out of the... 21st Squad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember. No, you should. Now, let's go sit in the booth over there. I want to talk to you. Well, I just ordered a bottle of beer. Well, you can drink it in the booth. Yeah, I guess I can. Hey, listen, can I have that beer when it's taken in the booth? Okay, it's coming. How about one for you? No, no, thanks. Can't give it to you till I take the cap off the bottle. I just wanted to move to the booth. Uh, 35 out of a half. Ah, forget it, huh? Some for you? No, uh, not right now. Come on, Dutch. Yeah. You, you sure you uh, you won't have something? No, no, not right now. Sit down. Yeah. 
Well, it's uh, nice running into you. I didn't just run into you, Dutch. Oh, didn't you? A call came over for us to ring in. Oh, yeah? Uh, this is my partner, Detective John Fitzpatrick, Dutch Soak. Hello. How are you? Move in a little bit, Dutch. Yeah, sure. I better ring in first. Yeah, go ahead. I'll be right back. Can we, uh, we order him something? No, I don't think so. Where are you living now, Dutch? Well, it's still the same place, sir. Where's that? 619 St. George Street. In Brooklyn? Yeah, yeah, in Brooklyn, yeah. What are you doing up here? Well, you know, I, I just come up to see a friend. Where is he? Well, I've seen him already. I, I, I just thought I'd, I'd stop in and have a beer before I got the subway home. Where are you working? The same place, you know, truck terminal. You're working steady? Yeah, sure. Every day. What do you hear from Harvey? Harvey? I, I didn't hear anything from Harvey. Well, he broke out nearly a week ago. You mean he hasn't been in touch with you? No. No, he hasn't been in touch with me. Why would he get in touch with me? I thought you were such good friends. Oh, listen, you guys got the wrong impression. We weren't good friends. We just knew each other, that's all. I had a beer or two with him once in a while. I, I don't see where that makes us such good friends. I'm having a beer with you. That doesn't make us uh, bosom buddies, does it? Not necessarily. Sure. They uh, had another flat burglary on Madison Avenue. Yeah? Whitey wanted us to take the squeal. I told him we were tied up. Okay. He's given it to Woods and Vitale. Move over, Dutch. Yeah. <sighs> Dutch says he hasn't seen or heard from Harvey. Oh, look, I, I don't know why you should come after me just because I'm acquainted with the guy. All the information I got was in the newspapers there. I know a couple of months ago you wanted to talk to him for shooting up some guy on the docks. I know you couldn't find him. I know he was collared up in Boston after a stick-up. Some guy got killed there. I know he walked out of jail up there last week. I didn't hear from the guy. I didn't see him. I don't want to hear from him. He's too heavy for me. You get mixed up with a guy like that, it can lead to nothing but trouble. I, I don't want any part of him. I don't blame you, Dutch. That's the truth now. I don't want any part of him. Guy is trigger happy. I got enough troubles of my own. I, I don't need his, too, you know. How much short time you owe, Dutch? Uh, I owe them about 19 months. What was that on? Oh, it's still that same two and a half to five bit grand last name. It was hijacking a truck, wasn't it? Oh, there wasn't any hijacking involved in the first place. The driver wasn't stuck up at all. That trailer was just parked there on a lot. It was broken open. Some guys just broke it open. What do you mean, some guys? It was you, wasn't it? No. No, it wasn't me. Oh, you pleaded guilty? Yeah. Well, I, I figured to cop out was the cheapest thing to do. I couldn't go argue with them. So I copped out for two and a half to five. I did 20 months. I still owe, I owe them 19. Have you been seeing your parole officer regularly? Yeah, sure. I'm okay in that department. Been living up to your parole conditions in all respects? You bet you. All respect. I'm, I'm clean as a whistle. Been getting home by midnight? Every night. Now, it's, uh, it's uh, 10.30 now. You know, I, I'd be home by 11.15, 11.20 if I didn't stop to talk to you. You haven't been seeing any of the boys, have you? Oh, I told you, I, I don't run with that kind of crowd anymore. I'm a hard worker man. I got to be on that job 7.30 in the morning, yeah? How have you been as far as the drinking is concerned? Oh, now, listen, I, I, I stopped in here for one beer. You're not supposed to stop in for any. Yeah, but have a heart. You're supposed to abstain completely from intoxicating liquors. One beer, fellas. Now, listen. And you're supposed to walk right by bars, not go in them. Now, look, you, you, you're not going to make me go back and do that whole 19 months just for one beer, are you? You've got to be reasonable at some point. It's not up to us to make you go back. I know, but you give a rum, uh, bad report to my parole officer, and I'm, I'm back up at Sing Sing, sitting out that 19 months. Oh, now, listen, fellas, be fair, will you? One lousy beer? <laughs> You're not going to hang a man over one beer. Now, you missed the point, Dutch. You're supposed to cooperate with police officers, not lie to them. What do you mean, lie to them? I didn't lie to you. When? When, when, when did I lie to you? You told us you hadn't seen or heard from Harvey. Well, I didn't. What do you want from me? Just the truth, Dutch, that's all. I'm telling you the truth. I tell you what we'll do, Dutch. Look, all I'm asking you to do is be reasonable, huh? One lousy bitch. I will take a ride over the station. Oh, house. fellas. We'll put it up it's to the, the lieutenant. It's the first time I've been in a bar since I got out. Well, looks like it's also going to be the last time. The two detectives, William Novak and John Fitzpatrick, took the parolee and known acquaintance of escaped killer Harvey Brider to their car 
and drove to the station house. There they parked, and at 10.51 p.m., they walked up the three stone steps into the muster room, past Lieutenant Snyder, who was desk officer, and Sergeant Collins, who was on switchboard duty, and into the back room where two division plainclothes men were questioning, prior to booking, a woman they had arrested on charges of disorderly conduct. They escorted Dutch up the rickety stairs to the second floor where the office of the 21st Detective Squad is located. Right over there, Dutch. I know. I know where to go. Okay. Listen, one lousy beer. Be reasonable. Huh? It's not the one beer, Dutch. It's the principle of the thing. What principle? Go ahead. Whitey? Yeah. Did the lieutenant get in? Yeah, he's in his office. I'll keep him here a minute, Fitz. Yeah. Federal case over one beer. No back, Lieutenant. Come in. Not to want a job for in the morning. Yes, Over. Now listen, Lieutenant. Yeah. You know that Harvey Bryder that broke out of jail in Boston last week? The one that's also wanted here in a homicide charge? Yes, sir. What about him? Now, Fitz and I picked up a friend of his in a bar over on Lexington Avenue. Yeah. There's a fellow named Dutch Sokin. He traveled around a lot with Harvey. You know where Harvey is? He says he doesn't, Lieutenant, but he hasn't given us a straight answer yet. What's gonna make him give straight answers? He owes 19 months short time. Yeah? Uh, we collared him in a bar. He was having a drink. I think he's worried about that 19 months. Where is he? Fitz has got him outside. All right, bring him in. Yes, sir. Fitz! Yeah? Come on in. What does he owe this short time for? Grand larceny, Lieutenant. Right in there, Judge. Okay, yeah. Close the door, Novak. Yes, sir. Lieutenant King, Dutch Soakin. Sit down, Dutch. Hang me over one bottle, one beer. Sit down. All right. Where's Harvey? I told them. I told them I don't know. I haven't seen him. I haven't heard from him. What do you want from me? Dutch, these detectives told me you haven't given them a straight answer in an hour. Now, you've seen Harvey. Or you've heard from him, haven't you? No, sir. Where is he? I don't know. I told them I don't know. How many times they have to ask me? I don't know anything. I told him I don't want to run with that kind of guy anymore. It just means trouble, that's all, trouble. You owe 19 months short time, and they called you in a bar. I was having a beer, one beer, Lutzen. That's one too many. What's the name of your parole officer? Oh, now, look, be reasonable, will you? Who's your parole officer? I don't want to go back to do that 19 months over one beer. I ask you to be fair. Just be fair with me. We've been asking you to be fair with us, Dutch. Listen, can you forget about this if, if I see what I can do to help you out? I, I'm willing to trade, Lieutenant. I just want to be sure I'm on firm ground. Dutch, you've got a long way to go before you're on firm ground. Now, you help us. I promise I'll talk to the man. Where's Harvey? I don't know. That's not helping. I don't know. I, I, I only heard from him. When? Yesterday. I was hustling packing cases on the job. The foreman came over. He said there was an important telephone call for me. I went to the office. I got it. It was Harvey. Is he in New York? Yeah. Yeah, he's in New York. I told him, look, Harvey, you're too hot. I don't want anything to do with you. He said, I got to do him a favor. I said, I don't want to see you, Harvey. I don't want anything to do with you. He said, all he wanted to do was me to contact his girl. I should make arrangements for them to make a meeting. Who's she? Her name's Dorothy, Dorothy Kirk. Where she live? 372 East 80th. Did you contact her? Yeah. That's where I was tonight. I was there, contact, and I was giving her the message. That's all. That's all I told him I would do. Only give her the message. That's all. I didn't want anything else to do with it. What was the message? The message was that uh, she was to call a certain telephone number at 10 o'clock. That's all. What telephone number? Pennsylvania 65599. Where's that? I don't know. I haven't any idea. He said she don't have a phone. He didn't want to risk going there. He just... Give me this number. He told me to have her call. That's all I know, Lieutenant. That's that's all I wanted to do with it. Okay. All right, now, look, I, uh, I helped you out. You going to do something for me? I don't want to do that 19 months over one little beer. That's a long time. You know, I've been okay otherwise. I've been clean as a whistle. Yeah, Dutch, maybe you have. Trouble is, there are all kinds of whistles... You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city. This is the second trial you've had since they accused you of a crime you didn't commit. 
As you sit there in the crowded courtroom, you know that there'll be another trial, and another and another if necessary, until finally the jury brings in a verdict of guilty. That's the way they want it. You wouldn't sign their phony confession. They can't pile up enough real evidence to make the charges stick. So this will go on and on until the jury is worn down, until that jury is ready to hang you rather than go through another trial. Well, there's a very good reason why you could never get in a spot like that. It's against the law, against the highest law of our land. You can't be placed in double jeopardy. You can't be tried again and again for the same offense where your life is at stake. The words that protect you against it are found in our Constitution, the fifth article of our Bill of Rights. Listen to what they say. No person shall be subject for the same offense to be twice placed in jeopardy of life or limb. That law goes clear back to the first Congress in 1789, City of New York. The group of men who gathered there to sign the Bill of Rights had you in mind. They were mindful of all the people and determined that the rights and freedoms of the people should never be ignored or denied. The Fifth Amendment is part of those rights. It is one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. Lieutenant King and his detectives interrogated Dutch for some time longer until they finally concluded that he knew no more than he had told them. In the meantime, the telephone number was checked out. It was a pay station in a bar and grill on 8th Avenue in the Times Square district. Lieutenant King sent detectives Howard and Vitale to the place. There was no sign of Harvey Brider. Neither the bartender nor three waitresses there remembered him, nor could they identify his photograph. One of them, however, recalled that the pay telephone did ring about 10 o'clock and that a man sitting at a nearby table walked into the booth to answer. At 10 minutes to 12, Lieutenant King and Detective Novak left the station house and drove to the address of Dorothy Kurt, 372 East 80th Street, given to them by Dutch. They parked down the street from the old four-story tenement building and got out of their car to meet Detectives Fitzpatrick and Scanlon, who had been sent to plant the building while the questioning of Dutch was in progress. Okay. Yes, sir. Fitz? Yes, sir. Here, Lieutenant. Hi, Fitz. No back? Where's Scanlon? Across the street there in the doorway to the cleaners. Oh, yeah. What'd you find out? I talked to the super. She lives in the second floor front, all right. Uh -huh. She's got two rooms. She lives there alone. She have any visitors recently? Well, the super told me he hadn't noticed any. Do you know whether she's home? There was a light up there a little while ago. It was turned out about 11.30. Which window is it? Those two up there. Second floor, this side. Hmm. The super said the one towards this end of the building is in the living room. The other's in the bedroom. Okay, let's go. Yes, sir. Did you get any more out of Dutch? No, nah, nothing. Well, I guess we don't need any more. Yeah. Front door is open. Okay, hold it. Signal Scanlon to move over to this side when we go in. Yes, sir. Okay, Lieutenant. All right. Get the door. Yes, sir. Go on. Watch your step. She might have met him and brought him home. Yes, sir. She might have, yeah. Okay. Okay, go on. I'll do the talking. Yes, sir. <clears throat> In front there. fixed. Well, who is it? It's Dutch. Who? Dutch. Oh, hi. Just now we sounded... Good police officers. Listen. Where's Harvey? Is he here? No. Watch her, Fitz. He's not here. We'll take a look. He's not in there. 
Watch it. Kick the door open. Okay. That closet. You set? Yes, sir. How about the bathroom? Okay. All right. Open it up. There's the light. Push back the shower curtain. Yes, sir. There's nothing but laundry. Okay. Come on. Yes, sir. Think she knows where he is? We'll find out if she does. Oh, in my bedroom like that. All right, just sit down. I told you he wasn't here. You could have believed me. Where is he? I don't know. You spoke to him at 10 o'clock. Who told you that, Dutch? Doesn't make any difference who told us. It'll make a difference to Dutch. Now, look, you're in big trouble. This guy Harvey is as hot as a $2 pistol for homicide. One here and one in Boston. Better stop thinking about him. Start thinking about yourself a little bit. I didn't do anything. You can't hurt me. You've hurt yourself enough already. I'm not kidding you. You're in big trouble. Where is he? I told you I don't know. What'd you talk about on the phone? I didn't say I talked to him. Dutch said that. Hmm. All right, Novak. I'm not getting any place here. Let's go. Come on, miss. Wait a minute. Where am I going? Where do you think? You've got no right to put me in jail. I didn't do anything. I didn't do a thing. You've been harboring a fugitive. I haven't been harboring anybody. I wouldn't be surprised if you helped him escape. What are you talking about? I didn't have anything to do with that. You can tell us all about it at the station house. Better put some comfortable clothes on and pack a few things to take with you. What do you mean, pack a few things? Well, you better take your toothbrush and toothpaste and anything else you think you might need in the next three or four days. Three or four days? If you're lucky. Now, wait a minute. I didn't do anything. I was just sitting here in New York, minding my own business, that's all. You can't put me in jail for minding my own business. Can he? Well, Lieutenant, maybe she wants to help us. Maybe she's just scared of Harvey. You go in there with her, Novak. See that she gets those things together. Is that right? Are you just scared of him? Well, sure, I'm scared of him. I'm scared to death of him. He killed two people, didn't he? What do you want me to do, be not scared of him? Well, if you're scared of him, we're willing to help you. Is that right, Lieutenant? She wants it all one way. She wants help, but she doesn't want to give any. Let's go. We're wasting time around here. Better go in and get your things together, miss. Look, tell him I want to help him. I'll help him if I can. You better get your stuff together. You're not giving me a chance now. I told you I'd help you. All right. If you want to help us, tell me where Harvey is. I don't know. I really don't. Honestly, I swear it. Not right now. You spoke to him on the phone tonight, didn't you? Yeah, I spoke to him. Dutch brought a message here that I should call a number. I don't remember what it is. I got it written down. I got it written down over there. Never mind. We know it. Well, Dutch brought the number. He said I should call it. Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock on the note. Well, I got no phone up here, so I went down to the candy store at ten o'clock and I made the call. It was Harvey. What did he want? Well, he asked me if I heard what happened to him. I told him I did. He said he was looking for a place to stay. He asked me if he could stay here, and I told him no, he couldn't stay here. I said, that was out of the question. He said, I had to help him because he was in a big jam and hot as a firecracker. He said, I just had to help him. In what way did he want you to help him? Well, he said he needed money most. You see, when he was in New York before, he left $300 with me. He said he wanted it back. He asked me if I had it. I told him, sure I had it. He said, all right, he'd meet me. Meet me tomorrow morning. Did you make a date? Yeah, I made a date with him. Tomorrow morning, 9.30. Where? He said I should be on the uptown platform at the 77th Street Station, the Lexington Avenue subway. He'd get off the train 9.30 tomorrow morning. You told him you were going to meet him? Yeah. I told him I was, but I wasn't. I was going to pack up and go to my sister's house tonight. Why? Well, to tell you the truth, I spent the $300. The girl, Dorothy Kirk, was taken to the station house by Lieutenant King and Detective Novak. Detectives Scanlon and Fitzpatrick remained on a plant at the building in the event the fugitive showed up during the night. Lieutenant King notified Lieutenant Snyder, the desk officer on the job, and informed him that the subway station at Lexington Avenue and 77th Street would be the scene of considerable police activity in the morning. Lieutenant Snyder called me at my home at 4.30 a.m. and gave me a report of the situation. Immediately upon arrival at the station house, I signed the blotter and went upstairs to confer with Lieutenant King. At 8.30 a.m., detectives and uniformed officers began to man the posts assigned to them on the street and on the subway platform. 
At 8.50, it was decided to change plans slightly. The girl, Dorothy Kurt, would remain at the station house. It was planned originally that she stand on the platform where the fugitive could see her. This idea was abandoned as too dangerous for the girl. At five minutes after nine, I joined Lieutenant King at his post next to a bench near the center of the platform. We waited. By 9.20, the fugitive had not shown up. He hadn't come by 9.31. He was late. Here comes another train, I think, Captain. Uh, it's an express, Matt. Yes, sir. Well, the local shouldn't be far behind. 32 minutes after, Captain. What? 32 minutes after 9. Yeah. Think he's going to show? Well, he'd better, after all our preparation. Yeah, but it still wouldn't surprise me if he was supposed to meet that girl some other time, some other place. Wait a minute. Here comes the local. Yes, sir. Looks like everybody's set. He's coming. You ought to be on this one. Seven cars. You see him, Captain? No. Nope. Way down there. Last car. That might be him. No back made him. Come on. this way. Go back! Watch out! Come on. Take cover, Captain. Get behind that scale. Right. Where is he? You see him? There he is! He's down at the end of the platform! There he is! Duck! Go back! Do you see him? He's over there behind that bench. The bench down at the end. Keep your head down! Stay down there! Stay down over there! Stay down! Matt? Yes, sir? Watch him! He's ready for it. Get him. There he comes. Here he comes, man. You've got him. You've hit him. Hold it up. Hold it up. He's down. Come on, Captain. Keep those people back. Keep them out of here. Yes, we're okay, Captain. Bring in for an ambulance. You all right, Novak? Yes, Lieutenant. I'm okay. How does he look, Sergeant? He could be better, Captain. I think he's had it. He got off the train. I walked behind him. I called him to hold up. He turned on me, firing away. <sighs> Just when he didn't see the girl on the platform, he suspected something. Hey, one of you ring it for an ambulance? It's all taken care of, Sergeant. Well, this is one tough baby we won't have to worry about anymore, Captain. No, but don't be too hopeful, Matt. There'll be others. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Stole your what? Yeah. Oh. Well, where was this? 643? Where was it? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, were the doors to the car locked? Well, how long were you away from the car? Yeah. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week... Every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Elspeth Eric, Harold Stone, John Sylvester, Bill Zuckert, Ralph Camargo, and John Gibson. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>
21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Stole your what? Yeah. Oh. Well, where was this? 647? Well, where was it? Uh-huh. Well, you are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, I'll tell you what you'd better do. You'd better come into the station house and give a report to the detectives. Yeah, that's right. Between Lexington and 3rd. Okay, you're welcome. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. During the early part of the tour, I had been called in from patrol to investigate the attempted suicide of a prisoner confined in the cells in the rear of the station house. The prisoner, a young man of 23, had been arrested by detectives during the afternoon on a charge of grand larceny. After questioning, he had been booked by the desk officer and placed in a cell to await the opening of court. At the time of his booking, his necktie, belt, and shoelaces had been taken from him but he attempted to hang himself using his shirt sleeve as a noose. Patrolman Bailey, the station house attendant who was in charge of the cells and the prisoners, prevented the suicide with the assistance of the 124 man, Patrolman Fallon. When I returned to the station house, I talked to the prisoner who appeared to be demented. I instructed the desk officer, Lieutenant Gorman, to notify the communications bureau of the occurrence and to send for an ambulance. A UF-49 addressed to the New York State Commissioner of Correction covering the details of the incident was prepared by Patrolman Fallon and was on my desk for my signature when I returned from my meal at 10 minutes after 8. I signed the communications along with other reports and walked out into the muster room where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Captain. Hello, Sergeant. What kind of prisoner? Well, what's doing, Red? Pretty quiet tour, Captain. Good. Oh, uh, how's the boy that tried to string himself up back there? Did you hear? Uh, yes, sir. Bellevue notified me he's ready for court. But they think he's a definite psycho. Well, there's not much doubt about that. Lieutenant. Yes, Sergeant. Coley's got a boy over there who's standing near a firebox and about to pull the hook. Yeah? He thinks it might be the kid who's been turning in these false alarms. I'm going to send a car around for him. Okay, send number five. And, uh, I want to go out on patrol, Red. Yes, sir. Sergeant? Yes, sir. And have number two come by the house to take the captain on patrol. Yes, sir. Excuse me, is this where we report oh, something stolen? Oh, yes, ma'am, right here. Oh, what is it that was stolen? A violoncello. Your what? Um, his cello, a musical oh. instrument. Oh. It's my Joseph. Darling, please. Where would I get another Joseph? Where? Just let me tell them, darling. I'm sure they can find it. Never. Where would they find it? Where? Well, maybe we can if you just tell us what it's all about. Uh, where was it stolen from? From under my eyes, from under my very eyes. Please, Igor. Where can I get another Joseph? Igor. All right, all right. Uh, we were going to our place in the country, in Rockland County. Nyack, you know where is Nyack? Yes. Well, we had the car parked in front of our apartment house. In front, right in front. Where is your apartment house? 647 Park Avenue. Under my very eyes. My oh, Joseph. Igor. My life! <laughs> Please, darling, okay. they'll try to get it back, won't you? We'll try, sure. Captain, number two is on the way for you. Okay. Uh, you had the car parked in front of your apartment. Yes, that's right. We were going to the country for the weekend. My husband had just gone upstairs with the doorman to get a suitcase, and I, I was down at the car. To leave the car with my Joseph inside. All right, darling. I'm sorry. Sorry? What could be sorry? Well, you see, I, I remembered something else I wanted my husband to bring down. So I just stepped inside the foyer for a minute to use the house phone. Uh, I was only inside a minute. Ten seconds was too much. One second. The cello was already in the car? I brought it downstairs myself when the, the, the garage came with the, the machine, myself. Nobody is allowed to even lift up my Joseph except me. Now, where is it? Some thief, okay. some bomb. That's where it is. Did you see the thief? No, no, I didn't see him. I couldn't from where I was phoning. Did you notice it was missing right away? 
I noticed it was missing when I came downstairs. Well, I had no reason to look in the car. You had no reason to look someplace else with my Joseph in there. I never dreamed it could happen in one minute. It takes less time than that to happen. Uh, what is your name, please? Uh, we are Mr. and Mrs. Rudwig. Rudwig. Your first name? Igor, I am. She is Irene. 647 Park Avenue. Yes, yes. Aren't you the virtuoso who'll be soloist with the Philharmonic next Monday night at Carnegie Hall? In the main auditorium. Not without my Joseph. Darling, you can use the Amati. My Joseph or nothing? Or nothing? Uh, what is Joseph? A nickname for the cello or something? A nickname? It's a Joseph. Uh, Joseph is an instrument made by Giuseppe Guarneri. Oh, oh, I, I, I thought that was just what he called it. Huh? Giuseppe, Joseph, Guarneri. It was made in Cremona in, 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 in 1759. Like a Stradivarius, you mean? What, like a Stradivarius? There is no comparison, none. A Stradivarius is a, a tone, sweet, sugary. A Joseph is robust, full, no comparison. A cello isn't that great big one, is it? That's a double bass. A double bass is not for a virtuoso. A double bass plays the boom, boom, boom in the full orchestra. Oh. A cello is, is this high, 48 inches. Uh, you can identify the instrument if it's recovered, can't you? Of course. How many Josephs are there? And how many in this country? But uh, your particular I, one. I can identify it. Uh, was it in a case? Naturally. I don't take it in the machine naked. It's in a case, a, a dark brown case. His initials are on it, I.R. How valuable is this instrument? Very valuable. Well, how much is it worth? Priceless, extremely priceless. Uh, how much did you pay for it? I paid nothing for it. He inherited it from his father. His father was a virtuoso before him. All over Europe. Well, uh, how much would it be worth in today's market? It, it, it is impossible to say. There is no uh, today's market because there has been no Joseph sold for years. For, for many years, they are unique. Do you have it insured? Uh, is it insured? Yes, it's insured. For how much? $20,000. For one cello? Oh, the money is nothing. I don't want the money. I can get money. But where can I get another Joseph? I want my Joseph. Do you think you can find it? Never, never. It's gone. Well, we'll try you better send them up to the detectives, Lieutenant. The, the, the detectives? Yes, they'll uh, make an investigation and try to locate it. Captain, the car's here. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's all right. We'll see what we can do. Uh, Captain, what? What is it? Canelli. Canelli. Yes. Uh, the lieutenant will send you upstairs, and the detectives will handle the case. I'm going to roll, then. Yes, sir. Oh, you go through that door and up the stairs. I'll see you, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Through that door there. That's right. Captain. Carl. Uh, there's a political rally at 80th Street, New York Avenue. Let's take a look over there. Yes, sir. Well, who do you think it's going to be this year, Captain? In what? Republicans or Democrats? Oh. Now, who do you think? I wouldn't know. Well, the press keeps hopping on the fact that registration is way down from the last off year election. It's supposed to be some sort of indication. Oh. Uh -huh. Which way? Well, that's something the experts couldn't make up their minds about. Some say one way, some say the other. Well, I guess it depends which side the expert is pulling for. Yes, sir, I guess it does. Yeah, but it's a hard one to figure, though. You take things like what happened in Maine, and the president with his personal appeal, and scandal here and there, and kennel dogs. Uh, you roll them up, and what do you got? What? <laughs> Beats me. Well, I wouldn't worry about it, Vaccaro. It'll all be solved for you the morning after election. Yes, sir, I guess it will. Oh, you want to go up uh, first to York, Captain? Either way. Yes, sir. Pull in, Vaccaro. Yes, sir. Well, what's the matter? Oh, I, uh... I want to take a look at that man sleeping on the steps back there. He looks like a bum, Captain. A rummy. Yes, sir, he is a bum. Boy, these guys will crawl in any place. What's, uh, what's that he's got with him there? Oh, come on. This guy isn't any working musician. No, I don't think so. All right, come on, mister. Oh, You'll have to do your sleeping at home. Come on. Oh, oh would you? Oh. 
Oh, boy, this guy is blotto, Captain. All right, come on, Dad. Let's put the show on the road, huh? Oh, Watch God. out for that thing, Vaccaro. Yes, sir. What's in there? A cello or something? Yeah, a cello. All right, listen, Pops. You'll have to go someplace with room service now. Come on, huh? little action uh, here. Uh, Let's uh, go. Uh, uh, go. Uh, look, Pop, you'll have to do better than that. What's he done with the cello, Captain? Mm. Where'd he get it? I've got a good idea with those initials. All right, come on, Dad. All right. Hey, uh, come around the corner, huh? Around You're on the, the house there. Uh, uh, I knew that'd get a rise uh, out of him. What's the matter? Is someone here? Trouble? All right, you'd better move on, folks. It's just a man drunk. You're right, it's a sir. spectacle of him. Come on, Dad, sit up. All right, sit up. Uh, Come on. He's going to need more convincing than that, Captain. Let's get that cello out of the way. I don't want it damaged. No, yes, sir. sir. Watch it. Be careful. Yes, sir, I will. Now, look, Dad. Huh? Fun's fun. Let's sit up, huh? Yeah, it's all fun. Hold him up there. I've got this side. All right. Come on, uh, Dad. Uh, I... Party's over. Oh, this mm. bum is really polluted. Uh, Where'd you get it, Dad? Uh, where'd I get what? All right, all right. Sit up there now. Uh, the cello. Where'd you get the cello? Oh, what cello? That cello right there. In Milano. In Milano a long, long time ago. Oh, Dad, come off it, will you? You've never been to Milano. No, I've been, I've been, I've been again. You've been a lot of places, huh, Pop? Most any place you can name. Rikers Island included? Rikers Island included. And Bellevue. You lifted that cello out of a car on Park Avenue, didn't you? No. no. Hold him up. Come on, Dad. Sit up. Hold him. All, All right. right. Come on, Dad. No. Well, this old bird sure knows when to lose consciousness, don't he? Come on, Dad. On your feet. All right. Come on. On, on, on the feet. feet. Come on. on. On the feet. Hold him. Yeah. Watch please. it now, please. Watch it. All right. All right. All right. Where are we going? Would you mind telling me where we were going? To the station house, Dad. Oh. Well... Don't forget the cello. We won't. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. If you were to sit down and list some of the rights and freedoms that you have, you'd probably list the big things like, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and others. Well, those are mighty important. But what about the little things? Things you don't think about much because you pretty well accept them as a matter of course, like choosing the business or profession you want to go into. You know, in some countries, you work at the job assigned to you with no free choice at all. Or like getting as much education as you can in schools that are open to all. In some countries, education is only for the privileged few. Or take a little thing like buying a house or renting an apartment for your family. There are places in this world where you live right where you're told. Have you ever thought about why you're allowed these free choices? Why you accept it as your right? It's because such free choices are guaranteed to you and your children and to generations in the future. To be exact, it's in Article 9 of our Bill of Rights. The men who wrote our Constitution and our Bill of Rights put this in just in case they forgot to mention something important in the others. It says, The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. You get that? It's not left to Congress or the President or any special group. These rights belong to all of us, to the people. It's one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. After considerable trouble, Vaccaro and I got both the cello and the drunken suspect into the car and drove to the station house. As soon as we arrived, the suspect passed out cold and was stretched out on a bench in the detective squad office. Lieutenant Matt King, the commander of the 21st squad, told me that Mr. and Mrs. Rudgevic had left a few minutes earlier after giving their report of the theft to Detective Goldman. They said they were going to a restaurant to have dinner and they had promised Lieutenant King they would check by telephone before driving to the country. We took the instrument out of the case and carefully examined it. There was no visible damage. I returned to the muster room and instructed the desk officer to send for another car to take me on patrol. I visited the political rally I had started for earlier. The crowd was small and there appeared to be no police problem. I made two or three other stops on precinct business before I returned to the station house at 10.35 p.m. 
21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. All right. Bring Hello, Red. Captain. Oh, did that uh, Mr. Rudgevick come by the house? No, sir, not yet. Sergeant, get me Lieutenant King on here, will you? Yes, sir. First squad, Lieutenant King. Now, this is Captain Kennelly, Matt. Did you hear from Mr. Rudgevick? No, sir, not yet. But that stew bomb has come around. I'm just beginning to talk to him. All right, I'll be right upstairs. Yes, sir. I'm going upstairs to the detectives. Yes, sir. Did you get a look at that shallow, Captain? I did, yeah. Does it look like $20,000? Not to me. <laughs> to me either. <laughs> I'd rather have the cash. I'll be upstairs. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, not so fast. Where is this you're talking about? Hello, Meister. Farrell. Hello, Skipper. Farrell. Yes, sir. What tour are you working? The 12th day, Captain. We came in early to talk to some of the fellas on PVA business. Oh, okay. Detective Goldman. Hello, Captain. Goldman? How long has he been following you, lady? Did he ever speak? Yes. Captain Kennelly. Come in, Captain. You know his name? Hello, Matt. Captain. Vicaro. Captain. Captain, this is Jason Newfield, noted for drinking port wine and stealing cello. I didn't realize what I was doing. I, I just walked by there. I didn't even know I was taking it from the car. If you stole a cello every time you killed a bottle of wine, we'd really be up to our ears in cellos, wouldn't we? I, I never stole anything before. N never. You told me you've been out to Rikers Island four or five times, didn't you? Uh, yes, but never for stealing. I, I don't steal. What for, then? For being drunk. And for mooching. Mooching, huh? Mooching and being drunk. Where'd you get that fancy handle, Jason Newfield? It's my name. Oh, well, I guess it's got to be. Couldn't think that up. Where do you live, Jason? Oh, here and there. Around. Where? I flopped down on the barry. What were you doing uptown on Park Avenue? Uh, I was just walking. I got a right to walk on Park Avenue. What were you doing uptown? I went to work over on Lex this afternoon. Work? What kind of work? I wanted to make a couple of bucks. I got on setting up pins in an alley over there. Wasn't any good, though. The boss said I was too slow on the uptake. He gave me my money and told me to get out. What time was that? I don't know. It was just about getting dark. Just about then. What'd you do? I put the money in my pocket and I went downstairs. And into the first package store you saw well, as a matter of fact, yes, I got a bottle of wine. There wasn't anything wrong in that, was there? I, I earned it, didn't I? I was entitled to buy a bottle of wine. What was it, a pint? A quart. You went over to Park Avenue. Well, I went walking. You know, I swigged a little bit and I walked some. That's the way I like to drink, swig and walk a little bit. And you walked right up to this car and stole a $20,000 cello. $20,000? Is that what it's worth? That's what the man said. $20,000? I, I didn't know that. I didn't mean to steal it. I never stole anything before, never. Well, you started big. Well, I, I had no intention of taking anything like that. I, I didn't. Maybe you weren't looking for a cello. But you had your eye on something, Jay. No, I, I was leaning against the building there. I, I was taking the last swig out of the bottle and... I saw this lady and this man come out of the house. He, he was carrying this cello, and they walked to the car, and he put it in. Then he went back into the house with the doorman, and, and she waited there. I just stood there and watched her for a minute. Jay, now you can be interested in either wine or the ladies, not both. I was interested in the cello. I thought you had no intention of stealing it. Well, I didn't. I was just interested in it. You weren't interested in the cello, just how much you could get for it in Hock. Well, the cello is my instrument. Oh, is it? Well, didn't I tell you? No. Must have forgotten to mention it. Oh, yes. I, I was with the Hamburg Symphony. Yeah? I, I was the only American ever to study under the great... The great who? Uh... Pentec. Pentec in Budapest. 
The only American. The only American student he ever took. I was a young man. I was in Hamburg with a symphony. I was just a nobody in the cello section. Nobody. He came to be the soloist for a concert. The great Pentec. Huh? Oh, yeah, it was a Pentec. We, we, we rehearsed that day, and we rehearsed. I, I remember, and suddenly he told the conductor to stop the whole orchestra. He wanted to hear me play alone. And the conductor and the whole orchestra looked at me, and I played it alone. And when I finished, he said, You are very good. He, he said, Pentec, meaning himself, was getting old and would I come to Budapest and study with him. So you went to Budapest? Oh, naturally. It was a great honor. I went and I worked and I studied with Pentec. And finally he said, You're ready. So then there were concerts arranged and recitals. And you became the toast of Europe. Well, not quite, but I, I played in Rome and Munich and Paris, London, Copenhagen and Oslo and Warsaw, all over. I, I... Uh -huh. Did you ever play in New York? Well, no, never. Why not? It was her, Manya. Oh, Manya. She was a dancer. No, she, she was a singer. I, I met her in Prague, and I fell deeply in love. Deeply in love. But she didn't return my love, and so I started to drink more and more and more. In Prague? Yes, in, in Prague. Mm -hmm. And finally, I was no good at all. And I haven't been any good for 20 years. Would you believe me to look at me... I, I'm only 51 years old, that's all. I, I know I must look 70. Mm. Tell me something. How did you get back to this country if you were in such bad shape in Prague? Well, some very kind friends took pity on me and bought my passage home to New York. They, they, they put me on the boat, yeah. The boat from Prague to New York? No, first the train to Hamburg, then the boat. You never saw Manya again. Never, and I never will. Jason, I've been in this job 14 years. I've seen a lot of everything, especially thieves and liars. You're the lousiest thief and the best liar I've seen to date. No, no, that's the, the truth. The only boat trip you ever took was to Rikers Island. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Oh, yeah? All right, Goldman. Tell him I'll be right out. Mr. Rudjavik is outside, Captain. You want to come? Yeah. Oh, uh, just a second, Matt. Jason, did you ever hear of Mr. Igor Rudgevic? Who? Igor Rudgevic. No. A great virtuoso. You stole his cello. Oh, him? Yeah, I've heard of him, but... Well, uh, I haven't been keeping track of things lately... I guess you haven't. Uh, I've been kind of out of touch with the musical world. You sure have. They have told me you have my Chaucer. Yes, we do. Where is it? Is it all right? We think so, Mr. Rugovic. Oh, oh, I'm so grateful. I, 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 I don't know what to say. I, I couldn't put it in words. I, you're sure it wasn't hurt? Not that we can tell. You see, I told you, Igor. Where is it? In my office, in there. Good. Uh, Rugovic, the thief is in there, too. Oh, Oh, he is. Igor, please, please don't get upset. You have a concert Monday, remember? I don't care for the thief. My Joseph. Is he dangerous, Captain? No, I don't think so. Oh. There he is, Mr. Rudgevick. Yes, yes, my case. We looked at it. We didn't see any damage. Listen, I, I want to tell you I'm sorry. Sorry? I mean, don't speak to him. I won't bite anybody. Yes, yes, it looks all right. It looks fine, just fine. Uh, I wouldn't hurt it. That's the last thing I'd do. Mr. Rudgevick, this is Jason Newfield. He says he was once a cello virtuoso. That's why he was so attracted to the instrument. Oh, a virtuoso too? Well, uh, Well, I... as one virtuoso to another, oh, you stink. I didn't mean any harm. Okay, now... A look... virtuoso... All right, Mr. Virtuoso, play. Well, I haven't practiced yet. A virtuoso is a virtuoso, practice or no practice, play. No, I caught you enough trouble. Play. Maybe I could learn some technique, Mr. Virtuoso. 
Here, take it. Play. Igor, you shouldn't. I insist. He didn't steal it to sell, he stole it to play, so play. Sit down. Take the fiddle, take the bow. Here, 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 so play. Play. Make beautiful no, music. please. Oh, you are shy, huh? Play. Well, if you want. So, that is it. The bow in the right hand. The fiddle between the legs. Ah, play. Oh, what should I play? Anything. Eco. All right. <laughs> Some virtuoso, huh? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't remember all the notes. It's been a very long time. That was very good, Jason. Yes. Excellent. Very excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. You stole my Joseph just to have it. it it's a Joseph? Of course. A Joseph. I have never played on him, Joseph. Come, we'll go we'll go home to my place. We'll forget this nonsense. You can play some more on the Joseph. Now, wait a minute, just a second. We have a little unfinished business here. What unfinished business? Come. Igor, please, look at him. Irene, an artist is not to be judged by his clothes. Look, folks. Wouldn't you like to come to my home to play my Joseph? Also, I, I have an amati. You can shave and eat. I have some clothes for you. This man is under arrest for grand larceny. What grand larceny? Forget it. Forget the past. Come to my home. Would you like that? You know what I'd like? I'd like a drink. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. All right, get on over to Second Avenue. The third alarm on that fire just hit. Sergeant Tenney's on a job there. He'll put you to work on traffic. Yeah, that's right. We're rerouting everything off of Second Avenue. Okay. We'll get going. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Ethel Everett, Santos Ortega, George Petrie, Frank Marth, and Bill Smith. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. All right, get on over to 2nd Avenue. The third alarm on that fire just hit. Sergeant Tenney's on the job there. He'll put you to work on traffic. Yeah, that's right. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Okay, you're gone. Bring him when you get back on your post. Yeah. All right. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was raining hard when I came on the job, and the 63 men who would patrol the precinct on foot and in sector cars for the next eight hours turned out wearing rubber coats, boots, and cap covers. At 10 minutes after 9, Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, rang into my office and informed me of a two-alarm fire in a loft building on 2nd Avenue. By the time a car came by the station house to take me to the scene of the fire, the third alarm had hit. The teeming rain added to our difficulties, and it had not stopped until about the time the fire was out at 11.14. I returned to the station house to finish the paperwork and begin a required inspection of departmental equipment. My calendar showed that I was scheduled to give a talk on safety to the student body of Julia Richmond High School at 1.30 p.m., so at noon, I changed to civilian clothes and took my rain-soaked uniform trousers under my arm. It was my intention to leave them to be pressed while I went for my meal in a restaurant a few doors from the tailor shop on 3rd Avenue, operated by Philip Parazzoni. Hello, Miss Parazzoni. How are you? I'm fine. I'm Captain Kennelly. Bill. Well, you don't have to bother him. Bill. Bill, come here. Well, Mrs. Parazzoni, oh, I... Oh, hello, Captain. Oh, Phil, how are you? Phil. Uh, Rose, uh, you, you better get to 211 and pick up the work. Oh, all right. Yeah, the night doorman's uniform and the elevator operator's uniform from the, from the sofa. 211? Yeah, 211. All right. I'll get them. Yeah, only press if they want them back by 5 o'clock, huh? Only press. Wide senator. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes they ruin more customers than they're worth. Uh, yeah, yeah, Captain Parrish. I got them soaked this morning, Phil. I'm giving a talk to some high school students at uh, 1.30 this afternoon. I wondered if I could get them pressed. Oh, sure, sure. They're not too wet, are they? No, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I'm going to have lunch down the block. Could I pick them up in about half an hour? Well, I'll, I'll deliver them to the station house if you want. No, no, that's all right. I'll pick them up. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot, Phil. Oh, uh, Captain? Yeah? Uh, could I ask you something? Oh, sure. What is it, Phil? Um, look, Captain. Yeah? I'm, I'm sorry how Rose asked you. Yeah, what happened? You two have a fight? Yeah, yeah, I guess you could call it a fight. Anyway, I'm sorry. Well, don't worry about it. Well, I am worried about it. You shouldn't treat people like that. Customers, especially you. Oh, it happens in the best of families. Yeah, in the best of families. I left Phil Parazzoni's tailor shop and went a few doors down the street to a restaurant where I had my meal. When I returned for the uniform trousers a half hour later, Mrs. Parazzoni was not in the shop. At 1.30 p.m., I was introduced to the student body at Julia Richmond High School, and I talked for 20 minutes on the subject of safety, especially safe driving. It was 2.10 p.m. when I returned to the station house, where in the muster room, Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer, 
and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard. Uh, Captain. Go ahead and take the call, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I'll sign the blotter. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, where were you born? The borough of Manhattan? Well, you go down to the Department of Health, 125 Wake Street. You can get a copy of your birth certificate there. 125 Wake Street. Well, where are you, on the east side? You take the Lexington Avenue Express downtown and change it 14 feet for the local. Right to Wake Street, and it's just upstairs there. Oh, okay. You're welcome. Yes, Sergeant. Did you have something for me? Oh, yeah, Captain. What? Uh, you know that Phil Parazzoni from the tailor shop. Oh, what about him? Came in to see him. Yeah? He and his wife. I asked him to wait in your office. Well, are they in there now? Yes, sir. All right. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. All right, where do you be? Where? Hello, Phil. Oh, Captain. Hello. Uh, you, you know my wife, Rose? Yes. Yeah, sure. Oh, hello, Mr. Tarazzoni. Hello. Well, what can I do for you, Phil? Well... He told me it wasn't the right thing to do. He told me in so many words. I wouldn't listen to Now, Rose, Rose... That's what he told me. It wasn't the right thing to do. What wasn't the right thing to do? It, it was all my fault. He didn't have anything to do with Rose, it. Rose, let me talk to him. Would you wait outside? Please? It's my fault. W- would you just stand outside and I'll get it straightened out? Is, is that all right with you, Captain? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, go ahead, Rose. Let me get it straight and out, huh? Yeah, all right. But it's my fault. Everything. Yeah, could I close the door, Captain? That's all right. I get it. Is it all right to wait here? Yeah, sure. That's all right. Well, uh, what's the trouble, Phil? Captain, when, when you came in the store to get your pants pressed. Yeah. Well, that's why she acted so funny. Because it was you. You see, she, she thought you came to arrest her. That's why she acted that way. Arrest her for what? Well, it's a long story. It's a very long story. Well, what did she do? Look, Captain, when somebody has worked so hard for so many years, worked, really struggled, can you blame them too much if they see an opportunity to make some money just like that, a big opportunity to make it? Well, I can't blame them if it's legitimate. Well, in this case, it's legitimate and, and it isn't. Well, it can't be both. Well, I, I mean, the money don't really belong to anybody. Uh, you better start at the beginning, Phil. Yeah, well, it, it was yesterday morning. We, we were in the shop. Uh-huh. Well, Rose was at the counter, like, like when you came in today, and I was in the back at the pressing machine. Yeah. Well, the door opened and a customer came in, a woman, a very, a very pretty young woman. Yeah. Well, she came in mad as a wet hen. Well, I heard her talking to Rose, and I came up to see what the matter was. But she had on a nice wool suit, see, the, the front of the skirt was dirty and smudged, and I, I didn't blame her for being mad. Anyway, she said she was on the bus. She said two men got on, and, and the man who was sitting next to her saw the two men. Well, she thinks they were detectives, and they were after the man that was sitting next to her. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, he, he jumped out of the seat and crawled all over and ruined the suit with his shoe, and he went out the back door of the bus, and the two men ran out after him. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, a- after a minute, she looked down on the seat, and there was a package. You see? A pretty big package. Must, must have belonged to the man that the policeman would chase him. She, she picked it up. And did the woman have the package when she came into the store? Oh, yeah, yeah. She had it all right. Oh, I see. Yeah, it was right down on the counter there all the time. Only, anyway, I, I said I, I tried to fix up her skirt as best I could, and, and she went in the dressing room. Yeah. Well, I was in the back there working on the skirt, and then the lady asked Rose to bring the package into the dressing room. She'd like to take a look at it while she was waiting. So, so Rose brought the package in, and Rose said, you know how curiosity can get the best of ladies. Oh, sure. Well, they, they sat there looking at it, and Rose was hoping that she would open it up, and finally the lady decided to open it up. And what was in it? Well, I didn't know. I, I didn't find out until last night. Oh, didn't she? Well, she didn't say anything to me about it while we were in the store. I was busy back there. I didn't know what was going on in the dressing room. I see. Your wife only told you what was in it. Yeah, I never saw anything in there. Well, what was in the package? Money. Lots of money, Captain. How much? Well, I don't know exactly. Rose said at least 3000 they think. Well, aren't they sure? Well, well, Rose told me they didn't count it. They, they were so scared they didn't count it. Oh, I see. Oh, uh, the, the money... The money wasn't all that was in there. What else? Number slips. You know, slips from playing policy. Oh. Yeah, well, they figured out, Rose and the lady, that 
Th- this fellow on the bus was a racketeer, you see, and he was being chased by the cops. Yeah. Oh, you even <clears throat> ask Rose in? Well, I think we ought to have this story from her, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I think we ought to. Uh, Miss Parazzoni. Yes? Would you come in now? All right, sure. Just have a seat. Yeah. You tell him, sir? Well, not everything yet. Sit down, Miss Parazzoni. Thanks. I, uh, I, I only got up to the part after you opened the package in the dressing room. Oh. Yes, I'd uh, rather hear the story from you, Miss Parazzoni, instead of what you told your husband. Yeah, sure. Now, how much money was in there? Well, we didn't count it. We saw all that money in the policy slips. We got scared. You and the lady? Yeah. We, we wrapped the package back up again. Uh, what was it, a stack of money? Yeah, a stack about this thick, about two or three inches thick, lots of money. And was the pile of money tied up? Yeah, with a rubber band, a couple of rubber bands. And what was on top? A $20 bill. Mm-hmm. Did you see the bottom? Yeah, it was a, a 10, I think. There's a $10 bill on the bottom. You never did take the rubber bands off. I didn't even touch it. She was holding it. And you decided to wrap it up quickly. Yeah, she decided it. She said the, the best thing to do would be to call the police. That would be the best thing. Well, why didn't you call the police? Well, I, I came back with the skirt. Uh, you, you better let her tell it, Phil. So. Oh, yeah, okay, all right. Well, uh, Phil came back to the dressing room with the skirt, and she had the package all tied up again. I, I took her out front of where the telephone was, and... She walked over toward it, and she picked up the telephone. All of a sudden, she hung up. Where was Phil? I I wasn't back there. I was working on some work at at the pressing machine. I don't know. I I didn't see any of it. No, that's right. He didn't see any of it. Did she tell you her name? Not then. Well, did you ever find it out? Well, later she said it would be best if I didn't know her full name. She said her first name was Marion. Uh Oh, Did she tell you why she didn't call the police? Yeah, yeah. She told me that she was afraid to call the police. She said that she was afraid that they'd find out that she had 22 parking tickets on her car. Never went to court about any of them. She was afraid she'd be arrested and find a lot of money and things like that. She said maybe it'd be better if she left the package in the store and if I'd call the police. Did you agree to that? Well, I I didn't care, but... And she said there wasn't any reason why... We couldn't keep the money to ourselves. Better that we should have it than the criminal. Okay. The only thing was, she was afraid that the man from the bus might have gotten away from the cops and might have remembered us. So what did you do? Well, it, it was decided that we could leave it in one of those lockers in Grand Central Station. You know, one of the lockers right in the waiting room there. Your, your yeah. little locker with a key that you take out and put in a dime. Yeah, I know. Well, because she was scared, I took the package. Went out of the store and she followed me. I went over and took the subway and rode down to Grand Central. I put the package in the locker and she said I could keep the key because I didn't know her full name or where to get in touch with her, but she sure knew me and she was sure I was honest. Is uh, the package still in the locker? Yes, still in the locker. And uh, you've got the key? Yeah, yeah, I got the key. I got it right here. here. See? How much cash did she ask you to put up? So did you tell him she asked me to put up cash? No, no, I didn't tell him. No. Uh, how, how did you know she asked me to put up cash? I knew. How much was it? $750. Have they given it to her yet? No, no, I'm supposed to meet her this afternoon. Huh? You're lucky, Mr. Parazzoni. What do you mean, lucky? I'm worried to death. Scared to death. You're lucky. You not only didn't find $3,000 of someone else's money... You didn't lose 750 of your own. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. I took Mr. and Mrs. Parazzoni upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad and into the office of Lieutenant Matt King, the squad commander. Chim-shamming, bunco, and pigeon-dropping, as the small con games are called, are old stories and easily recognizable to police officers. But to the victim, they're most convincing. This is especially true because in many, there is a blinding streak of larceny exceeded only by that in the con artist. These confidence rackets are invariably based upon the victim's desire to get something for nothing, something that belongs to somebody else. 
To the police officer, the gullibility of people is amazing. It's incredible how many in the city of New York fall victim to these same old small con games year in and year out. In this case, Lieutenant King and Detective Louis DeLuca questioned the intended victim very closely as I listened. Why should she give you the key? If she were on the level, why wouldn't she suspect you'd go to the locker and get the package for yourself? Well, she told me that she trusted me because she knew where to get in touch with me. We were in business. She walked in off the street with a smudge on her suit, and that's sufficient reason for her to trust you with $3,000? Well, she told my wife she had to trust somebody. Yeah, that's right. She couldn't go to the police on account of a 22 parking ticket. You've known these people a long time, haven't you, Captain? Yes. Ever since I've been in the precinct. Many years. As far as I know, they're good, honest, hard-working people. It was all my fault. After I told Phil, he said, why didn't I go to the police? I should have gone to the police. That's what he said. Rose, please. Huh? If I meant for you to go to the police, I would have insisted. Now, let's pick this up for a minute where we left off. Yeah, all right. Yesterday, you and Miss Marion took the package down to Grand Central, and you got one of those dime lockers. Yes, that's right. Then what did you do? We went to a, I don't know, a coffee bar, I guess you call it, in Grand Central. We stood there, we had a cup of coffee, and she said, well, I... I guess nobody followed us. I guess the detectives arrested the man. I said, yes, I guess they did. So she thanked me a lot for helping her, and she started to say how much I should get for helping her. She mentioned something like 25% of what was in the package. Well, I would have been satisfied with 25%, but anyway, we settled on the fact that I should get a third. We were supposed to meet at Grand Central right at this coffee bar exactly at noon today. We take the package someplace and open up and then split the money. How did she happen to give you the key? Well, it was her own idea. It was very nice of her, wasn't it? I thought it was. Then you parted company? Yes. What time did you get back to the store? Uh, it was about an hour after I left. Your husband asked you where you'd been? Well, yeah, yeah, I asked her. She told me she had to go out with the lady to help her out. I asked her why she had to help out a stranger like that. She said she just did. She had to, that's all. You accepted that answer? Well, I couldn't do nothing except accept it. What else could I do? When did you tell him about the money? Last night after dinner. I just couldn't keep it in me anymore. I told him about the package and about everything that was in it and how we went to Grand Central, how we put it in the locker and how she was going to meet me there tomorrow, and I was going to get one third. Your husband told you to go to the police, didn't he? Yes, he told me. Yeah, I told her, but with no enthusiasm, with no enthusiasm whatsoever. Well, at least you told me. And you were intending to meet her at Grand Central Station at noon today and open up the package? Yes, that's right. Well, it was about noon that I came to your store. You were still there. Yes, I know I was there. I, see, I got a call from her on the telephone at 9.30 this morning. That's Marion? Yes, Marion. She said she was in awful trouble. She said she got home the night before, went to bed, and... When she woke up in the morning, there was a policeman there. A policeman. The phone almost fell out of my hand. She said the policeman came to a restaurant on account of the 22 traffic tickets that she didn't show up in court for. She said the policeman took her down to the magistrate's court, and she was sitting there just waiting for her trial. So she said she couldn't meet me this noon, but that I ought to go down and put another dime in the locker at Grand Central Station. I told her I'd do that. She, she made me promise to be sure not to open the package because... We, we'd have to count the money together. And I told her I wouldn't, but I just put the dime in. Did you go down to Grand Central? Yeah. Yeah, I went down there. I went out of the store when the captain was in there. Do you remember that captain that I left? Yes, I remember. I'm so nervous. I didn't know what to do. I thought you came to get me. That's what I thought. But when I found out you didn't, I, I went over and got the subway and went down to Grand Central and put another dime in the locker. Did you look inside to see if the package was still there? Yeah, yeah. I opened up the locker. I looked inside to see it was still in there, the package. Then you went back to the store? Yes. What time was that? Well, it must have been about a quarter to one that I got back. What time did you hear from Marion again? About one o'clock, she called. What did she say this time? Well, she told me she'd been up before the judge. She said the judge was very mad at her for ignoring the 22 traffic tickets, and he fined her $750. $750! She had to have the money right away if she go to jail. She had to pay the fine by four o'clock that afternoon. She said she didn't know what she was going to do. The judge wouldn't let her leave the building, but he let her go out in the hall and use the pay telephone so she could call some friends. And if she didn't have it by four o'clock that afternoon, she'd go to jail. What'd you say to her? Well, I told her I told her she had all that money in Grand Central Station there. I said she ought to be able to use that. But she said no, she didn't want to do that. She didn't want to take the chance on opening up the package. Not down there, because there are all kinds of cops around and everything. There's always all kinds of cops in the courthouse. Did you have any suggestions, Oliver? 
No, I, I told her I could open it up and, and throw the policy slips away. I, I could go to the ladies' room in Grand Central Station and throw them in the waste basket or something like that and just bring the money down. She said, no, that wouldn't be any good because we'd have to count the money together and each take our share so that there wouldn't be any suspicion on either side. Well, that seems fair, doesn't it? Yeah, but I knew she was in such trouble she had to pay the $750 fine. Did she have any suggestions? Yes, she had a suggestion. She wanted to know if I had $750, if I could get it. And I, I said, yes, I could go to the savings account. And she said, please. Please, wouldn't I do her a favor and draw out the money so she could pay the fine? And after she paid the fine, we'd go up to Grand Central and get the package, and we'd split it right away, and I'd get my $750 back, and she'd give me half of the rest instead of only a third. Did you agree to do that? Well, finally, I told her, all right, I would. And I told her that I'd meet her with the $750. Where was that? In the courthouse, down on Center Street. Where in the courthouse? On the second floor, right by the pay telephones there. She said that the judge had given her permission to go out and stand by the telephones to wait for calls and to make calls, but she had to be back inside the court and pay off the fine by four o'clock. What time are you going to meet her? At a quarter to four. Well, you ought to be thankful if you decided to bring the whole thing to me. You'd have given her the $750 and never seen her again. Yeah, but the package, I have the key to the locker. The package is in there. Yes, you'd have gotten back 30 of your $750. 20 on top and a 10 on the bottom. But it looked like money to me. It always does. What made you decide to come see me? Oh, that was Phil's idea. No, no, Rose. You decided that you No, thought... it's not true. It was his idea. See, he, he keeps the bank book in the drawer of the sewing machine. He, he was putting a new lining in a coat, and he wouldn't get away from it. Finally, he stood up to get something... I got the bank book. He saw me. So he asked me what happened. I, I told him. He says, no, I can't go to the bank and get the money. But I told him I promised. He said, I don't care what you promised. But she decided to come here herself. She decided. He told me. So I decided. What do you think, Lieutenant? Think I ought to go down to Grand Central and pick up that package? Mm. What time is it now? Uh, quarter to three. I think you ought to leave it there. At least until we're sure that this Marion is down at the courthouse. Just as liable to be standing in Grand Central watching that locker. If he sees a police officer or Rose go get the package, she's not going to show up at the courthouse. If it stays there in the locker, then she's sure the deal is on. Is it on? What should I do? You don't have to worry about that, Miss Parazzoni. You just do what we tell you. It was decided that Mrs. Parazzoni would go ahead and complete the transaction with the con artist she knew only as Marion. A dummy package of money prepared in exactly the same manner as the package left in the locker in Grand Central was gotten ready. There was a $20 bill on top and a 10 on the bottom. In between was plain paper cut to size. The serial numbers of the two real bills were recorded for evidence. Detective DeLuca was instructed to see that Mrs. Parazzoni waited until the exact time of the appointment entered the building, and took the elevator to the second floor. Lieutenant King and I went into the lobby of the building and met two detectives of the fifth squad. The four of us took the elevator to the second floor. It was hardly necessary to make ourselves inconspicuous in the corridor. The place, as always on court days, was jammed with police officers, defendants, witnesses, complainants, bail bondsmen and attorneys waiting for their cases to be called in the various courts. The two detectives from the fifth squad were planted near the elevators. Lieutenant King and I walked to a place in the corridor close to the telephone booth, and there we waited. Captain, this is the first time I've heard of the criminal court building being part of a con game. It's impressive, man. You got to give her credit for that. Mm, that's impressive, all right. There's a woman waiting. Think that's her? Hmm? She's pretty close to the description. Wait a minute. There's another one down there. Where? That's a drinking fountain. No, oh, yeah. Lots of them, Captain. No, well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Yes, sir. How's the time? She's due up here now. Mm -hmm. 
How about moving across there where we can see the elevator? Yes, Sergeant. Could be hard, too. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, look, we better not both watch the elevators, man. No. I'll, uh, I'll look this way. You just let me know what's going on, okay? Okay. There's another one that could be the gal. The description fits half the women in New York. <sighs> yep. There's Miss Parazzoni coming off the elevator. She's starting to look around. Does she see her? Not yet. Which way is she looking? This one. Here she comes. She stopped. You think Marion showed? Yes, sir, she showed. The Parazzoni is walking over to her. The one in the blue dress. I'd better keep looking this way. Yes, sir. She's greeted her. They're making the change. Mr. Parazzoni is giving her the package. She's got it. All right, let's go. Yeah. Good looking, all right. You uh, think that'll help her? Yeah, so far. I don't know how much good it'll do from now on. Now, where will I wait for you? All right, we're police officers. I'll take that package. What package? When you've got there, I'll have it, please. Did you bring them? Why'd you bring them? Because you were cheating me. Give me the package. Give me you. I'll tear your eyes out. Right out right, of your right. head. Come on. Oh, I'll kill her. 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 i will kill her i will kill her i will kill her i will kill her She's got a streak of honesty. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. It was our policeman working over there. What do you want to know for? Well, how does what they're doing concern you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll just have to bear with us a while, mister. Getting her out is more important than you're losing a little sleep. All right. Yeah, we'll be through there right away. As soon as possible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're welcome. And so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Bryna Rayburn, Joan Allison, Larry Haynes, and Bill Quinn. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. <laughs> First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. I was our policeman working over there. What do you want to know for? Well, how does what they're doing concern you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll just have to bear. You are in the muster room at the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. 
You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. Yeah, we'll be through there right away. As soon as possible. Yes, sir. Yeah, welcome. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of the square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know, if you asked them, that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m., but in fact, I had been on the job for three consecutive days. The election had come on a day which, according to my duty chart, would normally have been time off. But as is required, I had been on the job since I signed the blotter at 7.38 a.m. on Monday. For every man in the department, the regular duty chart went out at 8 p.m. on Monday night. Then they were on the job guarding the polls and the voting machines and then tabulating for 16 hours straight. Then they went on reserve for eight hours more, then back on the job. After I turned out the platoon at midnight, I lay down on the couch in my office and slept for the first time in nearly 48 hours. Meanwhile, the men were taking over their posts, and one of them, Patrolman Daniel Mercado, walked over the prescribed route from the station house to Madison Avenue. After relieving Patrolman Edward Farrell on his assigned post, he began to try the doors to the shops along the avenue. As he was in the process of this operation, the car in which Sergeant William Waters was riding as recorder and Patrolman Joseph Ahern as operator pulled up to the curb. Okay. Stay in the car while I talk to him. Yes, sir. Mercado. Yes, Sergeant? There's a street light out down the next block. You report it? Uh, Farrell said it had been out for about two hours when I relieved him. He reported it. Okay. He said they're on their way to fix it. All right. It's still out at the end of the tour. Make another report of it. Yes, sir. They've been having trouble in this whole circuit up here the last couple of days. What's that? What's what? A knocking. I don't hear any knocking, Sergeant. Stop now. There it is. Sounds like somebody hitting a window. Well, where's it coming from? Well, everything's closed in the box. What about upstairs in one of the apartments? It could be, Sergeant. Hold it. I don't think it's from upstairs. Oh, hi. Sounds like it's from way down that way, Sergeant. Yes, Sergeant? Come here. Yes, sir. There it is, Sergeant. Yeah. I think it's from way down that way, the next block. Yes, Sergeant. Hello, Mark. John? Somebody's knocking on some glass, huh? I don't hear it. Well, wait just a second, you will. There it is. Yeah. From down the next block. What do you think, Joe? You got me. Could be coming from across the street. Hold it. All right. Yes, sir. We'll walk down. You'll be in the car. Okay, Sergeant. Come on, Mercado. There it is. Still sounds from down that way. Come on. Keep your eyes on those apartment windows upstairs. Okay. I'll look in the stores. It rings out like a bell. Sure does. There's nothing to stop at this time of night. Sergeant! Yeah? It's down here, the drugstore. Okay. The drugstore's closed. Uh huh. Who is it? Somebody inside. What? Somebody inside the drugstore, he said. There's somebody inside. Burglars? No, Sergeant, no burglars. A woman's locked in there. All right, lady, take it easy. Take it easy. Can you get me out? How did you get in? I was locked in. I was using the Lady, door. you'll have to come closer to the door and talk a little bit louder. I can't hear what you're saying. 
I was in the telephone booth when the store closed. In the telephone booth? Yes, that's right. Wouldn't you know it? All right. I was in the telephone booth when all of a sudden the lights went out. I didn't know what happened. I hung up and the place was closed. It was locked tight. How long ago was this? What? How long ago was it? I don't know. I hadn't any idea. About 10 or 15 minutes ago? He usually closes between 12 and 12.30, Sergeant. He was closed when I came on post. I think he was. What did he say? He was talking to me. Oh, I've been trying to attract somebody's attention. I've been just standing here knocking on the door with a half a dollar. All right, lady. I would have called the police, but the dime I used in the phone was the last dime or quarter or nickel I had. All I had was the half dollar. Now, look, don't get panicky. Just take it easy and we'll get you out. I'm not panicky. I'm just trying to tell you what happened. I know I'll get out. Good. I was getting a little worried until somebody heard me, but I know I'll be all right now. Yeah, you'll be fine. Now, what I want you to do is reach up on the inside of the door. See if you can find a latch to turn. You mean a knob? That's right. See if you can find a knob. The only thing is this. And I tried that before. That won't do it. The key's the only thing that'll open that, Sergeant. Now, listen, if the store has a burglar alarm service, they always have a key at the office. It'd be a sign that says protected by Holmes or Burns Patrol or whoever it is. Yes, sir, usually. There's no back door, is there, McConnell? No, sir, this is the only way in around. Let me put my light up on the transom. There's no transom, Joe. You think there's anything you can do? We'll get you out. Don't worry about it. I'm not worried. What building is this in, uh, number 24? Yes, yeah, Sergeant, 24. All right. Now, Hearn, walk around the corner of the building entrance. Find what apartment the superintendent lives in. See if you see if he's got a key to this door. Yes, yeah, sir. All right, get going. I'm on my way, sir. Mercado. Yes, sir. Go to the call box and ring in. Tell the lieutenant what we've got. Okay, Sergeant. He might want to check Holmes Protective anyway and Burns and... What's the name of that druggist? Erridge. Paul Erridge. All right, go on. Okay, Sergeant. Yes, lady? You're not going away and leave me? No, we're not going any place. Oh, that's good. I saw them leave. I sent them to see if they could find somebody with a key. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Now, listen. Yes? Didn't the druggist know you were in the telephone booth? No, I guess he didn't. It's in a funny place way in the back, in an alcove almost. Was he alone in the store? I think so. Didn't he see you come in? What? Didn't he see you when you came in the store? Maybe he did, but I was in the booth so long, I guess he forgot. What's your name? Grace Nader. How do you spell that? G-R-A-C-E. The last name. Oh, M-A-D-D-E-R. Is that Miss or Mrs.? Miss. Where do you live? Around the corner there at number 22. Don't you have a phone in your apartment? Oh, yes. Why don't you use that instead of coming down here? Well, the call I was making was a rather a personal nature. I didn't care to have my roommate overhear it. Oh, I see. What did you say? I said I see. I understand. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. How long do you think I'll have to stay in here? Until we can find someone with a key. Do you know someone? Well, it's in this apartment building. The super might have a key. Do you think so? Maybe. And if the druggist subscribes to the burglar alarm service, they'll have a key for sure. It doesn't look to me like he subscribed to it. It's such a small store. And besides, there's none of that silvery tape on the windows. There's all kinds of burglar alarms. Oh. Supposing he doesn't subscribe. Then we've got the owner's name and phone number on file at the station house. We'll get him down here to open up. I don't think he's going to like that very much. Well, he should have looked around the store before he locked up. What did you say? He should have looked around the store better. Hey, 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 what's the tumult here, huh? What's the tumult? All right, keep moving. Oh, uh, 
Excuse me, officer. I didn't mean to usurp your prerogative. You You're know? not usurping anything, mister. You just better go on home and get in bed. Oh, what do we got? A damsel in distress. Ah, you who? Go on, go on. You better hit the ties. Who put her in there? You who? Get moving, will you? Uh, listen, listen, listen. I am not drunk. I'm only offering you my technical uh, know how for this damsel in distress. If you think I'm drunk... Yeah, I think so. You are perfectly mistaken. All I had was one rock on a scotch with a whisker pemmin wheel. Now, look, will you get going? Go on home. All right, all right, all right. A word from the wise is sufficient. Uh -huh. Yoo-hoo! Good night. Uh, good night, sweet damsel in distress. Uh, I'll put you was a mandolin and we'll have a little fun. Uh, I was worried. I thought you were going to arrest him. Him? <laughs> no, we've got bigger troubles. I say we've got bigger troubles. You know, I'm beginning to get a little worried. What? I'm beginning to get a little bit worried, I said. Are you in a hurry to get any place? No. Will anyone be concerned about you? Just my roommate, but I don't care about her or whether she's concerned. All right, then, relax. Enjoy the fuss that's being made over you. I can't. I can't relax. You will relax before. We'll get you out. Don't worry. I know you'll get me out. I have no doubt about that. I'll try to be calm and collected. But I just feel that I'm going to lose control. I feel so ridiculous in here. How do you think I feel out here? I spoke to the desk officer, Sergeant. Yeah? They rang over to Holmes. This store isn't a subscriber. They got no key. Burns either. I didn't think they would be. How's she doing? He's still in there. No, not yet. Uh, Sergeant, uh, Lieutenant got the owner's name from the business house file. And like I told you, it's Erridge, Paul Erridge. He lives up Washington Heights. The lieutenant said if the super didn't have a key to ring in again and he'd get hold of Mr. Erridge right away. Okay. Yes? What's going on? What are you plotting out there? We're not plotting anything, lady, except how to get you out. Here's a hand, Sergeant. How'd you do, Joe? I woke up the super, Sergeant. Yeah? He's got no key to any of these stores. Uh-huh. All he handles is the residential apartments in the building. These stores here are handled direct by the office. Okay. Mikado, you better ring into the lieutenant again. Tell him we can't locate a key. Okay. Right away, Sergeant. The super said he'd come and see if he could give us a hand as soon as he gets dressed, but he doesn't know what there is that he can do. There's no other way out of this store, is there? No, sir. He says there isn't. Just this door. Yes, lady. Did you get a key? No, not yet. I thought that that policeman went to wake up the super of the building. He did. The super's got no key to any of the stores. Well, what are we going to do? How am I going to get out? We'll get you out. You keep saying that, but you don't do anything. Just don't worry. I am worried. I'm getting worried to death. We've got the home telephone number of the druggist in the files at the station house. The other, other officer went to call the box. He's going to ask the lieutenant to phone the druggist to come down here. Do you think he'll come? He'll come, yeah. He might not feel very good about it. He might not feel very good about it, but he'll come. Oh, well, I hope so. What's that super's name, huh? Charlie. He said he'd come out as soon as he got dressed. Yes, yeah, Sergeant. He doesn't know what he can do, though. Yes, ma'am. Where does this druggist live? In Washington Heights. How long should it take him to get here? About a half hour, a little more, maybe. My goodness. What? I said, my goodness. Oh, Sergeant. You ring him, Mikado? Yes, sir, I rang in. Desk officer called up the druggist's home. Is he coming down to open up? No, sir, his wife said he wasn't there. Well, maybe he didn't have time to get home yet. Well, he's not coming home. He doesn't live there. His wife told the lieutenant they were separated about a month ago. Well... Where does the wife say he's living now? She told the lieutenant she doesn't know. She knows how to get in touch with him when she has to, doesn't she? Yes, sir, she knows that. Well, where does she reach him? Right here. Right here at the store. You are listening to 21st Precinct, the factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. You have a horrible feeling that something is wrong when the radio goes dead. You turn on the television set. Nothing there, either. 
You walk out on the street to look for your newspaper, but it isn't on your porch, your front lawn. No place. And then you notice the silence all around you. No voices, not a one. The theater lights are off. The public auditorium is boarded up. You're frightened. You don't know what's wrong. I'll tell you what's wrong. You've just found out what it would be like to live under a system of government that controls the freedom of speech. There are such systems in the world today. But a group of men took care that it wouldn't happen to you. They did their work 165 years ago when they wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. In the first article of those ten original amendments, they said, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Those men, men like Franklin and Jefferson, made it official, made it a law. Every time we have our say in public or in private, we're exercising that law, and exercise is good. If someone else doesn't like what we say, he's entitled to his own opinion, and he's entitled to voice it just as loudly and clearly as he wants. That's guaranteed by our Constitution, by our Bill of Rights. Freedom of speech, it's one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. Although I had been without rest for many hours, I was not able to fall asleep on the couch in my office. After 20 minutes or so, I had gotten up, washed my face, and walked into the muster room where I saw Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, come into the station house. He'd been on the job the same number of hours as I. Detectives, as well as members of the patrol force, are assigned to election day duty either at the polls or on patrol in uniform. Oh, Matt. Hello, Captain. I saw you coming in when you should be going out. Why don't you go home? I thought about it, Captain. I've got to be back here at 7.30 in the morning. Just use one of the beds upstairs. Oh, well, uh, how about a cup of coffee? Yeah, sure, Captain. Red, is there any hot coffee? Yes, sir. The sugar's in the drawer, Captain. Good. That was a pretty quiet election, Captain. Yeah, pretty quiet. Go ahead, man. How do you think you like the new governor? Oh, I don't know. We'll see what he does after the first of the year. Here you are. Thanks. That's enough, Captain. Okay. Sugar man? Yes, thanks. Well, how did your squad make out with its election duty? Any hitches? No, no hitches, no, sir. But uh, Fitz had a time for himself. Did he? Yes, sir. He said everything was nice and quiet at the polling place he was assigned to until about 2 o'clock, that is. Yeah, uh-huh. And in walks this individual who says she's Mrs. So-and-so. Well, the husky voice didn't bother the election clerks too much, but that heavy beard made them a little suspicious, despite the beautiful fur coat and the high-heeled shoes. So they called over Fitz. Well, who was it, a man? Yes, sir. Fitz says he was quite a guy. Said it took all three cops that were there to help get him quieted down. Well, what was the idea? Well, it seems he voted earlier in the day. Mrs. So-and-so was sick in bed, and he'd be darned if she was going to lose her vote. He said she told him exactly how she wanted to vote and he was going to vote for her. The election clerks and Fitz and a half dozen cops weren't going to stop him. Well, what happened to him? Oh, they got him tagged for a psycho down at Bellevue. <laughs> it's going to be a long time before Fitz lives down that closed eye he got from a lady. I guess it will. Excuse me, Captain. Yes, Lieutenant. Hi, Red. Matt, we've got a woman locked in a drugstore over in Madison Avenue. Well, how'd she get in there? She was in the phone booth when the druggist closed up. Yeah, Super of the building said he's got no key. We got out the druggist's phone number from the business house file. His wife says she's separated from him about a month, and she doesn't know where he's living. Well, have they got a burglar alarm service? I checked homes, Captain. The store isn't a subscriber. Well, who's on the job over there? Sergeant Waters, Captain, and Mikado and Ahern. Sergeant says the woman started off kind of cool and collected when they first got there, but she's getting a little panicky now. Are you making any further effort to locate the druggist? Uh, yes, sir. He's got a mother who lives in the Bronx... According to the wife, the mother's got no phone. She doesn't think he's living with the mother, but the mother might know where he is. I got the 50th precinct to send a man over there to talk to the mother. Any friends of the man or employees of the store? The wife says he's got a pharmacist working for him, a new one. She doesn't know his name. Came to work after they got separated. She used to help him out in the store herself. 
She doesn't happen to have a key around the house there. Uh, no, sir. Sergeant Waters wanted to know what I thought about sending for the emergency squad to take the door off or cut the glass out or do whatever they could to get her out. You better hold up on that for a while, Red. Yes, sir. I'll take a ride over there and see what it looks like. Have a car come around for me. Okay. Why do we go? You want to come take a look, man? Uh, no, Captain. No, thanks. I spend too much of my time now seeing people who are locked up. In a few minutes, sector car number three came by the house for me and drove me over to the drugstore on Madison Avenue, where by this time a few people had gathered despite the lateness of the hour. As the car pulled to a stop behind the sergeant's car, I could see considerable activity in the doorway. All right. You wait here. All right, All right folks. There's nothing to see. You might as well move on. Hello, Aaron. Where's Sergeant Waters? In the doorway there, talking to her. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, just keep moving. Keep moving. Sergeant? Oh, hello, Captain. Well, how are you doing? Well, she's still in there. Miss Snyder? Yes? I sent one of the officers with the super of the building. They went to call somebody from the real estate company. We'll see if they've got a key. It's getting to be an awfully long time. We'll know something in a few minutes. You've been saying that. You've been saying we'll know something in a few minutes, but an awful long time has gone by. We're doing everything we can. I don't know about that. I don't know if you are. I'm still locked in here. Uh, I'm Captain Kennelly. We'll get you out. We'll get you out soon. Cut! You've got to talk closer to the door, Captain. I said we'll get you out very soon. I hope so. I only hope so. Ah, uh, she's in there too much longer, Captain. She's going to go to pieces. I don't know whether I'd blame her. No, sir. Neither would I. I was thinking about getting the emergency truck over here and taking that door off or the glass out or something. Oh, I don't think they could take the door off. They're butted hinges. Like the jimmy it open. Well, that'd cause a lot of damage. Best thing might be to cut the glass out. Yes, sir. Mercado went with the super? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Who are they calling? Some executive from the real estate company that manages this building. Oh, yeah. Super says he might know where there's a key to the store, and if he doesn't, he might know who to call. There she goes again. Mm -hmm. Officer? Yes? Any news? They haven't come back yet. Oh. I'm getting very thirsty. Thirsty? Yes, very thirsty. Well, why don't you go behind the soda fountain and get a glass of water? Do you think it would be all right? It'd be all right, sure. If you say so. Yes, go ahead. All right, I will. Well, that'll keep her busy for a minute anyway. Yeah. Uh, Hearn. Yes, sir? Did you call me, Sergeant? Captain did. Yes, sir. Uh, take a walk down to the call box, ring into Lieutenant Gorman, and see if he's had any luck in locating the druggist. Yes, sir? And tell him I'll be here until we get her out. Okay, Captain, I'll tell him. Let me know what he says. Yes, sir. The 50th was going to send a man around to his mother's place. Yes, I know. All right, Miss Nader. We're right here. I got my drink of water. That's good. And I found this chair, too. There's no sense standing here when I can be sitting. Yes, you'll be a lot more comfortable. It's not how comfortable I am that makes a difference. But I'm getting very nervous. What? I'm getting very nervous. I want to get out of here. We'll get you out. I want you to get me out now. Right now. There's no reason why I can't get out right now. Like I told you, lady. If we can't find somebody with a key, we'll get the emergency squad over here to take off the door. I'd sure like to know when. Very soon. You've been saying that. Captain. Uh, all right. Just relax. You'll be all right. Yes, McConnell. Captain, this is Charlie, super at number 28. I'm glad to know you, Captain. Hello. Some deal we got here, huh? Yeah. Uh, you have any luck? No luck at all. I went inside and I called up my boss, which is Mr. Doyle. Well, did he have a key? Well, Mr. Doyle has got charge of residential rentals only, so he told me to call up Mr. Matthews, which is in charge of business rentals. I said, look, Mr. Doyle, Mr. Matthews don't know me from a hole in the ground. So Mr. Doyle called up Mr. Matthews and Mr. Doyle called me back. Well, did Mr. Matthews have the key? I know, sir. They said they got no keys to any of these stores. At least that's what Mr. Doyle told me Mr. Matthews told him. I talked to Mr. Doyle, Captain. He said that Matthews assured him there was no master key to these stores in their office. 
The only one who has a key is the tenant. I rang into the house, Captain. Yes, Arn. Uh, Lieutenant Gorman says the 50th got back to him. They sent a man by the house of the man's mother. She doesn't know where he's living. She hasn't heard from him in over a month. Captain. Yes, okay. Now, uh, look, Miss Nader. Put that chair down. Put it down. No, I'm going to get out of here. Look, we, we've got the emergency squad on the way, Miss Nader. You've been saying that. Now, put that chair down. What's the trouble, Sergeant? You better get back, Mikado. Keep the rest of them back. Yes, sir. Come on, Ahern. Let's get them back. Look, uh, Miss Nader! I'm getting out. You better get out of the way. I think she means it, Captain. Get back. Get back Let, now. Put that chair down. We'll get you out. Get back. Get back. Come on, Captain. Miss Nader! Captain, come on. Wait. Whoa. Are you all right, sir? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm sorry. I, I pushed you, Captain, but I, I saw that chair coming down. Don't worry about it, thanks. Yes, sir. Well, I did it. Yeah. You did it. I had to. Please help me. Now, don't step through there yet. There's a lot of that jagged glass hanging there. Mercado! Yes, Captain. Yeah, right here. Take your knife stick. Clean that glass off around there. Yes, sir. Stand a few feet back in there, Miss Nader. I want to come out. You'll be able to step out in a minute. All right. It's only going to be a minute. Excuse me, Sergeant. Go ahead, Mercado. It's all yours. Yes, sir. Okay, Mercado, that's good. Well, Captain, I I guess she solved the problem for us. I guess she did. And from now on, I don't think she'll mind if her roommate overhears a phone conversation. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Who are you, the watchman? What'd they break into? Did you see the thieves? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's missing? Oh. Yeah. Well, what was all that doing in a tool shack? Yeah. And oh, so it lie? goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Abby Lewis, John Sylvester, John Gibson, Santos Ortega, and Bob Dryden. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Ed Fleming speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Who are 
you, the watchman? What'd they break into? Did you see the thieves? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's missing? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. Yeah. Wait right at the gate there so you can show them where it is. Okay. Yeah. 21st Precinct, transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was Sunday, and things were quiet in the precinct. During the last few weeks, we had received several complaints from various churches about boys playing in nearby streets in a boisterous manner and disturbing the services. I had given instructions at the turnout for the men on post and in sector cars to correct this situation by warning the boys to play more quietly or move their games to other locations. Later, during the course of patrol, I went to the vicinity of every church in the precinct to observe whether the conditions had been corrected. En route down 2nd Avenue, I saw sector car number one, the sergeant's car, and the detective squad car of the 21st squad parked outside the fence around a new construction project on which excavation had started about two weeks before. I instructed my operator to pull in. As I got out of the car and headed for a gate in the fence, I saw Sergeant Waters also walking toward the gate from a call box on the opposite corner. Sergeant? Oh, hello, Captain. What have we got? In here, Captain. Oh, watch your step. We've had a burglary in a tool shack down there. Oh, that's a pretty deep hole they dug. Yes, sir. And they've got to go still deeper. Well, what have we got? There was a call from the watchman. Uh, see that wooden shack way down there at the bottom? Yeah. That's what was broken into. That's interesting to me how they do this. They dig it all out except for this ramp for the trucks to get in and out. Then that uh, steam shovel backs up here, digging up the ramp behind it. Well, what was stolen, Sergeant? It was a good haul. A what? Eleven sticks of dynamite and eight blasting caps. Yeah? Yes, sir. Uh, watch your step here, Captain. These planks get kind of rough. Uh, heavy trucks chew them up. Where are the detectives? Lieutenant King of Italia here, Captain. Oh. A watchman rang into the station house from a call box when he discovered the theft. Lieutenant Gorman notified the detectives. Yeah. I just spoke to Lieutenant Gorman again and told him what it looked like. Where is it? That shack there? Yes, sir. This is some hole, you know. And these engineers, they figure it out down to the fraction of an inch. Yeah. Even when they got to blast out all this rock, they shave it down over here. Oh, I uh, guess they're all in the shack, Captain. Yeah, I guess so. You see, uh, they hacked the lock right off the door. Everything was locked up. That's how they got in. First notice of it when you got back. That's right, Lieutenant, when I got back. Hello, Matt. Captain. Mr. Bernard Curley, the watchman on the job here. The sergeant tells me they got 11 sticks of dynamite and eight blasting caps. Yes, sir, that's what they got. It's Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the precinct. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you, Captain. I was in the job myself. Oh, were you? Yes, sir. I was in the old 12th precinct. I put my papers in 1944. Curly, you say? Yes, sir. I spell it K-E-R-L-Y. Oh. 
Well, how do you know exactly that it was 11 sticks of dynamite and eight blasting caps, Curly? Well, we got to keep close track of these things around here, the explosives, you know. Yeah. Now, you see this inventory tacked up here? Right here on the wall? Uh-huh. Well, that's company rules. When a fresh case is cracked open, every stick and every cap's got to be accounted for. It's scratched off the inventory as it's used. And a new case can't be brought in from the company office until the last case is entirely gone. Uh Uh-huh. So when they finished work here Friday night, they had 11 sticks and eight caps left over. They were locked up in here. Where? Right here. Loose on the shelf? Well, the shack was locked. Locked didn't do much good, did it? I guess we'll have to get a new one. What time do you think this happened? I know what time it happened. It happened from between a quarter to 12 and a quarter after. You left the premises a quarter of down the street to a luncheonette. Get sandwiches to bring back here. Are you permitted to leave? Well, company rules say we can take a half an hour off for lunch or dinner if we work in daytime. That is, on Saturday, Sunday, or holidays. If we work at nights, we got to bring our meal with us. That's the rules of this company. And you left here at a quarter to 12? Uh, yes, sir. The shack wasn't broken into then? No, sir. I made my rounds immediately before I left. That's another rule. The shack wasn't disturbed. Did you see anyone suspicious hanging around the premises this morning? No, Lieutenant. I didn't see a soul. And when did you discover the theft? As soon as I came back. I got to the top of the ramp. You know, that's just where you came in up there. Yeah. And I could see down here that this door to the shack was standing wide open. I came on down. I thought whoever it was might still be inside here. But they were gone. Then I went up to the street and I walked over to the call box and rang into the station house. I talked to the desk officer there, uh, Lieutenant uh, Gorman. Uh, Lieutenant Gorman, yes, sir. Well, it wasn't a couple of minutes before the officers got here. Did they use a lot of dynamite on this job here? Uh, a lot of dynamite. We've been blasting for ten days. You saw no sign of these thieves at all when you were coming back? Uh, no, sir. They were gone. Did you take a look around, Matt? They might have been scared off by his coming back and hitting the stuff on the premises. I, I doubt it. Well, they might have, Captain. Sergeant Tally, Woods. Yes, sir. Yes, son. Split up into teams of two. Make a thorough search around. Go over the power shovel to all the equipment behind that lumber, every place. Yes, sir. Look and see if they dropped any of the stuff or left any physical evidence of their presence. Mr. Curley. Yeah? You go with the sergeant. Okay. I ought to notify my boss, don't you think? You can do that as soon as you get through. Come on, Mr. Curley. Yo, Matt. Come in over there. Matt. Come on over here. Yes, Captain. It didn't take much to get this lock off, did it? No, sir. Not much. One good pull on whatever they used for a jimmy, and the screws came right out of the wood. Yeah. The shack is probably 30 years old. They move it around from job to job. Come on inside a second, Matt. Yes, sir. Can cause a lot of trouble. Eleven sticks of dynamite and eight blasting caps. Uh, you're telling me. But the boys that got it knew what they were after, I'm sure. They know how to handle it. Safe burglars? Yes, sir. that's what it looks like to me. They'll take it and boil it down to nitroglycerin and use it to shoot a safe someplace. It's been a long time since I've heard of anyone using nitro to shoot a safe. Yeah, I know. That ought to make it easier to spot them. As soon as we get back to the station house, I'll ring down to the safe and loft squad and tell them what we've got. Burglars today rip a safe or cut it open, don't they? Well, generally, yes, sir, but the safe and law squad might know of some old-timer that's been released lately. You ought to be able to come up with something on this. Matt, if they were safe burglars, why didn't they take this stuff? Here's a tank full of acetylene, oxygen, cutting torch. This is all made to order for safe burglars. Why didn't they take it? Captain, if a guy likes a rare steak, you just can't talk him into pork chops. Well done. The theft of the dynamite and plastic caps from this construction job did, as Lieutenant King suggested, look like the work of safe burglars, although the use of nitroglycerin to blow up a safe is now infrequent. A thorough search of the entire site of the excavation by patrolmen and detectives revealed nothing. Meanwhile, I got a call from the 19th Precinct informing me that a patrolman had been slightly injured while disarming a youthful offender carrying a switchblade knife. The patrolman had been taken to Bellevue Hospital, and as senior officer on duty in the 6th Division, I was required to conduct an investigation of the occurrence. 
I went to Bellevue and got the details of the case from the officer who suffered a long gash on his right hand. I entered the results of my investigation in the blotter at the 19th Precinct and then returned to the 21st, where Sergeant Leo F. Rosen was on telephone switchboard duty and Lieutenant Patrick Gorman was desk officer. I walked around behind the desk and signed the blotter. Hello, Captain. Sergeant. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Rosen. Hello, Red. Captain. Well, what's doing? Nice, quiet Sunday afternoon. That's good. How's that cup that was hurt? Oh, not too bad. He's got a nasty cut on his right hand, straight across the palm. Where he grabbed the open blade? Yep. Doctor had to take seven stitches in it. It can be kind of rough, an injury to the hand like that. Yeah. You know, there's about nine million nerves and tendons and bones and blood vessels come together in the hand. It'd be some job getting them all straightened out. Well, he was able to move all his fingers okay. The doctor said that was a good sign. Yeah, that is a good sign. You know, a doctor told me once that the hand is just about as complicated as any part of the body. You wouldn't figure that, would you, Captain? Well, I can see where it would be. Well, I'll be in my office. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, anything turn up on the theft of that dynamite? Uh, no, sir, nothing yet. Uh, but there's Matt King. Maybe he's got a line by now. Yeah, you may have. Matt? Hello, Captain. Anything on that dynamite theft? No, sir, not yet. You know, that's got me plenty worried. It's got me worried, too, Captain. I'll tell you why. I... Excuse me, Captain. Yes, Sergeant. Vitaly's ringing down where you want to check it before you go out. All right. You want to take it in my office, Matt? Yeah, thanks. I'll take it in the captain's office, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Tally is carrying the squeal on this. He might have something. Go ahead. Help yourself. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Yeah, the... Yeah, what'd they say? Well, well who was it you talked to? Who? Well, you ought to know. Yeah, all right. Just keep at it. Tally spoke to one of the men down at the safe and loft squad. Yeah. Tally says they know of no one around who's using nitro to blow a safe. Haven't had a case like that in a couple of years. Have there been any penitentiary releases? None they know of. They're checking into it. Well, makes it kind of rough going, Captain. You know what I think, man? What? I don't think it was safe burglars at all that broke into that shack. I think it was a bunch of kids. I don't know, Captain. It was timed out just right. They knew when the watchman left. They knew when he got back. They got in, got the stuff, and got out. All in a half an hour. Well, that may be so, Matt, but... Oh, excuse me. 21st Precinct, Captain Kennelly. Lieutenant Gorman, Captain. Yes, Red. A call just came over the air, Captain. An explosion on a vacant lot over New York Avenue. What kind of explosion? The call didn't say, Captain, but there must be at least one person injured. It came over ambulance responding. All right. Get a car to take me over there right away. Yes, sir. Well, Matt, I think we found the dynamite. Yeah? But I think we found it a little late. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now, back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. While I waited for the car to come by the house for me, the first officer to arrive on the scene rang into the station house, reporting that the explosion in the vacant lot, the site of a recently wrecked tenement, was apparently caused by the detonation of blasting caps. An unidentified boy, who appeared to be between the ages of 12 and 15, had been injured by the blast. Within another two minutes, sector car number two arrived at the station house. I got into the car and was driven to the scene of the occurrence with siren wide open. As we pulled into the block, I could see that a fair-sized crowd had gathered on the sidewalk and were being kept back by two of the patrolmen already on the job. The ambulance had not yet arrived. All right, get on the job. Help keep those people back. All right. 
All right. Police officer. Coming through there. Coming through. Sergeant. Hello, Captain. Well, I uh, guess we know who got the dynamite. Yep. I guess we do. He looks pretty bad, doesn't he? Yes, sir. Has he been conscious at all? No, sir. Awful bad. You know who the boy is? There's no identification in his pockets, Captain. Who, uh, want to take a look over here? Yeah. Apparently, he was playing around with the blasting caps. Those two sticks of dynamite were right here where they're laying. It's lucky he didn't have them close enough to be set off when the caps went. Be dead for sure. How many caps went, do you know? There's no telling, sir. So, uh, here's the ambulance. Yeah. A man who lives on the second floor of that building there, he was down here. He said he was looking out the window before and saw three boys sitting out here in the middle of the lot. Three? Yes, sir, three. Said they had something. He didn't know what it was. Then a little while later, two of them were gone, he said, and there was just this one left. Uh-huh. man went back into his flat to do something. A few minutes later, he heard this explosion out on the lot. Did he recognize any of the boys? No, sir. He didn't think they were from this block. Uh, all right, you men. Give him a hand. Help them bring that stretcher back here. Uh, did uh, anybody around say they knew the boys, Sergeant? Nobody we've talked to yet. All right. You better get those explosives into the station house. Yes, sir. I told Farrell to stay right with them. Good. All right. Bring it right over here, please. Hello, Doctor. Captain. All right. Open up that stretcher. Act alive. What happened to him? He was playing with some blasting caps. Was he? Sergeant, can you give me a hand here a minute? Sure. I'd like to put him on his right side for just a second. All right. Uh, wait a minute. I'll, I'll tell you when. Okay. Easy now. All right. With me. Yeah. Now. Uh-huh. Easy. Can you hold him there? Sure. That's good. That's fine. Hold him. Just, just hold him. I'm holding him, Doctor. All right. Let him rest back now. Okay. Easy. That's it. That boy is seriously hurt, Captain. Will he be all right, do you know? We'll find out when we get him admitted to the hospital. What did you say he was playing with? Blasting caps? Yes. They never learn, do they? I hope this one does. The ambulance surgeon, assisted by the ambulance attendant and police officers, placed the injured boy on the stretcher. Meanwhile, detectives of the 21st Squad arrived on the scene to begin their investigation. After I left the scene of the occurrence, I continued on patrol until a few minutes after 2 p.m., when I instructed the operator of my car to drive to the emergency entrance to Beth David Hospital. I got out of the car, walked through the emergency room, past the admitting office, and down the corridor to the place I was told I could find Dr. Margaret Westphal. Hello, Doctor. Captain. How's the boy? Not so good. Will you be able to do anything? He's in there. Emergency surgery. Uh Uh-huh. He went back to X-ray. We made some pictures. He's in bad shape. Well, the blast tore a hole in his chest. We called in our chief thoracic surgery. He's on the way. In the meantime, we're giving him plasma. Do you need any whole blood? We don't know yet. Every man in the precinct is typed. I think we could get some volunteers over here on a few minutes' notice. Thanks a lot, Captain. We'll see. All right. You just let me know. I will. A um, lieutenant from your precinct is here. A detective. Lieutenant King? Yes, Lieutenant King. He's right back there. When did he get here? A few minutes ago. He told me he knows who the boy is. Oh, does he? That's what he says. In here. Thank you, Doctor. 
Hello, Matt. Captain. I understand you've got an identification. Well, it's a tentative identification. Vitaly ran it down. We think the boy's name is Frank Harrods. He lives near where the stuff was stolen. They ought to be more careful about the way that dangerous material is left around. Well, Doctor, I don't see how they could have been more careful. It was locked up in a tool shed in the middle of an excavation surrounded by an eight-foot fence. Well, I have to be angry at something. I think I better get back to him. All right. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Uh, shall I leave this open? Yes, please. All right. Has the family been notified, ma'am? According to the neighbors, the boy's got no mother. The father wasn't around the flat. Vitaly is trying to run him down. Are you sure that's the boy? Sure as we can be at the moment. The doctor got me these clothes he was wearing. If Vitaly brings the father down, he can look at the clothes first. What about the other nine sticks of dynamite and the rest of the blasting caps? We're trying to locate them. A neighbor over where the boy got hurt said there were two others with him earlier. Did you get a line on them? Well, we know that they were up to this boy's flat this morning while the father was there. You ought to know who they are. Who found that out? The tally? Yes, sir. Old man lives on the first floor of the building. He said he saw the three boys go out at the same time the father did. Said the father acted very friendly to the other boys. He'd seen them all around there before. You haven't been able to find out who they were from any other source, have you, man? Oh, not yet, Captain. Well, we'd better find out soon. There's still nine sticks of that dynamite missing. We don't know how many percussion caps. No, we don't. Yeah, these kids. They sure can get themselves in a mess. Excuse me. Uh, Lieutenant King? Yes? Uh, there's a detective at Tali and another man outside. Oh, all right. I didn't want to send them back here until I got your okay. It's okay. All right, I'll send them back. wonder where Veet found him. Maybe he came home. How old is the boy? You know for sure? No, not for sure. I think about 14. That's what the neighbors say. 14? What are we going to do with these kids, Captain? It isn't a cop's job to straighten them out. Why are they hanging on us? The trouble is, Matt, it doesn't get to us until somebody else has already missed the boat. Oh. Right back there, Mr. Harris. Thank you. Come in, V. Oh, Lieutenant. Captain. Vitaly. This is Mr. Carl Harris. Captain Kennelly. Mr. Harris. Hi. And Lieutenant King. Hi. Are you sure it's Frank they got in there? Pretty sure, Mr. Harris. You shut the door, V. Yep. Yeah. Well, how is he? Is he all right? They've got him over there in the operating room. We're waiting for the sergeant. That surgeon. I hope he's not going to cost an arm and a leg. I'm not made of money, you know. Let's not worry about it now. Are, uh, are these Frank's clothes, Mr. Harris? Are these? Yeah. They're his. They, they, those are his pants. I recognize the pants. Listen, oh, who, who is this surgeon, anyway? What, what is he going to operate for? The detective at Tally told you what happened, didn't he? I told him, Lieutenant, yes. Those caps exploded against his chest. It's a chest surgeon that's coming. Oh, that's pretty bad, huh? Yes. Well, how bad is it, Lieutenant? How bad, Captain? Bad enough. Mr. Harris, you know where Frank got hold of that stuff? No, the detective told me he, he broke into a construction shack. That's right. Well, what kind of proof he got? He got no proof that he broke into anything. Nobody saw him. The stuff he stole blew up and almost killed him. That's proof enough, isn't it? For you, maybe not for me. Mr. Harrods, do uh, you think you ought to notify Frank's mother? How can I notify her? <laughs> I don't know where she is. Ran off three years ago, left me holding the sack with the kid. He's your boy, isn't he? Yeah, yes, sir. He's, he's my boy, but I got to work for a living. I got, I got no time to raise him. That should have been his mother's job. You don't know where to find her? No, sir. Hear anything from her? Kidding. I... Uh, listen, give it to me straight now. Now, how is he? He's not not good. Not good, no. Who were the two boys he was with this morning? Why do you want to know that? There's still nine sticks of dynamite missing and probably most of the blasting caps. Who were they? How should I know who they are? We were told that they were at your flat this morning with Frank. They'd been there often. You 
know them all. Now, look, I, I'm not turning in any kids. If you want them, go and find them. Mr. Harris, the same thing is liable to happen to them as happened to Frank. Well, that's not my worry. Supposing it happened to one of them and Frank was running around with explosives, you'd want it cleared up fast, wouldn't you? I don't know. Have all kids all, all down in that court? I, I, I'd take the chance on, on, on Frank handling himself okay, then. Sure handled himself fine, didn't Now, it? look, find out for yourself. I, I don't want to get involved in this any more than I am already. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Harrods. It's not just those other two boys that are involved. They're liable to try something with that stuff. They're liable to hurt some other people. Now, who are they and where can we find them? Go find them yourself. It's not my responsibility. Isn't it? You just think it isn't. It isn't. You can't make it mine. Come in. Now, I'm not going to let you... Excuse me. Captain, can I see you out here a minute? Yeah, sure. You can't, you can't make this my responsibility. Yes, Doctor? Is that the boy's father? Yes. I've got bad news, Captain. The boy died. Oh. The whole thoracic cavity was badly damaged. Both lungs, the heart, he was hemorrhaging. There really wasn't much that could have been done. No. Not after he stole the explosives. What's the father's name? Harrods. Carl Harris. Well, look, Doctor, this is a police case. We can notify him. No. No, thank you, Captain. I won't accomplish anything. I won't accomplish anything except to get Frank in bad with his friends when he gets out of here. There's one thing I, I don't want to do with my kid. That's, that's peg him as a rat. Rat on his friends. You know. Mr. Harrods, uh, this is Dr. Weston. That's all I got to say, Captain. Dr. Who? Dr. Weston. Oh, very pleased to meet you. Uh, are you the one that's been taking care of Frank? Yes. Well, listen, uh, what is all this about, uh, about a surgeon being called in? I don't want any surgeon called in unless I, I'm, I'm consulted first. If he needs to be operated all right, but I, I want to have the privilege, you know, of, of talking it over first. He doesn't need the surgeon, Mr. Harris. Well, that's very good to hear. That's... Wait a minute. Listen, he, he, he didn't die. Yes, he did, Mr. Harris. Five minutes ago. I'm sorry. Yeah. Here. Better sit down, Mr. Oh, Harris. That's, that's all right. I'm all right. You'd better. Okay. You take a bath. Hurt? Yeah, I, I know. I knew he was hurt bad, but I didn't think kids died. I, I didn't think it. He's 14 years old. 14. Why don't you gentlemen wait outside? No, no, no don't go. I'll... No, don't go. I, I want to give them the names of the other boys. I, I want to give them to you. I, I'm sorry. I'll be all right. I, I'll be all right in a minute here. We'll wait outside. You better, yes. Pardon me. No, don't go away. I want to talk to you. We'll be right outside. Yeah. I was wrong about him. I thought he was pretty hard. He was, man. I just wish it hadn't taken so much to soften him up. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Shooting where? Talking to the phone, will you? Where's the shooting? Lexington and what? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood miracle round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed the factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department of the city of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Elaine Rost, Bill Smith, Lynn Cook, Santos Ortega, and Bill Zucker. Written and directed by Stanley Ness. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. George Bryan speaking.
21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. The shooting where? Talk into the phone, will you? Where's the shooting? Lexington and what? Yeah, well, who shot? Who? Yeah. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Okay. Go back there and wait. The officers will be right over there. Yeah, that's right. I'm sending them now. Right now. 21st Precinct, transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. I had come into the station house at 3.25 in order to give myself enough time before the turnout of the platoon to change to uniform, read reports and communications, and confer with the desk officers, Lieutenant Gorman and Lieutenant Snyder, who were coming on and going off duty, respectively. When I turned out the platoon, the most important instructions I gave the men concerned a series of armed robberies of liquor stores which had plagued detectives and the patrol force of every precinct on the east side of Manhattan, uptown from 34th Street during the last three weeks. The two armed men had hardly missed a night. Sometimes they hit twice or three times in the same night. The victim was always a package store. The time was always between 7 and 10 p.m. The score was 19 robberies and $3,300. It didn't look like they were ready to quit. Of the 19 robberies, six were in the 21st Precinct, and Lieutenant King, the commander of the 21st Detective Squad, hadn't been home in a week. Neither had most of his men. After the 62 men who would patrol the precinct until midnight marched out the front door of the station house to take over their posts, I returned to my office, closed the door, and walked over to my desk to more thoroughly read the reports waiting for my signature. 21st Precinct, Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Waters on TS, Captain. Yes, Sergeant. Lieutenant King is down at the desk. He wants to know if he can see you a minute. Yes, yeah, sure. Tell him to come in. Yes, sir. Okay, Lieutenant. Go on in. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Have a car come by the house for me at 435. I want to go out on patrol. Yes, sir. Come in. No, come in, Matt. Hello, Captain. I saw the door closed. I thought you might have someone in here. Sit down, Matt. Yes, sir. No, I... Uh... I've been keeping it closed when I'm in here. Some psycho has been wandering into the station house and heading right for my office before anyone could stop him. He's got some story about the flying saucers being after him. Oh, him? We had him up in the squad, too. Well, how are you doing on those liquor store robberies, Matt? Get any line on them? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about, Captain. Yeah? The borough chief called all the squad commanders concerned to a meeting this afternoon. What do you have to say? We well, had plenty to say for a half hour straight. Nineteen armed robberies, he said. Same two guys. Always in liquor stores, always between 7 and 10 p.m. Nobody's been able to get a line on them, he said. Nobody's been able to get the first base. Well, he can't say you haven't been working. No, sir, he can't say that. We've been running down every angle we get. We've been planting a few stores he, we thought they might hit. They've been doing the same thing in the other squads. What did the chief say? Nineteen robberies and no shooting yet. He said to stretch it to the 20th it would be going too far. Said if we don't get them right now, they're going to kill some victim. Yeah, well, I don't think he's far wrong about that. Well, sir, neither do I. I've been worrying about it all along. Well, what are you going to do? We're going to put almost a 100% plant on package stores between 34th Street and 96th Street. Plant all of them? Well, there's a couple of hundred. Well, we're narrowing it down some. In the first place, these guys haven't hit a store where there's been more than one clerk. Always only one clerk on the job. Well, that takes it down a lot. Yes, sir. And out of the 19 jobs, only two of them were on cross streets. The rest were on avenues. Why do you figure that is? I don't know. It must be something in their mind, I guess. That takes it down some more, eliminating all the stores on the cross streets. Yeah? And they haven't yet hit a store that's been on a corner. Oh, 
haven't they? No, sir. Every one of the 19 has been in the middle of the block, or at least away from the corner. Well, I guess they figure there's more chance for someone to see inside the store if it's on a corner. Yes, sir, that might be it. So we've got it down to within reason. Well, are you going to plant two men in each? Yes, sir, there's been two stick-up men in every case, both of them armed. We'll need two to handle them. That'll take a lot of men. Well, uh, everybody from the five squads is working. Yeah? The chief is putting half the men from the Manhattan East Homicide Squad and half the men from the youth squad on the job. And the uh, chief of detectives is sending as many men as he can spare. No, five here, six there, ten there. Yeah? The central office bureaus are giving us about 12 men. We've got a couple each from the safe and loft and narcotics squad. Mm Mm-hmm. The chief got hold of every division commander in Manhattan East, and they're giving us about 20 plainclothesmen. And, uh... We're asking the precincts concerned to furnish four or preferably six patrolmen to work in plain clothes. You caught me on a night when I'm kind of short, Matt. Well, I won't ask you for six, Captain. How about four? All right, uh, I'll get you four men. Each of them will be assigned on a plant with an experienced detective. Yeah, that's the way it should be. When does this go into effect? Tonight, we've got the surveys made. We know the stores we're going to plant... It's all set for tonight. And uh, how long do you expect it to continue? I don't know, Captain. Depends on when we get them. Immediately after conferring with Lieutenant King, I went out into the muster room and around behind the desk to apprise Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, of the situation. After considerable discussion, we determined the names of four patrolmen to be assigned to work with the detectives on this case. They were called in off their posts, told to change to civilian clothes and report to Lieutenant King forthwith. Within an hour, Lieutenant King furnished to Lieutenant Gorman a complete list of 31 package stores in the precinct that would be planted in the hope of catching the stick-up men in the act of committing robbery. As patrolmen on post rang in at their stated times, they were informed by the desk officer of the stores on their posts in which detectives would be on duty. Patrolman Fallon, the 124 man, typed up complete lists for the men in sector cars and the sergeants. At 6.45 p.m., Detective William Novak of the 21st Squad and Patrolman Paul Vaccaro, who had been assigned to work with him in plain clothes, were on Lexington Avenue walking toward the Fairbridge Liquor Store, which they were under instructions to plant. Uh, Plant's the worst deal in a book. Uh, It's better than walking post. Yeah, well, you told me that three hours from now, and you're a liar. (laughs) Hey, wait a minute. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. Let me talk to the guy, have a count? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Go ahead. Uh-huh. What do you say? What, what did you have in mind? We've got a special in rum. Uh, we're detectives. Oh. My name's Novak. This is Vaccaro. Hi. How are you? Healers. Jack Healers. Glad to know you. You know, for a minute I was worried when you came in. I've been hearing all this about watch out for two men together, those hold-ups, you know. Yeah. Well, that's what we're here to see you about. What do you mean? Are you the boss? You own the place? No, I'm not the boss. I'm just a clerk. The boss went home. He works days. I work nights. Yeah, well, we want to stick around here a while tonight. What do you mean, stick around? Why? Well, I'll tell you, Jack. It's not that we're expecting anything, but just in case these guys do walk in, we want to give you some protection. Okay? Listen, you're sure? Sure about what? That you don't expect them here. We don't expect them here any more than we do any place else. We're covering a lot of places tonight. Oh. Hey, listen, what's this here? A special on champagne? Yeah, special this week. It's pretty cheap for French champagne. Lay off. That's a lousy year. That's why it's cheap. The connoisseurs won't touch it. Oh. This neighborhood is lousy with connoisseurs. I wondered why it was so cheap. Eh, these guys have held up a lot of package stores, huh? Nineteen. I've been working here eight years. Nobody has ever stuck me up yet, knock on wood. Well, you can never tell when your number's up. So what we'd like to do is stay back there in the stock room while you just go about your business, okay? It's all right with me. Let's take a look back there. Yeah, sure. It's not much. Go ahead. After you. Thanks. I'll get the light. It's not much back here. You said it. But if this is where you want to stay, I guess up to you. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, we'll move a couple of these cases around so we can sit on them. All right? Yeah. Wait a minute. I'll give you a hand there. Yeah. Get that one over there, Carol. Okay. Make it a little more comfortable. Yeah. Where do you want it? 
Yeah, right here. Now, let's see how this is going to be. Shut that door about halfway, Vicar. Okay. Now, turn out the light, huh? All right. Yeah. Yeah, this is going to be all right. We can sit back here and see everything that goes on out in the store with a bird's eye view. You want the light on now? Yeah, for a minute. That's uh, generally where you stand? At the counter, isn't it? That's where all the customers come in to you? Yeah, that's right, right there. Good. And where, where can we put our coats? I don't think I've got any more hangers back there. Oh, never mind. We'll just throw them over the cases. All right, if you want to. Okay, but Kyle, take your coat off. Yeah, okay. Now, before we get settled down, let's go out in front again a minute. All right. You don't think they'll come, but just in case they do, what happens? Well, that's what I was going to tell you. Now, one of these guys always comes up to the counter. The other one stands near the door. Yeah. We can see both the counter and the door from back there, so we can see both of them. Here comes a customer. Okay. Good evening, madam. Good evening. I'd like a fifth of scotch, please. Do you have any particular kind in mind? Well, I... This is very nice. Selkirk and Peebles. Selkirk and Peebles? A very fine brand of scotch whiskey. Well, I'll, I'll have to admit I never heard of it. Hey, look, look at that label. Selkirk and Peebles, established in 1778. Must be good if they stayed in business that long. Must be. But don't you think I ought Lady, to... Lady, I'll, I'll, I'll sell you anything you want, but you take my word for it. You take this Selkirk and Peebles and you'll be back for more. Let me put it to this gentleman here. Now, what do you think of S&P? I tell you the truth, I'm not a scotch drinker. I don't know one scotch from the other. <laughs> well, my husband is, and he does. Then you take this bottle of Selkirk and Peebles home to your husband. And if he's not satisfied with it, I'll miss my guess. Well... You'll be back for more. All right. What did you say, two-fifths? One. Just one, please. Here you are. Out of ten dollars... Yeah, 60, 75, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 1 is 10. Thank you very much. Call again, ma'am. Good night. And you'll be back for more. I hope so. <laughs> so Kirk and Peebles, huh? The boss says push it, so I push it. The salesman sold him, so I got to sell the customers. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's as good as any of them. Never even heard of it. I got news for you. Neither did I. Well, let's get set here. Now I'll tell you. And you just go about your business the way you would normally. Now forget we're even back there. All right. We'll see everything that goes on out here. And if these two guys come in, don't try to signal us. Don't try to attract our attention. Don't look to the back. Just do what they tell you. Get your hands up in the air, open the cash register, do whatever they tell you. All right. And when we yell at them, they won't pay any more attention to you. They turn around toward us. You hit the floor and stay there. All right? Okay. <laughs> now you got me a little shaky. Now don't be shaky, Jack. Let me ask you a question. If they come in here, are you better off alone, or are you better off with us in back? You sold me. Come on, Vicar. Right with you. Just a normal operation, okay? Okay. Get the light, Vicar. All right. Now, settle down. You've got a long wait. Yeah. <clears throat> Think we ought to smoke back here? I don't see why not. Just keep it covered. Novak. All right, I see them. Sit tight. Two of them. And they fit. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. What do you got in a bottle of rye? Ah, uh, here. Here's a real nice one. There you are. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, anything else? No, that'll be all. How much? That'll be four dollars and five cents. Easy. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, gentlemen. All again. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Oh, brother. Yeah. Jack, you're a real trooper. What do you mean, I'm a real trooper? Oh, those two guys look right. You acted as natural as all get out. Well, why shouldn't I? They're from the shoe store around the corner. I've known them for years. All right, just keep up the good work. Hey, look, it's uh, it's not going to be like that every time the door opens up, is it? I'll tell you. That depends who opens the door. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Today's newspaper is just like yesterday's, you figure. Hardly seems worthwhile to buy one, since the authorities closed down all the newspaper plants except their own. 
government decrees, new laws, work quotas, makes pretty dull reading. And there's no sense in trying to figure out what's true and what isn't. You get their side of the news, or none at all. Can't compare it with others. There aren't any others. And people are so afraid to talk that you hardly get any news by word of mouth anymore. Well, that's the picture in some countries where the government owns or controls the press, but not in yours. You know why? It's because your government is absolutely forbidden from ever making a law to restrict freedom of speech or freedom of the press. Those freedoms were protected for you by a group of men who sat down 165 years ago and wrote out our Constitution and Bill of Rights. In the first article, they wrote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. That's why you can buy a newspaper with an editorial page where someone writes his views on a particular subject. If his views aren't in accord with yours, well, you can write in and tell him so. And like as not, they'll print your letter the next day. And you have a freedom of choice of which newspaper you want to read, too, or which book you want to buy, or movie you want to see. It's guaranteed for you by our Bill of Rights. It is one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. While Detective Novak and Patrolman Vaccaro waited on a plant in the stockroom of the liquor store on Lexington Avenue, officers were concealed in other package stores in the 15th, 19th, 21st, and 23rd precincts where the rash of armed robberies had broken out. Meanwhile, the entire patrol force in these districts, which together comprised the 6th Division, was on the alert for the stick-up men who had committed 19 robberies in three weeks. As part of this alert, I remained on patrol for a longer period than usual and was still out at 9.40 p.m., nearly three hours after Detective Novak and Patrolman Vaccaro first went on the plant. During that time, the front door to the shop had opened nearly 30 times. Each time, the officer tensed. Then they relaxed. Well, tell me, Vaccaro, what's better? Walking the post or sitting on a plant? Well, this sure isn't any pleasure. You said it isn't. Oh, Jack. Yeah? When's closing time? Ten o'clock. Good. What? I said good. Want another cigarette? No, no, thanks. Well, look, tell me something. You, uh, you pull down this kind of a job often? I mean, sitting on a plant like this? No, not too often. Well, that's good. Stop complaining. You've only been here three hours. Wait till you've been on one for 16 hours straight. On your feet, mm -hmm. out in the cold, waiting for some guy to show up who's never coming. Then you can complain. You fellas gonna be back tomorrow night? We don't know yet. Well, you made nice company. Oh. Thank you. Oh, my aching back. Stand up a while. I tried that. Nothing helps. Hold it. Customers. Evening, gentlemen. They don't fit. Quiet. What'll be, gentlemen? What do you got in the rye? Rye whiskey? Well, we've got those over here. Never mind that. Just put those hands on the... Take it easy. Yeah, all right. Hold it now. Hold it. Now just be a good boy. We both got the difference here, and you could get your head blown off. Take right. it easy. Come on, let's get the door. Easy, hold it a second. Wait till I kick the door open. Yeah, sure. Come on, move out of the way. All right. You set? Yeah. Looks pretty good, eh? All right, now. <laughs> Police officers! Cut! Get him! Get him up! Shoot! Duck! Watch it! Get him! Get away from me! You got him! Hold up there! Hold up! All right. All right. Now get the hands up! All right, get him up high. Drop that. The carols. Take a look at one that's down. Yeah, all right. All right, now you. Kick the gun over here. Go on, kick it. All right. Yeah, I think this one's dead. Caught one right between the eyes. Jack, you all right? Yeah. Where are you? On the floor. All right, you can get up now. Yeah, I got the other one's gun. All right, hold on to it. Okay, you. Lean up against the counter. Go on. Go on, lean up. Get there. All right, take it easy. See what's on it, Carol. Yeah. Take it easy. Shut up. Boy, what a mess. You better get over there out of the way, Jack. Oh. Ah. Uh, over here, all right? That's fine. Yeah. Money's in his top coat pocket. Yeah, I got it. All right, hold on to it. I hear the cop on the beat. Uh, what's going on there? What do you got? Uh, the liquor store bandits. We're okay. Post yourself out front. Keep the people out. Okay. All right. Let's get the cuffs on them. All right, put your hands behind you. How am I going to lean? Lean with your head. Get your hands behind you. Oh! Okay. 
All right, he's set. All right, mister, straighten up. Well, listen, what do you want from me? I want plenty from you. Sit down on the floor there. Go ahead, sit down. All right. Keep your eye on him. I'll ring in. Yeah, all right. Going to use the phone, Jack. Help yourself. Boy, that was close. Pretty close. So it was. Hello, CB. Detective Novak, 21st Squad. Send an ambulance to 3302 Lexington Avenue. Yeah, 3302. We were sitting on a plane at a liquor store. Two men attempted to commit an armed robbery. One shot, we're holding the other. No, no, I think he's dead. Yeah, all right. Will you connect me with 21st? Yeah, thanks. How many shots were fired around here anyway? I didn't have time to count them, Jay. Hello, Sergeant, Detective Novak. We're on a plant at 3302 Lexington. Yeah, Vaccaro and I. Yeah, that's right. They came in. Uh, one dead, I think. We got the other one. All right, good. Will you ring upstairs? Okay, thanks, Sergeant. That was good work. That was good work. Thanks, Jack. I knew you were back there. I knew everything was going to be all right. <sighs> but I was still scared to death. Well, I don't blame you. I know how you feel. All right, where do you live? What's this slob got to say for himself? Uh, nothing yet. Just that his name is Earl Creedy. Earl Creedy, huh? Where do you live? Downtown, in the village. Well, you've been living up here on the east side lately, haven't you? What do you mean? Nineteen stick-ups in three weeks, that's what I mean. You're out of your mind. Don't tell me I'm out of my mind. All right, what's your friend's name? Navin. Richie Navin. Where does he live? In the village, too. How old are you? Twenty-four. How old is he? Oh, no. Same age, I guess, I never asked him. You been in trouble before? Yeah, I've been in trouble before. How many times you arrested? I don't know, four, five, six, something like that. You ever do any big time? Yeah, I did some big time. What for? Grain larceny. How much did you do? 27 months. I got news for you, mister. You're going to do some more. Yeah, guess I am. Well, listen. Is he dead? Yeah, it looks that way. It's too bad he was a nice guy. Yeah. A sweetheart. Listen, Mr. Novak, I better call my boss, don't you think? Now, wait a while. I like to keep this phone open. Well, he's entitled to know. Well, it won't hurt him if he knows five minutes later. He got some of the money out of the cash register. One put it in his pocket. No, no, no. We got it. Started stuffing his pocket. I don't even know how much was in there altogether until I totaled it up. I got to let my boss know how much, how, how much it was. Well, whatever it is, you'll get it back. It wasn't much. It was enough. You better go stand over there, Jack. Brother, what a mess around here. Who is it, Vaccaro? Yes, Sergeant. Vaccaro and Novak. Well, looks like you hit the jackpot. Yeah, I guess we did, Sergeant. This is a lucky one, huh? Yeah, lucky. I'm the luckiest man in the world. You sure are. Sure the other one's dead? Yeah, you got one right between the eyes. Well, 20 was your magic number, huh, mister? What do you mean, 20? You guys sure get dumb in a hurry, don't you? What happened? Well, we got on a plant here at 6.45. We sat in back there. These two guys walked in about 9.30. We didn't think too much of them at first. No, sir, we didn't. They're not very close to the description. What description? You just sit there and keep your mouth shut. But we kept our eyes on them anyway. They asked for a bottle of rye, and they walked over to the counter. And that one there stayed by the door, and this one talked to the clerk. This one pulled a gun out and started threatening around. We got set and came out after them. We told them we were cops. They turned on us. This is how it wound up. I don't see how it could have wound up any other way. You guys just pressed your luck too much. Did the call come over ambulance responding, Sergeant? Yeah, Vaccaro, there's an ambulance on the way. Well, let's go over and take a look at the other one. Well, what does he mean, press my luck? Yeah, I think he's had it. Who's a good marksman? You or Novak? Well, to tell you the truth, Sergeant, I don't know. I was shooting at both of them, first one and the other. How many shots you fired? Well, I, uh... I think I got a four. I don't know. Let me take a look. Never mind. Sit still. Yeah, four. What's this one's name, you know? Well, the other one says this one is Richie Navin. Poor Richie, huh? Yeah. Poor Richie. Well, he looked for it. And he got it. Well, let's talk to the clerk. That's the truth. It's the honest-to-goodness truth. You wouldn't know the truth if it had a neon sign on it. Hello, Jack. Oh, hi, Sergeant. Well, you hit the jackpot tonight. I guess I did. And I want to quit while I'm ahead. Well, there's a captain. Hello, Captain. Good work, Vaccaro. Thanks, Captain. Well, this ends a lot of trouble for us. Yes, I know. I gave you a rough time, huh? 
Well, we weren't sure at first that it was them. They weren't too close to the descriptions we had. I know it was them. I was looking at their guns. Well, I want to see what that one has to say for himself. Don't forget you fellas have your top coats in back there. Don't worry, we won't. <laughs> Hello, Novak. Captain, this is the sorriest thief you ever met. He gets hooked hot on the job, his partner gets killed, and he's still got nerve enough to insist that this is the first deal he's been in on. What's your name? How many times do I have to say it? Now, look, mister, you better get straightened out and get straightened out fast. Now, tell the captain your name. It's Creedy. Earl Creedy. You and your partner have been pretty busy boys, haven't you? Just met him today. Look, what do you want from me? Sure, you just met him today. And you dreamt about those 19 other stick-ups. I don't know anything about any other 19 stick-ups. He hasn't given us a hard enough time already. He wants to make it harder. Where'd you meet him? I told you you wouldn't believe me anyway, so what's the use of telling you? Uh, you tell me and let me make up my own mind. Where'd you meet him? In a bar down in the village. What bar was that? I don't know, some, some bar on 7th Avenue. When? Today, this afternoon. And you got to be such good friends that you just decided to go out together and stick up a liquor store, hmm? Well, that's not exactly the way we decided, but it'll do. Now, why don't you tell us the truth? I am telling you the truth. What have I got to hold back? Who do you think you're fooling? Not us. I'm not trying to fool anybody. You're past that stage. Hello, Captain. Hello, Matt. Good work, Novak. Thank you, Lieutenant. And this is Earl Creedy. The other one's Richard Navin. Earl doesn't believe in telling the truth. He says this is the first liquor store he ever heisted. He says he had nothing to do with those 19 others. He's right. He didn't. He didn't? Got yourself a good pair of heisters, Novak. But the ones we're looking for just hit down the 15th precinct. That's five minutes ago. No kidding. You see, I told you. Did they hit a store that was planted, Matt? No, they got away clean, Captain. Number 20. I get dropped on number one. And they hit number 20. Some luck I got. Well, you're better off than they are, Earl. You're through. They're still shopping around for what your friend got. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah. Yeah. How many women? What is it? A bargain sale there? What do they want? Yeah. Yeah. And so it goes. And we open the store? Around the clock, through the week, every wow. day, every year. The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed the factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Martha Greenhouse, John Sylvester, Frank Marth, Mason Adams, and Lawson Zerby. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. George Bryan speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. I'll send a car around there. Right away. Yeah. Okay. 21st precinct transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, their persons and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. The weather had turned exceedingly cold over the weekend, and for the first time, the men turned out in their winter overcoats. After the platoon marched out the front door, I went into my office to read over reports of occurrences in the command during the last 24 hours while I was off duty. Shortly after 9 o'clock, I walked out into the muster room, through the back room, and across the iron bridge into the station house annex which houses the cells where prisoners arrested in the precinct are held until taken to court. According to procedure, and in the company of patrolman Bailey, the station house attendant, I made an inspection of the cells to see that they were clean and supplied with paper drinking cups, towels, and so forth. After I concluded this inspection, I returned to the back room and headed toward the muster room where a heated discussion was going on between the desk officer, Lieutenant Gorman, on the one hand, and several women on the other. Now, please. Now, please. All right. All right. All right, All right ladies. What's the trouble, Sergeant? I haven't been able to make it out yet, Captain. All right, now, look. What are you doing, Sergeant? Water. All right. All right. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. One at a time. Means one at a time. What have you got, Red? I'm proud of you, Captain. Now, one of you's got to do the talking. Who will it be? Mine's the most valuable. I'll talk. I'll talk plenty. Let it be me. All right. Now, wait a minute. Uh, you, lady, what's your name? Me? Yes. Mrs. Perford. Mrs. Sarah Perford. All right. Now, let's let Mrs. Perford tell what happened. And the rest of us will just listen. We'll all get out there. All right? All yes, right. Sir. All right, Mrs. Perfect. Well, he stole our fur coat. Who did? The farrier. What's his name? Audley. What's his first name? George, George C. How'd he come to steal your coat? Well, it's not... Uh, his. wait a minute. Is he in business over on East 86th Street? Yes. Fern Hill Furrier? That's right. 738 East 86th Street. I had my coat in storage there since May, and I can't get it back. Neither can any of us, can we? No. That's right. right. So why won't he give them back to you? Well, he keeps saying he will. But he never does. Now, I've been trying for two weeks. Two weeks? I've been trying for months. All right. Well, this this okay. Uh, does he give any reason? Well, I had to have a new lining put in mine. He keeps telling me the material hasn't come in yet. Then he tells her the right fur isn't there That's yet. That's right. The sleeves are a little bit worn. He was going to get skin to match. I see. But mine was just being stored, and I can't get it back. And there weren't any repairs to mine, and he keeps stalling me. Well, what did he tell you? Well, he keeps telling just me... Just a minute, just a minute. I'm supposed to do the talking. Uh, no, that's all right. I'd like to hear what he keeps telling us. Oh, well, excuse me. Well, he keeps telling me that he has two, so he has much storage space business that he didn't have enough room in his own vault to store the coats. And, well, so he had to send most of them over to a wholesale storage company. And mine's not back yet. Well, maybe he's right. Maybe he's just having a hard time getting the work out. Oh, no, it's nothing like that. Uh, are the two of you friends? No. No, we don't know each other, do we? No. You 
see, we were at the store this morning, and he didn't open up. It's 9.30, and he didn't show up. There were the three of us and ten other women waiting for him. We all had coats in there being fixed or stored or something like that, and we got to talking. We found out that he'd been stalling all of us, stalling us for weeks about our coats. Anyway, I said I was willing to do something about it. I was the one who said it. It doesn't make any difference who said it. We decided to come over here and see if anything could be done about it. That's right. And what makes you think he stole your coat? If he didn't steal them, where are they? Well, the store is still there, isn't it? The store is still there, but he isn't. He didn't open up today. That's right. Yeah, yeah, all right. Fun. All right. Uh, you're Mrs. Perford. That's right. And you? Mrs. Tresseter. Mrs. Amy Tresseter. Miss Neal. Doris Neal. N-I-A-L-L. What kind of coat is yours, Miss Neal? Well, it's not a coat, exactly. It's a jacket. Silver Fox jacket. Well, Mrs. Perfin? Mine's a coat. It might be only muskrat, but it's a full coat, and I paid $400 for it. Did you buy it there? I should say not. I bought it on Fifth Avenue. Coat, too. Yeah, what kind? Oh, honey, you don't seem very excited. Mine was a mink coat. I'd be over there with an axe. Well, you don't accomplish anything by getting excited. That's right. Mink Oh, and I'm screaming about a lousy silver fox jack. Besides, my husband said that if I didn't get the coat back today, I should report it to the police and then call the insurance company. Oh, the insurance company. I knew there must be a reason she wasn't excited. Well, I don't have any insurance, and I want my coat back. Well, who said I didn't want mine back? Well, you worried about you got insurance. I like my coat. Uh, all right, all right, I lady. want it back. Okay. Uh, look, I, uh, I want you to tell me how come there was such a crowd there this morning. Well, he kept stalling and stalling us. And finally, he told everybody Monday, come back Monday morning, and we could have our coat. Isn't that what he told you? That's right. Uh-huh. And he didn't open up this morning. No. We we'll go over there now. I bet you there are at least 20 women hanging around the store outside. At least 20. There were at least 10 there already when we decided to come over here. Is that right? Yes, that's right. About 10, including ourselves. Besides ourselves. Uh, Miss Tresseter, did you store your coat there last year? Well, no, I didn't. I don't think he's been open that long to store coats last year. Uh, yes, he has. I stored mine there last year. And you didn't have any trouble getting it out in the fall? No, no trouble at all. I brought in the receipt and he gave it to me. He was just as nice as you please. He was nice. He was a very nice man. Mm, get any compliments out of me, I'll say that. But what we'd like to know is what can be done about it. Well, in the first place, there's no evidence yet that he stole any of your furs. Well, I'd like to know what you call it. Well, he told you to come back on Monday. Well, today's Monday and we were back. Where was he? No place in sight. The store was locked up tight. Uh, Lieutenant, would you get the card out of the business house file? That's Final Furrier, 738 State 6. Yes, that's right. And his name is Audley, George. Uh, yes, Audley. I know. What's good that going to do? Well, I want to see if he's opened up yet. Well, you can count on it. He hasn't. When did you take your coat in to be stored, Miss President? In May. Oh, wait a minute. I've got the storage receipt right here in my bag. Right here. May the 3rd. Uh-huh. What value did you place on it? Well, we paid $4,000 for it. $4,000? Of course, that was nearly two years ago, and it will be two years Christmas. It was a Christmas gift for my husband. This Christmas, somebody should give me a husband like that. There it is, Captain. Yeah. All right, bring over to the store. He's not going to be there. Take my word for it. He can try, can't he? No, he can try. Turn around on here. Yes, sir. I don't think he'll be there. I know he won't be there. If he was coming, he'd have showed up by now. He's not coming. It's ringing. It's ringing all day. This is all well and good, but it's not going to get my coat back. Still ringing. I want some actionable get action. That's what I say. Oh, we've got to have a little patience. When the wind is blowing and I got chills, I don't worry about patience. Well, that's it, Captain. Home number listed there? Yes, sir. Try that. Where's the line up, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Did you say you have his home phone number there? Yes, that's right. Well, what is it? Well, I'm sorry I can't give you that information. Well, anybody's entitled to it now. We are, aren't we? After all, he's got a coat. Bring it up. Yeah, well, just give us a chance, and we'll try to get it straightened out. That's what I say. A well, lot you've got to worry about. Uh, hello? Is this the residence of Mr. George C. Audley? Yeah. Yeah? I see. Uh, is he there? Oh, is that so? Yeah. Well, uh, when was that? Yeah. Well, well, what is it? 
Oh, he didn't. All right, thank you. Wasn't there either? Woman said she was his landlady. Yeah. Wasn't he there? Mr. and Mrs. Audley rented a furnished room there. They moved out yesterday. Well, oh, Dad! Oh, you see? Well, where did they go? Oh, I told you to go to the new house. Now, just a second. Oh, it's awful. All right. Looks like you're right. Looks like Mr. Audley did skip. So what are we supposed to do? You know how I scraped to get that jacket? If you listen, I'll tell you what to do. Yes, sir. You go back through that door there and up the stairs to the second floor. You'll see the detective's office up there. You go right in and they'll take care of it. Will they be able to find him? They'll try. That's not the important thing. Will they be able to get our coat back? You make a complaint up there and they'll handle it. Is there any particular detective we should see or is just one as good as the other? They'll tell you who to see. We are not getting the runaround now, are we? Because my husband works for the city and he knows a few people, you know. The detectives will handle it. You just go on upstairs. Might as well. Detectives are higher than them, anyway. On the second floor? Yes, that's right. Uh, well, they, well, we got to learn. Who's passing upstairs, Sergeant? Yeah, no, no, Sergeant. Well, I hope he likes to hear women talk. At least he ought to be used to it. He's got four daughters. Oh, is that so? Hold on. Lieutenant. Yes. Cole, you ringing in. He's on post up there on 86th Street. He said there's about 15 women congregating around that car shop. He said they're boiling, every one of them. Yeah. He says he's afraid they'll break in the door. He can't handle them alone. All right, send a car around to help him get it straightened out. Yes, sir. I'll send a car to give you a hand. Uh, you ought to put someone on a fixer up there, Ren. We're awful short today, Captain. Yeah, I know. I could double up post three and five and send Kale up there. All right, try that. I would leave a school crossing open this afternoon, though. Well, things will probably quiet down by then. Yes, sir, probably. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Oh, yes, sir, hold on a second. Is the detectives ring it down, Captain? Lieutenant King wants to talk to you. All right, I'll take it here. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Captain Canelli. This place has turned into a head house, Captain. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, just get their coats back, Matt. That's all it'll take. Believe me, you're going to try. Look, can I have that home address on Audley? I want to send a man up there to check him out. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, give me that card, Ren. Listen. Matt. Yes, Captain. The home address is 63 West 79th Street. Yes, sir. And the phone over there is Academy 2 3598. 3598. Yeah, but he's supposed to be gone from there. Yes, sir. Okay, Matt. You think the detectives will get any results, Captain? Well, Red, I know they're going to try. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now, back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. A serious crime or an unusual occurrence seldom results in a shortage of personnel in a precinct command... Because in such instances, the inspector commanding the division, the borough commander, or the chief inspector will order men into the troubled area for temporary duty from other commands. The real pressure for manpower comes when a multiplicity of small everyday occurrences within the precinct requires the force to be thinly spread. Such was the case on this day when three patrolmen were in court as witness duty, one went sick, one had a prisoner in custody while he was questioned by detectives, and one was assigned to a fixed post to prevent angry women from breaking into a door and show windows of a furrier shop. Out on patrol about an hour later, I rode by the closed shop. The patrolman assigned there on a fixer had the situation under still gathered on the sidewalk. They had been told to take their complaints to the detective. I instructed the operator of my car to pull into a parking space down the block, and I walked back toward the furriers. As I approached a luggage shop several doors from the place, I saw the proprietor standing in the doorway. Oh, Captain. Captain Canelli. Oh, hello, Mr. Tarbin. Well, how do you like this? Oh, uh, it's not good. Mm -hmm. Some reputation the merchants on the block can get from one rotten apple. Well, I know it doesn't help. You know how business has been with these this morning? Terrible. I, I attribute it to this. You know, something like this can run all the customers to the department store. Yeah, well, it's too bad. I mean, he's not such a bad guy, George. He, he's a pretty nice guy, as a matter of fact. He's a good friend of mine. We, we had lunch together all the time. Now, we, we 
always tell each other our troubles. But I didn't think he was in such bad shape as this. I had no idea. Uh, well, what did he do with the ladies' coats anyway, Captain? Do you know? Not yet. Not exactly. Well, I'd better see what's going on there. Oh, Captain. Yeah. Look, uh, like I said, George is a good friend of mine. I, I know him since he opened up the shop there. You, you know, nothing social, just business acquaintances. Well, I think I know what his trouble is. What? Well, it's, it's three troubles, really. He, he likes to play the horses, he likes to drink, and he likes women. You, you think that explains it? Well, it explains a lot. He had a good business there, and there's no competition within blocks. He could have done all right, fine. Wine, women, and horses. You can chalk it up to that. Yes, most likely. Look, Captain, uh, what, what can happen to him? I mean, is he, is he really in big trouble here? Not if these customers get their coats back. Well, there's no law against closing up the store if he wants to, is there? I mean, he can do that. He can go out of business any time he wants. He can, if he didn't convert other people's property. Uh, look, Captain, um, you, you want to know where he is, don't you? Yeah? Mm-hmm. Well, if I tell you, you won't let him know, will you? I, I don't want him to think that I turned him in, that I was disloyal. But I, I think it's for his own good. He's, he's got to get straightened out. That's right, he does. Where is he? Well, he's uh, around the corner there in the barn grill, just around the corner. Can you come and point him out to me? Well, look, Captain, I, I, I told you I, I didn't want to get involved. I didn't want him to think that I had anything to do with him being turned in. Oh, just through the window. You don't have to come into the place. to tell me of his troubles. 
He continued as we got out of the car, walked up the front steps, and into the muscle room. Everything went wrong. Nothing went right. Hi there, Mr. Audley. Hello, Captain. Fred, this is Mr. George Audley. Man has been causing a revolution, huh? Well, I didn't know it was that bad. You didn't? It's been like ladies' night in a Turkish bath around here. Red, are there any complainants upstairs in the detectives? According to my last census, Captain, there were seven steaming mad females up there, all with murder in their hearts. Can imagine. Red, uh, ring upstairs to Lieutenant King. Tell him I've got Mr. Audley and I'm taking him into my office. Yes, sir. Thanks, Captain. No, oh, thank you, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I've got to protect the city property as well as you. Uh, this is Lieutenant Gorman. Let me call you, Lieutenant King. I guess I'm pretty much city property now, too, huh? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, Inside. Mr. Audley. Sit down over there, Mr. Audley. Thank you. Right here? That's fine. I, uh, I suppose I'm entitled to get a lawyer. Oh, sure. You're entitled to a lawyer. I don't know how much good it'll do me. I don't have any money for one. Oh, what a mess. What a mess I got myself in. Well, if you give these women back their fires, it won't be so bad. I'd like to, Captain, believe me, but I can't. I'd sure like to. Yes? Lieutenant King. Come in, man. Well, Captain. Hello, man. So this is Mr. George Ordley. Yeah, that's right. I'm Lieutenant King. Glad to know you. I don't know whether I can say the same thing, but I sure heard a lot about you this morning. I can imagine. Where have you got all these ladies' coats? Well, that's just it. I don't have them. Well, what did you do with them? Well, last spring, when the weather began to get warm and they didn't need their fur coats anymore, the customers started to bring them in for storage and for repairs. Yeah. Well, it so happened that at that time, last April and May, I was in desperate need of money. So instead of storing them, you sold them? No, not right away. I had every intention of giving the women back their coats. Every intention in the world. When I first started, I pawned them. I took them around to different shops, and I got loans on them. You were going to redeem the loans in time to have the coats ready for the women in the fall. Yeah, that was my intention. What did you use the money for that you got from pawning the coats? Oh, pay some debts, pay my rent, and to bet on the horses. A little bit. Why, you know it's more than a little bit. All right, I bet on them a lot. How many coats did you pawn? Oh, I don't know. It's been about 100, 125. I've got 150. Did you pawn? Yeah, that, that's all I pawned. But, you know, I I sold some outright, too. Oh, did you? Yeah. See, along about uh, the middle of May and the first of June, things got really bad. I mean, terrible. No favorites for winning. I had a favorites for winning, all right. But when they won, I wasn't on them. How many coats did you sell outright? 75, 100. What'd you sell them to? Other furries. What'd you tell them? I told them the customers left the coats with me to be sold. Or that they had traded them in on something else. The other furries and I negotiated a price and they bought them. How much money was involved altogether? Any idea? Yeah, I got an idea. Something like $20,000. How much do you have left? About 500. Five hundred out of twenty thousand. Uh, that's the way things go. Things sure went pretty bad, as far as you were concerned. It sure did. But I had no intention of taking anything from anybody. I didn't want to cheat those women, honest. I didn't want to sell their coats. It was just, it was just a situation that I found myself in. I was desperately pressed for money. You got no idea. Yeah, sure I know. I was being oh, squeezed little. from all sides. No, you haven't seen any squeezing yet, Mr. Hardly. The worst of it is just about to start. Yeah, I know. $20,000. But it was my intention to make every penny of it good, to give every woman back her coat. Well, that might have been, as long as you were pawning them. You might have had the intention to redeem them in time for this fall. When you began selling them outright, that intention went out the window. What did you expect to tell all these women when they presented their receipts and wanted the coat? I don't know. I, I expected to have the coat, that's all. I, I always expected a windfall. I expected something to happen. I don't know what. If you sold most of the coats outright, 
What were you going to tell the women in those cases? I don't know. I got no idea. I'd have told them something. I'd have stole them off, I guess. That's all. Why'd you keep the store open so long? You knew you were in a big jam in the middle of the summer, didn't you? Yeah, sure, I knew it. You moved out of your room, you and your wife. That's right. Where are you staying now? Well, uh, we don't have a place. Where's your wife? She's at a friend's house out in Kew Gardens. Where were you planning to stay tonight? Well, we, uh... Uh, We hadn't really... Knew that you were on your way to Chicago, that you were leaving today... How'd you find it out? Isn't it true? Yes, yeah, it's true. Well, if you were going to skip, why didn't you really skip? What did you come back to the shop for and sit in the bar around the corner from it? That's another story. Well, I'm sure we'd like to hear it. All right, all right, if you'd like to hear it. See, my wife was packing yesterday. Naturally, she's a little upset about this whole thing. Naturally. As much as me. So we were packing to go to Chicago. Yeah. All of a sudden, she reminded herself she didn't have a coat. Her own fur coat. Yeah. The three-quarter length mink coat. Wild Canadian. I made it for about three years ago. So she said, where is it? I said, honey, it's in the vault down at the shop. So immediately she got suspicious. She accused me of selling it or pawning it along with the rest of them. I said, honey, I wouldn't do that to your coat. I wouldn't do that at all. She didn't believe me. And it is, they're honest. It's in the vault down there. I wouldn't do a thing like that to her. It's my wife. I wouldn't sell her coat. It's the only one you didn't sell, huh? No, there's a few I didn't sell. But I didn't sell hers. I didn't pawn it. It's really in the vault down at the shop. But she didn't believe it. No. No, she was sure I sold it. So she said either I go to the shop and get the coat or she don't go to Chicago with me. And that's why you were hanging around the neighborhood in the bar. Well, of course, I couldn't go near the shop. I couldn't get anywhere with all those women around there. And I couldn't go get my wife until I had her coat. Guess I'd have been better off if I'd have sold it. It was brought $1,500, maybe $2,000. 21st Precinct, Captain Sinelli. Captain, one of the women must have saw Mr. Hornby go into your office and the words out. They're all out in the muster room now. They're trying for blood. How many? Oh, seven or eight. All right, thanks. Well, they found out you're here, Mr. Audley. There's a delegation of women right outside that door. There is, huh? Yes, there is. Well, might as well face the music. Take my word for it, Mr. Audley. It's not going to be music. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah? What's the trouble? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Santos Ortega, Mandel Kramer, Larry Haynes, Susan Strong, Elspeth Eric, and Gladys Thornton. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Artana speaking. Artana speaking. Artana speaking. Artana. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, what's the trouble? Is there any identification on a person? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what does she say when you ask her who she is? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A yeah. call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. We'll bring her into the station house. Stay there. I'll send a car around for you. Okay. Yeah. All right. 21st Precinct, transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. 
Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It had been a busy night in the precinct with plenty of work, but by the time the 12 to 8 platoon reported for duty at midnight, things had quieted down. At 2.15 a.m., I returned to the station house from patrol. Then, because there was a meeting of all precinct commanders in the borough scheduled for 9 a.m., I lay down on the couch in my office to get a few hours sleep. Meanwhile, patrol of the precinct continued with 62 men on the job assigned to sector cars or on foot. Among these was patrolman Edward Farrell assigned to post number 6, which included three blocks along Lexington Avenue in the 80s. At 2.55 a.m., he was walking his post when a slightly built man dressed in a white apron and jacket hurried from behind to catch him. Officer, policeman. Yeah, what is it? I'm Josh from the bar and grill up there, Gentleys. Yeah? Elliot, the night bartender, sent me out to see if you were in the block. What's the trouble? Well, there's no trouble exactly. It's just what you call a, a peculiar situation. What? Well, we're getting ready to close up. We got to clean up and everything, and she just sits there. Who? I don't know who she is. She don't even know herself. That's a peculiar situation. Oh. Elliot thinks she's got what you call amnesia. She has, huh? And, and she's a pretty little thing. Prettiest little thing you ever saw. That's it there. Okay. She just sits there, staring with them eyes. See? Over there, in the back booth. That's her. I see. Well, what have we got, Elliot? That's what I'd like to know. She came in here about 11 o'clock. I'd say it was closer to 10.30. Well, around then. I kind of looked at her when she came in. You know, she's not a bad-looking dish. Now she walked to that booth way back there, and there she sits yet. She hasn't moved hardly an inch. Not drunk, is she? Are you kidding? She ordered one drink when she came in, and there it still sits in front of her. She hasn't touched it. All the ice melted and everything. There it sits. <laughs> How do you like this? The one night the whole gang cleans out early before closing time and aren't hanging around here crying for one more drink. The first night that happens in two weeks and I think I'm going to get out early, this has to hit me. Did you talk to her? Yeah, I talked to her. We both talked to her. What'd she say? She don't make sense. She doesn't know her name? She don't know anything. Well, she looks like she should know something. Pretty girl. And those are nice clothes she's got on. Yeah? Uh, look. Look, I, I could put her out on the street, you know, but she might be sick. I didn't want to take the chance on doing that. I could just go over there and say, uh, oh, okay, honey, closing time, and she'd be out on the street. But if something's wrong with her, I just don't want that to be on my conscience. All right, let me talk to him. Now, get busy, Josh. Start sweeping up. Let's get out of here early. That's okay with me. You two stay here. I never complain about getting out early. Hi there. Hello. Hello. I understand you're not feeling so well. I feel all right, officer. Oh, that's good. What's your name? We'll see if we can get you home. I don't know. Oh, now, come on. Everybody knows their own name. Well, I don't know mine, if I have one. All right. Uh, where do you live? I don't know that either. Don't you have any idea? No. Well, what do you know? Well, it seems I know a lot of things until I start to think about them, then I don't know much. Well, do you know who's president of the United States? Oh, yes, sure. Don't be silly. Well, who is? But General Eisenhower. Good, good. Who's Bing Crosby? You, you know who he is? Of course. Who is he? He's a singer. Uh huh. What about Willie Mays? Willie Mays? Yeah. Well, I never heard of him. He's a ball player, New York Giants. Oh, I don't know anything about baseball. Well, if you don't know what your name is and where you live, how do you know you don't know anything about baseball? I guess because I never heard of Willie Mays. Yeah. <laughs> That's logical. I think it is. Let's see if we can find out who you are. Do you have a pocketbook? No, what? A pocketbook. A purse. Uh, no, I don't have any. You sure? Well, it would be here, wouldn't it? Well, uh, what have you got in the pockets of your coat? Oh, not much. Oh, well, let's see. Put everything on the table. 
Right there? Mm-hmm. Put it out there. Oh, all right. The handkerchief and a little money. Mm-hmm. About six bucks and some change. Mm, yes, about. Now the uh, other pocket. All right. That's all just a compact and a lipstick. Is there a name on the outside of that compact? No. I, I looked at it before. You want to see? No, I can see. Open it up. Let's see what's inside. Well, it's just powder in a powder puff. Open it up anyway. All right. See? Just what I told you. Excuse me. Sweep and by. Sweep and by. All right, Josh. Take it easy. I can't. I sweep with gusto. Oh, he's really funny. He was making jokes before, trying to get me to laugh. <laughs> well, sometimes it helps. I wanted to laugh, but I didn't see any reason to. Mr. Farrell. Yeah? Can you come over here a minute? All right. You just sit there. I'll be my back. I wasn't planning on going anyplace. I've got no place to go. Yeah, Elliot? What is it? Uh, your sergeant's car is outside. Oh, yeah. Uh, he must be looking for you. Sergeant! Sergeant, I'm in here. All right. Was he looking for you? Yeah, I think so. Hey, what's with her, anyway? Beats me. Seems to be a... Pretty intelligent girl. Excuse me there, excuse me. Please. Listen, do you always have to sweep where somebody is? It's not that. It's just somebody's always where I'm sweeping. What are you doing in a case like this? First thing is to find out who she is. She doesn't look like she was in any accident or anything. Clothes are all clean. She's just as pretty as a picture. Just like she stepped off a bandwagon. Yeah? Listen, you don't think she's giving us the rib, do you? Could be. I read someplace that 90% of the amnesia cases are fakes. It's something like that. Farrell. Yes, Sergeant, here. Well, what have you got? You know Elliot here, Sergeant Waters. Oh, hi, Sergeant. Oh. Some deal we've got. <laughs> got a woman back there, Sergeant. Says she doesn't know her name or where she lives. You think she's on the level? Got me. Do you know her, Elliot? No, I've never seen her before. She's never been in here. I wish she didn't come in tonight. All right. Let's talk to her, Farrell. That's what I've been trying to do, Sergeant. Hi. Hello. Sergeant Waters, this is Miss... You know, if I work for a living, I must not work in a factory. Or I must not be a typist. Look at those long nails. They're really very nice, aren't they? Yes, they are. I'm kind of worried about not knowing who I am. Especially because I know so many other things. Of course, I didn't know about Willie Mays, did I? No. Ask me some more. Let's see what else I know. You know how old you are? Well, I know about how old I am. All right. About how old I am. When I was in the ladies' room before I looked in the mirror, I would say that I'm between 20 and 25. What's your birthday? Uh, I don't know. What made you come in here? Well, I was walking around, and I got very tired, and I wanted to sit down someplace, so I just came in and sat down. You didn't drink any of your drink? I really didn't want it, but I thought I ought to order something. Don't you drink? Oh, I don't really know. Maybe I do and maybe I don't. The reason I didn't drink any of it is because if I don't drink, I didn't want to start now. Mm, would you like a cigarette? Uh, no, no, thanks. I don't know whether I smoke either. This is really very nice of you to bother like this. It, it's considerate when people go out of their way to help someone else. It's all part of the job, lady. Oh, yes, I guess it is. How do I find out who I am? There are ways. Well, how, for instance? Well, we can take your fingerprints. We can have them checked out here and in Washington. Oh, that won't do any good. I was never fingerprinted before. You have to have been fingerprinted before you can find out who someone is that way, don't you? If you don't remember anything, how do you know you've never been fingerprinted before? Well, I, I really don't know for sure. Well, how could you even guess that you weren't? Because my memory might be gone, but my intuition isn't. My intuition tells me I've never been fingerprinted before. And your intuition is probably right. Probably. But most likely, someone will have reported a young woman about your age, height, weight, and coloring missing. We'll have that description on file. If it matches, we'll just get hold of that person and have them come down to meet you. Who would that person be, for instance? Oh, mother, father, husband. Do you think I'm married? I wonder if I am. Well, you don't have on a wedding ring. No, I don't, do I? 
But that's not necessarily a sure sign. There are lots of women who are married that don't wear wedding rings. I wonder if I am married. I know what kind of man I'd like to be married to. Uh, listen. Yeah? Uh, does this happen very often? I mean, people losing their memory like I did? Oh, yeah. There's hundreds of cases like that every year in the city of New York. New York? Yeah, that's right. Am I in New York? You sure are. Oh, you're kidding me. Are you from someplace other than New York? Well, I know I'm not from New York. If I lived in New York, I'd know it. That, that's one thing someone would know, to live in a city like New York. Don't you think? I mean, even if they didn't know their own name or where they lived. I mean, not the word address. They'd know they were from New York City. All right, sure. You're not from New York City. That's seven. On the other hand, I might be. If I don't know who I am or where I live, I might very well be from New York, although I don't think I am. Isn't that reasonable? Miss... I'm beginning not to know what's reasonable and what isn't. Excuse me, sweeping through there, please. Hey, Josh, get away from there. All right, all right. Sweeping through. Excuse me, please. Well, uh, have you decided what you're going to do with me? I mean, what happens to me where I go? Well, right now, you're going to the station house. And from there? That depends on how fast you remember who you are. You are listening to 21st Precinct a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. You made a little remark to a friend one day, and it got passed around. By the time it reached the authorities, it had been twisted and changed, so that it wasn't your statement anymore. But that didn't make any difference. You were hauled into the prison, forced to sign a confession that you couldn't even read, and found guilty of uttering poisonous and dangerous remarks. The verdict? Guilty. The sentence? Ten years at hard labor. But what about the right of free speech, you say? Yes, that's exactly why such a thing could not happen to you. But it is happening in some countries today. The difference between these countries and yours is that you are guaranteed the right to free speech. Now get that word guaranteed. You're not allowed, not permitted, but guaranteed the right to say what you want, where you want, any time you want. It's in the first article of your Bill of Rights. It says... Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. The lecture halls and the auditoriums, the soapbox in the park, the conversations among friends, well, they're all examples of free speech. They had their birth in the town meetings of our ancestors. They'll still be there for our children and for future generations. No one can take it away from us or from them. No one can make a law against free speech. It's guaranteed to us permanently. It's one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. The established function of the Detective Division, Police Department, City of New York, is the investigation of crime. Only one other specific duty is assigned the detectives. That is, the location of missing persons and establishing the identity of unidentified persons. The specialists in this field are detectives in the Missing Persons Bureau one of the several central office bureaus and squads. But each case is still the responsibility of detectives in the precinct in which it originates. The young woman, an apparent amnesia victim, was brought to the station house in the custody of patrolman Farrell. There, at the direction of the desk officer, she was taken to the 21st detective squad on the second floor. In the meantime, I had awakened and walked out into the muster room where Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty and Lieutenant Harry Snyder was desk officer. You didn't sleep long, Captain. Oh, I did well enough. What's doing? It's been pretty quiet, Captain. That's good. I think I'll go out on patrol, oh, Lieutenant. You got a car handy? Yeah, sure, Captain. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Have number three come by to take the captain on patrol. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you say, Lieutenant? Oh, hi. Uh, Joe Board, Sanitation Department Driver, District 8. Uh, what's the trouble, Joe? Uh, no trouble, Lieutenant. Uh, hello, hey, Captain. Hi. Uh, I, uh, I found this in the trash basket at, uh, 76 in Lexington. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was just laying there. I, uh, I figured a thief grabbed the purse off some lady, took the money out, and threw it away in the Department of Sanitation trash basket. Isn't that right, Captain? Well, that looks like about the story, huh? Uh, what was it, just laying on top? Uh, right in the basket. You, you know, like, uh, somebody threw it in as they was, uh, walking past. Yeah. Everything in here but money. Yeah. There's a wallet and a cigarette lighter. Surprised he didn't keep the lighter. Well, usually all thieves want is cash. And all kinds of identification in there. A woman lives in Maryland. There's a car registration, operator's license, and all that. 
Okay, Joe, we'll check it out. Uh, good. Uh, you know my name, Joe Board, Department of Sanitation, District 8? Yeah, Joe, I'll put it on the report. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Well, don't mention it, Captain, any time. Well, I'll uh, get back to hustling ash can. See you. Okay. A nice-looking pocketbook, Captain. Yeah. And a nice wallet. But she lost quite a few bucks. Yes, sir, quite a few bucks. You know what this uh, leather in the wallet is? Ostrich. Genuine ostrich. No? That's the most expensive stuff to make wallets out of. Uh, Captain, car's in on the way for you. Okay. What's the name in there? Maryland Operator's License. Evelyn B-U-R-G-E-S, age 24, Sage Hill Road, Hobart, Maryland. Yeah. Blonde hair, blue eyes, 5 feet 2 inches, 108 pounds. Well, I wouldn't care if she walked in here right now, Captain. It's been a dull night. Uh, the same on the registration? Yes, sir. Evelyn Burgess, Hobart, Maryland. Oh. Probably visiting New York, and somebody grabbed her purse. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. That's what it looks like. Hello, Harry. What's doing? Awful quiet, Matt. Captain. Hello, oh, Matt. What are you doing in at this time of morning? Oh, they rang me up at home. The 15th squad collared a boy who's probably good for half those apartment house burglaries we've been having. Went down to talk to him, see if he could clear a few. How'd you do? He, uh, don't know nothing. <laughs> but we went to his flat, and he's up to his ears there in radios, clothes, typewriters, everything. Beside a fistful of pawn tickets. We'll check our 61s against the stuff he's got, and I'll bet he's right for at least half those deals in this precinct. Good. Who's catching upstairs, Harry? Why Goldman, Matt. Has he been long. busy? No, nothing much, except Farrell came in with an amnesia victim a little while ago. Oh, one of those. Well, oh, uh, Captain. Yes, Matt? I've got those pictures of that bungalow out on the beach I'm considering. They came yesterday. Oh, have you? Got them up on my desk. Want to take a look at them? Yeah, I don't think I'd like to, Matt. Uh, ring me when the car comes, Sergeant. I'll be up in the detective squad. Yes, sir. It's a sweet little place, Captain. Well, according to your description, it sounds it. Half a block from the beach. Price is right. <laughs> what else do I want? Well, you'll never spend any time there, Matt. Well, I'll spend some time there. Well, you sleep here more than you do at home now. Well, it'd be good for my wife and the kids. It'd be fine for them. Now, look, we want to help you. That's all we're trying to do. I know it. Hello, Goldman. Oh, uh, Lieutenant. Hello, Captain. Hi, Captain. Hi. What have you got? Farrell brought her in, Lieutenant. She was sitting in a bar and grill over on Lexington Avenue at closing time. She doesn't know who she is or where she lives or much of anything. Were you hurt, young lady? Uh, no, not that I know of. Are you getting a policewoman up here? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the desk officer phoned down to the 19th Precinct for one. What do you need a policewoman for? Well, there might be some labels in your clothes that'll help us. I've got the pictures in my desk, Captain. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Well, I, I mean, supposing you can't find any labels in my clothes and supposing you can't find out who I am, what happens to me? You know, I, I can't sit around the police station all my life just because I don't know who I am. Well, uh, if we don't get some results very fast, we'll let the doctors try to see if they can help you remember. What doctors? Where? At Bellevue. You mean psychiatrists? Yes. They can find out what it's all about in a hurry. Oh. Okay, man. You see? I've got this porch all the way across the front. Oh, uh... Just a second, Matt. I, I want to talk to her. I, I really don't see any reason for a psychiatrist. Well, maybe he can help you. Excuse me, miss. Yes. Were you all alone when the officer came and talked to you? Yes, that's right, all alone. Mm -hmm. Where was this? In some bar. On Lexington Avenue? Well, I don't know exactly on what avenue. It was Lexington Avenue, Captain. What was your idea of going into a bar, Miss Burgess? Well, I went in there because... Because I wanted to uh, sit down. I, I was tired. Your name is Evelyn Burgess, isn't it? I, I don't know. I don't know what my name is. You live on Sage Hill Road in Hobart, Maryland. Isn't that right? You wrapping one up for us, Captain? I think so, Matt. That's right, isn't it, Miss Burgess? That's where you live, isn't it? I don't know. You have blonde hair, blue eyes. You're about five feet, two inches, and you weigh about 108 pounds. Well, uh, wh what does that mean? Ordinarily, it wouldn't mean a thing. Now, look. We've got a woman's purse downstairs that was thrown away in a Department of Sanitation trash basket. There's a motor vehicle operator's license in there in the name of Evelyn Burgess. 
The description on there fits you. That doesn't mean anything either. I know. That doesn't mean much in itself. But the purse is made out of leather that exactly matches your belt and your shoes. Now, you don't want to carry this on any further, do you, Miss Burgess? It's Mrs. Burgess. This whole amnesia thing is just a fake. Isn't that right? Yes, that's right. One great big fake. When you first well, caught, what's the reason for it? Well... Uh, uh, excuse me, Captain. Sergeant Waters is ringing up here. He said the car's come by the house for you. Oh, well. Tell him I won't be going out on patrol now. Yes, sir. I Captain had a good reason. Won't be going out on patrol now. A very good reason. Yeah. It better be good. You've wasted a lot of time for a lot of people. This officer is supposed to be out catching robbers. Don't mind helping people that really need help. We're glad to do it. You put on a fake act like this, how do you think we feel? Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Carl. Can I get Miss Desk? I've got to type them 61s. Oh, yeah, sure. All right, Miss Burgess, let's move over here. Come on to my office. Come on, Farrell. Yes, sir? I, I really didn't mean to do anybody any harm or, or cause any trouble. But you sure did. Well, I, I, I said I was sorry. Now you want to sit down right there? Farrell, come here. Yes, sir? I don't think there'll be any arrest in this case. You better get back on the job. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain. Where did that policeman go, that Mr. Farrell? He's very nice. He went back to work. You wasted enough of his time, didn't you? Yes, I guess I did. All right. What was the idea? Whose benefit was this for? Not ours. No, not yours. Whose then? Well, mine, I guess. All right. Let's have it. Well, you see, I'm married to this boy. He, he's very nice. He, he lives down there in Hobart. Hobart, Maryland? Yes. His father's a lawyer, his grandfather's a lawyer, and he's a lawyer. They're the only lawyers in Hobart. And, and really, things get kind of dull. Oh, not my husband. I mean, Hobart. Nothing happens. Didn't you know that before you got married? Well, you see, I, I came from Baltimore. I, I met him there. That's where he went to school. I see. And we got married and we moved to Hobart. Well, it just got to be so bad that I had to come to Baltimore every once in a while to see my friends and my sisters, you know. It just got so bad I couldn't stand it. I, I had to get away from Hobart. Just a little relief from those same people and those same faces and the same smile in the grocery store and same everything. So today was one of the days I drove to Baltimore. Yeah. And while I was driving, I got to thinking, I never want to go back to Hobart again. I left my car in the garage in Baltimore, and I got on a train, and I came to New York. I thought coming to New York would be best. Best for what? Well, best to get away from everything. I wasn't going back. I was never going back. I, I was going to get a job here. I was going to settle down. I was going to make a career for myself, and finally when I got good and established, I was going to write and tell them I wanted a divorce, and that would be it. I thought I could get into television or something like that. You sure got off to a fine start. You end up in a police station not 24 hours after you arrive. Well, that was really on purpose. Oh, was it? But I got to thinking maybe it wasn't a real brilliant idea. I'm inclined to agree with you. But anyway, I was determined to go through with it. I walked around, and then all of a sudden it was dinner time, and I knew that I had to eat alone. I had no one to keep me company and no one to eat with, and I got to thinking, well, maybe it really was a mistake, really a mistake. You certainly realized it a little late. I know I did. And I had to do something about it. How could I explain to him that I was in New York and how I got here and why I came and why I wasn't in Baltimore where I said I would be and everything like that? So you invented the amnesia story. Well, I couldn't think of anything else. Well, you could have thought of something more original. Well, I, I know it's not exactly something new, but he would have believed it. We had a little auto accident two or three weeks ago. I, I wasn't hurt, but I did get a bump in the head. Oh, did you? Yes, I did. And well, it really wasn't anything. The doctor examined me, and he said I was all right. But I thought maybe my husband would take that into consideration and believe the story on account of it. And he'd come up to New York and get you. Yes, that was the idea. I, I really want him. I want to go back. 
I don't care about him living in Hobart. All I wanted was him. Honestly. <laughs> that's the truth. You can say anything you want to say, but that's the truth. I, I want to go back to him. But what do we do about your wasting all our time here and making a false report to an officer? I didn't make any false report. Is there a law against telling someone I don't remember anything? There's no law against that. All I said was I didn't remember. Well, I guess she's got us there, ma'am. I guess she has. All right. I suppose we'll have to get in touch with your husband. Uh, what are you going to tell him? That you're here in the police station. Oh? Is there uh, anything else you want to tell him? I, I wish you'd tell him that I really didn't remember my name and that I didn't know where I was or how I got here. Oh, you'll have to tell him that yourself. Can I do that? You can tell him anything you want. Well, I hope it works. I just hope it works. Oh, I don't think you have anything to worry about. You'll manage. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Hit a what? A fire hydrant? Was anyone hurt? How bad? Where is this? Madison and what? Where's the driver of the car? Well, is water escaping? Is it knocked off completely? All right. I'll send the officers right over. Yeah. Okay. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Gene Gillespie, Bill Quinn, Lawson Zerby, Frank Campanella, and Bill Lipton. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ive. Art Hanna speaking. 21st Precinct has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, where's this? Yeah. Yeah. They're beating up a man? Well, who is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, which corner is it? 
You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. Yeah, right away. Okay. Twenty first precinct transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the one hundred seventy three thousand people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the twenty first. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the twenty first precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It had been a busy night in the precinct. Before I turned out the platoon at midnight, there was a three-alarm fire in a tenement on 78th Street, a pedestrian killed by an automobile on Park Avenue, an armed robbery of a delicatessen on 2nd Avenue, and the mugging by two youths of a hospital orderly as he walked from his work to the 77th Street station of the Lexington Avenue subway. Things quieted down after the late tour took over, however, and I was able to stay in the station house and clean up the paperwork, reading and signing reports and communications that normally I would have finished hours earlier. While I was so engaged, patrol of the precinct continued, and among those on the job were Patrolman Paul Vaccaro as operator and William Coley as recorder in sector car number three. At 1.10 a.m., they were driving in a downtown direction on 2nd Avenue in the 70s. Call the fifth Go. Well, I don't know about that. My wife and I looked at some of them out in Jamaica last week. The price hasn't gone up any. Hasn't gone up any since when? Since last Christmas. Are you kidding? No, I'm telling you. What'd you look at, the large ones? No, we couldn't get a large one in the house. A medium-sized one. Where's this place you look? Out in Jamaica there on the lot. I don't know. I can't find any bargains. Well, the fellow told me there wasn't any shortage or anything like that. There's plenty of them around. Oh. Yeah, I see them. They're beating up a guy. Pull in. Well, let's go. Come on. Hold up there. Hold up. There they go. Oh, I'll see you later. There goes one in that doorway. I got him. Get the other guy. Hold up, you. Hold up. All right. You. Come out here. Come on out. Come on. Get out of my way. Come here, you. And let me go. Hold still. Let go. Get against there. Uh, let me loose. Go on. Get against there now. All right. All right. Now settle down. All right, okay. Pull your feet way out. What do you mean? You know what I mean. Pull your feet way out and lean against the wall. Well, I guess you mean... Feet out further. Come on. How far? Come on. Hey. That's it, like that. Hey, look, I want to tell you something. You get plenty of time to tell me anything. Now, just hold still. I got nothing on me. I'm carrying nothing. I'll find out about that for myself. All right, now, stay there. It was his idea. It was all his idea. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You had to beat up an old man because it was his idea, huh? It was his idea. All right. Put your hands behind your back. I'm leaning with my hands. What do I hold on to? Lean on your head. Get those hands behind your back. Wait a minute. All right, now, straighten up. Hey, look, you got those things on awful tight. They're awful tight. They're going to stay on tight, too. Now, tell me something. How old are you, huh? Seventeen. Seventeen. That's all, just seventeen. Well, in seventeen years, you ought to have gotten some sense into your head. Now, oh, come on. All right. Let's see if you kill that old man. I didn't mean to kill him. I didn't want to hurt him. It was his idea. We just wanted to get some money. It was Ernie's idea. Doesn't make any difference whose idea it was. I didn't mean to hurt him. I didn't want to hurt him. Yeah, sure. You didn't mean to hurt that other guy tonight either, did you? What other guy? The one you mugged down 77th Street there near the subway station. How do you know it was us that did it? Go on. Well, how'd you know? A little birdie told me. Hey, listen, you don't think he's dead, do you? I mean, I, I know he's old, but I didn't hit him so hard. And he kicked him. Ernie kicked him. I didn't. He doesn't look good, does he? All we wanted was a little money, that's all. Hey, listen, you got this on awful tight. That's too bad. Mister? Hey, mister. Uh, I'm all right. 
I think I'm all right. All right, just just don't try to move. It's all right. I'm okay. I'm really okay. Look, you just stay here. We'll get an ambulance for you. No, I, I want to go home. I just want to go home. Well, we better see if you're hurt first anyway. Hey, I'm sorry, mister. I'm awful sorry. I'm sorry, too. For you. I'm very sorry for you. All right, you, you just sit here, mister. Don't try to move now. I'll send for the ambulance. All right. Come on, I think you. so. Pull on me, that hurts. Just walk to the car. What's your name, huh? Carl. Carl what? Carl Board. Yeah. 17 years old, huh? Yeah, 17, that's all. You think the other cop will get him? Ernie, I mean? Yeah, he'll get him. Climb in there. Sit on the seat. I didn't want to kick him. It was Ernie's idea to kick him. He said, kick him good, hit him hard. That'd make him lose his memory. For our faces, he might. All right. 681 to Central, K. Car 681 at 2nd Avenue and 74th Street. We had a mug in here. We got one suspect. The victim is injured. Send an ambulance. K. Hey, that's pretty good how that works. You talk to them, they talk to you. Yeah, that's the idea. Hey, that's pretty good. That's like a telephone to house, huh? Come on, Carl. Get out of there. All right, let's go. Over here to the man. Come on, let's go. He ain't going to die, is he? He couldn't die if he's talking like that. He's talking like he's all right. What are you, what are you worried about him dying for, huh? I wouldn't, except you caught me. It was only said kick him. I didn't say kick him. I was against it. How you feeling now, mister? I don't know. Better. Not so good. I don't know. I can't tell. I just hurt. Hurts inside here. That's where Ernie kicked him. You kicked, too. You kicked me, too. Uh, j- just a little bit, not as much as I You kicked me enough. I want to thank you, officer. You saved my life. They were going to kill me. They said they were going to kill me. We weren't going to kill you. We just wanted the money, that's all. Just the money. You wanted the money? You should have asked. I'd have given it to you. I'd have given you all I had, a dollar twenty cents. You just asked me for the money, I'd have given you the dollar twenty cents. You all right? I don't know. I think so. Well, the ambulance is on the way. Hey, you think he got Ernie? Wouldn't be fair if he didn't get Ernie. Get me and not get Ernie. Look, don't worry about Ernie. We'll get him. Well, you bet it's not fair. He did the most. It was his idea. Uh, What's your name, uh, mister? Sokin. Philip Now, look, Carl, don't move around so much. Well, things tight you got all Well, right. the more you move, the tighter they get. Now, just take it easy. Where do you live, Mr. Sokins? Around the corner. 387. My wife, my wife is there waiting. She won't know what happened Look, to we'll, me. Look, we'll send somebody around to see her. Oh, I, I think I ought to see her myself. I should get scared. She's sick. She's not a well woman. Well, let, let's see how you are first. Then we'll wait until the ambulance gets here. All right. You think you ought to wait always? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> is that the ambulance? Is that it? No, I think it's another police car. Hey, where's that cop with Ernie? You ought to get Ernie. It's not fair me being caught in him now. We'll get him. Well, you're going to get him. Where is he? I don't see him. More policemen, eh? Is that who it is? Yeah, that's who it is, Mr. Sokin. Now, look, just lie back there now and take it easy. Huh? What do you got, McCarroll? A mugging, Sergeant. Yeah, this boy here and another one jumped this man. They were killing me. A cop saw it just in time. Why not killing you? You keep quiet. Coley took off after the other boy while I grabbed this one here. Which way did he go? Well, I saw him turn a corner down there. Uh, hi. Yes, Sergeant? Go around the corner there. Coley was chasing a boy that way. Take a look for them. Yes, sir. How are you feeling, mister? You hurt very bad? I don't know. Not too bad, I guess. Hey, listen, couldn't you loosen this thing up a little bit? I mean, it's awful tight. You know, I'm not going to run away. I'm not going no place. I just want to make sure of that, Carl. I give my word of honor. Uh, I wouldn't try to sit up there. I I think I'm all right. Well, we better wait and see what the ambulance doctor has to say. Just stay like that, huh? Okay, if you say so. Listen, I'm not going to no station house without Ernie. This was his whole idea. I don't want to go in there alone. We agree with you. You'll both go together. Well, don't look that way. Don't look like you're going to catch him. We'll catch him, all right. Uh, is that the ambulance, you think? Is that it? No, Dad. Sounds like another police car. You call the ambulance, didn't you? I call the ambulance, yeah. Oh, where is it? Oh, it has to come all the way from the hospital. Oh, 
Oh, I see. What do you need all the cops for? Not to handle me. Hey, don't pull that thing, will you? You just sit still. It's Meister and Farrell, Sergeant. Don't get out here. Tony's chasing another boy around the corner on foot. Go take a look for him. Okay, Sergeant. Listen, my side's beginning to hurt a little bit more. Well, you just stay still and I'll see what the doctor has to say. Oh, it, it's beginning to hurt pretty bad. You, you don't think there's anything broken in there, do you? That's, that's right where he kicked me. I didn't kick you, not there. I didn't kick you in the side. Yes, you did. I never kicked anybody in the side in my life. I don't kick in the side. He told me he and the other fellow jumped at the hospital early near the subway entrance, Sergeant. They were the ones, all right. Oh, they did, huh? All we want to do is get a little money off them. Just get a little money off them, that's all. Did you ever hear of working for your money? I heard of it, yeah. Hey, we should have heard something from Coley by now, Sarge. Maybe he chased him up into the building. Does your friend live around here? Who's that, Ernie? Yeah, Ernie. He's no friend of mine. Does he live around here? No, he don't live around here. He lives uptown. We both live uptown. Is there any place around the corner he might go? Any building he might duck into? No, not, not that I know of. How should I know where he might duck into? Does he have any friends around here? No, I don't think so. Not around here. What's the matter? Is somebody hurt? Did somebody get hurt? It's all right, lady. Everything's under control. Just move on, huh? Well, what's the matter? Nothing's the matter. Just go ahead. Move on. Oh, you think I asked for the world. All I wanted was a little information. Where were you going, Dad? Were you on your way home? Yes, yes, that's right. I was on my way home. Where'd you been? I, I was over to my brother's house for, for a pinochle game. What happened? I, I was just walking by. Somebody said, hey, wait a minute. It was them two. They came up and one of them grabbed me. The other one started hitting me. No, I grabbed him and I only hit him. They started cursing me. They wanted money. Who cursed you? Not me. Well, you knocked me down. You hit me. You kicked me. You got tough. You shouldn't have got tough. All right, all right, okay. Well, he got tough. Hold it. Uh, those things are too tight. Loosen them up a little well, bit, will you? Well, don't pull them in. They won't be so tight. I'm going to have to keep them so tight. I'm going to run away. Yeah, yeah. I know all about it. Sergeant. Yeah? All right. Keep your eye on him. Where's the ambulance? It'll be here. I'll be right back. It should have been here already. Yeah, hi. Did you see Coley? No, sir. He wasn't any place in the block there. Meister and Farrell came around. They're looking for him. I thought I'd better come back and tell you. No sign of him, huh? Well, we couldn't see him. It was a hack driver who had his car parked in the block there. He was waiting for a fare who was up in the building. He'd been there about ten minutes, he says, and he saw no sign of a police officer coming around the corner chasing a boy. Was he looking? Well, he was just sitting there in the cab, parked facing this way, just sitting there waiting. Said if a cop came around the corner chasing somebody, he'd have seen him. Just the cab driver in the block? Well, there was a man walking there, too. He uh, lived in one of the buildings. A young man or an old man? Fell about 40. He couldn't have been the other boy. He, uh, he said he was standing on the steps saying goodnight to someone he knew. He didn't see anybody come in the block, either. Vaccaro? Yes, sir? You said you saw Coley turn the corner after that boy into the block? Yes, sir, I saw him. Vaccaro saw him turn the corner. Oh, yes, sir, but where'd he go after that? That's what we'll have to find out. That boy he was chasing could have been armed. He might have turned on him. Might have. Yeah. Let's hope he didn't. You're listening to 21st Precinct, the factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. You hear your confession repeated over and over again, drummed into your head. They make you memorize it, sign it, and by torture and drugs, they finally get you so you yourself believe it. Then, finally, they put you on the witness stand, and you hear a voice admitting the guilt. You don't even care anymore. You hardly realize that it's your own voice, repeating the words they want you to say. Yes, that has happened in some countries. But there's a very good reason why it couldn't happen to you. Fifteen words in our Bill of Rights are your protection. They say very clearly... No person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. When we read about the rigged trials, the phony witnesses, the drugged confessions that take place in certain countries today, we're pretty glad that our Constitution was written by men of foresight. Well, maybe they couldn't look ahead to our day, but they were determined to protect us against such things happening in this country. For ourselves, for generations to come, this right exists, assuring us of fair trials, due process of law, and no one can compel us to be a witness against ourselves. 
It's right there in black and white, in words that have been unaltered for 165 years. It is one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. In another few minutes, two detectives who were on patrol arrived on the scene. With Sergeant Waters and the patrolman already there, they began an intensive search of the neighborhood for patrolman Coley and the suspect he was chasing. Sergeant Waters rang in from a call box and apprised Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer of the situation, and requested that more help be sent. Lieutenant Gorman immediately informed me, and I instructed him to have a car come by the station house to take me to the scene. In the meantime, an ambulance had arrived from Metropolitan Hospital, and the mugging victim was taken there for treatment. When the car in which I was riding approached the scene, there were several uniformed officers and detectives gathered around Lieutenant King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad. Despite the lateness of the hour, a dozen or so curious civilians were also on the sidewalk. Okay, get on the job. Give him a hand here. And you two go on down to the other end of the block. Yes, sir. Hello, Captain. Sergeant, any word from Coley yet? No, sir. Looks like he might have chased the boy into one of those buildings on the block, Captain. We've got men out looking. We're getting ready for a building-by-building -building search. Good. We're going to start through the mall from the basement to the roof. Good. Where's the other boy? Akira's got him in the car, Captain. I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. This way. Oh, and Matt, uh, when you're set, I want to go with you. Yes, sir. Okay, Sergeant. You three will go into the first building on the other side. They're the same ones that mugged the hospital orderly, Captain. Yes, I know. Hello, Vicaro. Captain. Good work. Thank you. Only I wish we could locate Coley. We will. What's his name? Tell the captain your name. Carl. Carl Board. And you got yourself into some trouble, didn't you, Carl? Yeah, I guess so. What's your friend's name? Ernie. Ernie what? Ernie Van Teller. You know any place in the neighborhood that he might have gone? Listen, if I knew, I'd tell you. You think I want this all by myself? I don't want this all by myself. Where does Ernie live? Up near me there. Where's that? Up 113th Street. How old is he? You got a pretty complete description, Captain. Oh. Yeah, I gave it to him. I told him what he looks like. I don't want to take this all by myself. You catch him. I hope you catch him. He's 18 years old, 150 pounds, 5 feet 9 inches. He's got on a khaki field jacket, blue slacks, no hat or cap. Is he armed? Armed? No, he's got nothing. Except maybe a knife. I don't know. A switchblade knife? Yeah, I guess so. But don't you know? Yeah, a switchblade. And he'll use it, too, won't he? Well, I don't guess he carries it for decoration. I don't guess he does. We're all set, Captain. Oh, okay. Go on, you men get moving. Stay with your prisoner, Carroll. Yes, sir. You go on All ahead. right. Get the men on the job, Sergeant. Yes, sir. All right, keep moving up there. Get on your phone. Right, what do you think happened to him, Matt? Oh, in 20 minutes, he should have come back to the car or sent someone back, Captain. Or he should have rung into the station house. Yes, sir. You know, the boy had a switchblade knife. Yeah, I know. There were two or three witnesses. Nobody saw them run through the block. My guess is that he chased the boy into one of those buildings, either up to the roof or down into the basement. And the boy might have jumped him with a knife. It's mm, a good possibility, Captain. And if he did, maybe the boy went home. Yes, sir. I sent two men up to where he lives to plant the place. Good. All right, get going. Start into those buildings. Start into those buildings. Okay, Sergeant. There's three abandoned tenements that are going to be wrecked, Captain. We're going to try them first. Oh, that's a good idea. Then we'll try the occupied buildings. We'll search them all, top to bottom. If Coley went up into a dark hallway, that boy could have been waiting on a landing. One swipe with that knife would be all it'd take. Yes, sir. Captain. Captain Kennelly. Yeah, who is it? A Hearn. Over here, Captain, on the stoop. All right. Come on, lad. Here I am, Captain. Okay. Yes, sir, Hearn. Captain, this is Mrs. Protea. Captain Kennelly and Lieutenant King. How do you do? Mrs. Protea. She lives on the uh, top floor of this building. Top floor, fourth floor, fourth floor rear. Yes? She says she heard somebody on the roof a little while ago. First in the hall and then on the roof, running up the steps and then running up onto the roof. I heard them. Were they men? Yes, men, making lots of noise. How many? I don't know. It sounded like a lot. I was scared. I didn't move from the bed. I didn't know who it was. Robbers, I thought. And do you think one of them could have been a police officer? I didn't see. I only heard. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Get them to go straight to the roofs there and cut over this way. We think they went to the roofs. Yes, sir. How long ago was this, Miss Protea? 
I don't know, 10 minutes ago, 15, I don't know. Somebody was running up the stairs yelling. They went on the roof, then they ran around on the roof. I heard them, they were right over my head. Well, why didn't you call someone sooner? Well, I've got no phone. I had to get dressed to come downstairs. Mm, you waited a long time. Oh, yes, Sergeant. I was scared. Come on, get out of the over here. Well, I, I want him to stay with us, Sergeant. We're going up to the roof this way. I stayed in the bed until the noises stopped and I got dressed. All right. You stay down here on the street, Mrs. Portillo. Sure, yes. Did you close the door to your apartment? I closed it. Locked it, yes. All right. <laughs> Let's go. Come on, Arn. Yes, sir. Watch it now. Yes, sir. He's liable to have come back down the steps. He might be on any landing. Okay, Captain. Keep your light handy, Arn. Yes, sir. Okay. These buildings are all the same height, Captain. Could have jumped from one roof to another. Yeah. Think we uh, ought to try the doors, Captain? No, not yet. Let's not wake up any more people than we have to. Okay, go on. Come on. It's on the top floor. Go on. Watch yourself, get sick. In the front, I think. Easy, easy. Take that side of the door, Ahern. Yes, sir. Who is it out there? Police officers. Did you just slam this door? Yes, I wanted to see what the excitement was. What is the trouble? I see all the policemen in the street. There's no trouble. Better bolt your door and stay inside, lady. All right. Okay. Let's go to the roof. Yes, sir. I don't think that boy's around here anymore, Captain. Wherever he's going, he's on the way. Yeah. But where's Coley? Let's go. Go ahead. Post yourself right here, Ahern. Yes, sir. Right at the door. Keep it open. Yes, sir. Captain! Yes? There's a spiked iron fence between this roof and that one. He couldn't have gotten over this way. All right. Send your men downstairs and into the buildings toward the other end of the block. Yes, sir. All right, you men. Let's look that way, Captain. Okay. Watch it. Don't trip over that aerial wire. Yeah, I see. Toward the back, huh, man? Okay. No. Not on this building. How about the one that way? I don't think the woman was hearing things, do you, Captain? I don't know. Now watch it going over. Copper flashing can rip into you. Yep. Beautiful night, isn't it? Oh, just a little bit cold, that's all. No, nothing back here. Let's try the front. You know, Matt, I think we ought to... Someone behind that ventilator. Yeah? I think so. Saw so something move. All right. Let's have a look. Okay. All right, you. Raise up. Take it easy, Matt. Coley. Hmm? Coley. He's out, Captain. Coley. Uh, yeah. All right. Take it easy. You'll be okay. Ahern. You'll yeah, be yeah. all right, Coley. I'm cut. We found Coley. I'm all cut up. Go downstairs, ring in for an ambulance. I chased him up here. All right, Coley. Take it easy. Put your light on him, man. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm all 
right. I, I guess I just passed out for a little while. I'll be all right. It's awful sticky on my neck. Why is it blood? You were bleeding a little bit. It stuck me three times, if I remember. All right. You can tell us about it later. Well, I'm all right now. Chased him up here. About ten yards ahead of me all the way. I saw him... come out on the roof, and when I got over here, he was laying for me. Jumped me. Okay. Don't worry about it. Did you see which way he ran? Why? Well, went that way. Over the next roof, I think. I think I saw him go that way before I passed out. Yeah, this is on the way, Captain. Okay, good. Hi, hey, Sergeant. Holy, stay with him, Sergeant. We want to take a look over here. Yes, sir. Well, he ran this way, Captain, over to the next roof. He didn't run over to the next roof, man. He jumped. Oh, that's some jump. Good ten feet across there. At least. Well, we know where he lives. We'll get him. Just hope Coley's going to be okay. Oh, I think he will, Matt. His passing out worries me, though. It's a bad sign. Not necessarily. Uh, looks more like a 12 or 14-foot jump, Captain. Matt. Yes, sir? Put your light down there in the courtyard. Sweep it around down there. Okay. Maybe you're right. Yeah. There he is. Well, Matt, I guess you don't have to look for him at home. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, who got bitten? How old? Four. Where's the dog? Is a dog there? Where? Oh. What's the name of the girl who was bitten? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, transcribed. The factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. 21st Precinct has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
precinct, Detective Goldman. What do you mean, Rob? Held up? Where is it? 35 or 39. What is it there? The bar? How many hold up? You are in the muster room at the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. Yeah, right away. They'll be there. Okay. Yeah. Twenty-first precinct transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the one hundred seventy-three thousand people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the twenty-first. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the twenty-first precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was a cold, windy day in the precinct, and our patrol problems had been increased enormously because of men drawn away from the command for temporary duty elsewhere. Orders had come via teletype at 7 a.m. from the Bureau of Orders to detail four men to the Manhattan West Borough Command because of a parade on Broadway. In addition, the Shah of Iran had been scheduled to visit the exhibit of ancient Persian relics at the Metropolitan Museum of Art at 11 a.m., and consequently, six patrolmen and a sergeant were assigned from the 21st to duty on Fifth Avenue in the vicinity of the museum. Because we were short of men in the precinct for the day, I went out on patrol in sector car number two as soon as I had turned out the platoon and remained out for the balance of the morning. In the meantime, the everyday business of the precinct went on. For instance, detectives Ralph Scanlon and Chris Vitale, investigating the armed robbery of a bar and grill the previous night, parked their car on 3rd Avenue in the 80s and crossed the street under the L structure toward a small hotel, the entrance to which was wedged between two stores. The visit to the hotel was in response to a tip from an informant, sometimes reliable, sometimes not, but worth checking out because a customer had been shot during the course of the robbery. What do you say? You want to jump in for coffee after we get through here? Yeah, Pete, sure. This doesn't turn out to be anything. We we'll go down the street then. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, he must be around someplace. Uh, what's the matter? I don't know. Something's the matter with me. When I don't get any sleep, I seem to get tired. Oh, I think you should see a doctor. Somebody could walk away with this joint. There's no room. We're all filled up. We don't want a room, Pop. Come in. Oh, you're a detective from the station house. Yeah, well, that's right. I didn't recognize you for a minute. I was in back getting some reading matter. You can go nuts in this job if you don't have something to read, you know. But what can I do for you? Look, Pop. You know, it's we... funny. I was just dancing through here. It says, for the 15th, with Jupiter in the ascendancy, that a friend in a high civic post may be a valuable assistance to you. Do you go for astrology? Never touch the stuff. Yeah. Listen, Pop, we're interested in a guy that... Hey, excuse me. I just get the phone. All right, go ahead. Hotel. Who? Uh, how do you spell it? Double F or double S? No, no, nobody here like that registered. Okay, yeah. Let's see your register, Pop. Yeah, sure, help yourself here. <clears throat> you know, somebody left a couple of these astrology books around here once, and I got kind of interested in it. I'm uh, Aries. Yeah? Yeah. But when you get right down to it, two-thirds of the stuff they print in there is just plain guesswork. Then why do you read it? Well, I'm the kind of guy which doesn't like to miss any bets, especially with Mercury dominant. Uh, what are you looking for there? Now, maybe I can help you. What's this guy's name registered here? I can't read the writing. That's uh, Binfield. Floyd R. Binfield. What room's he in? Uh, he's in 22. You know something? I thought there was something the matter with him when he checked in. He looks like a Sagittarius. I had him pegged for a Sagittarius. When did he check in? Yesterday. Yesterday morning, just about this time. Is he in his room now? Yeah, he's in there. Have you seen him this morning? 
Yeah, I seen him. He came down for coffee and he went back up. He's in there. Where is 22? Up the stairs, straight down the hall, and the first one around the bend. Uh, what do you do, this guy? We've got a couple of things we want to talk to him about. Where do we get these characters? Where do they come from? Don't ask me. Let's have the pass key. Uh, listen now, do you want me to come up and open this room for you? We want you to just stay here, right here. Oh, he's a tough customer, huh? We don't know. We'll find out after we talk to him. Yeah. I always like the way you guys say talk. How about the pass key? Yeah. Yeah. Be my guest. Thanks. Oh, uh, <clears throat> listen. Uh, yeah? What's your birthday? June. June 10th. Oh, you're all right. Gemini. Don't you worry. That's well, good to hear. Well, at least he's here, Ralph. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, listen. Yeah? If you need some help now, just holler. Okay, Pop. All he's got to be is the right guy. We'll find that out soon enough. Yeah. That way. Stay in the bar very long? 
Well, yeah, a pretty long time. How long? Oh, until about 1 30, 2 o'clock in the morning, I guess. What's this girl's name? Uh, Martha. Martha what? Martha what? Uh, well, to tell you the truth, I don't remember her last name. Yeah, she told me what it was, but it kind of went over my head. And I thought you said she was a friend of yours. Well, I know. Yeah, I met her yesterday. That's just an expression of a friend of mine. You remember where the cafe she works is? Yeah, sure. I've been there a lot of times. Listen, what's the beef? Is, 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 is there something serious? Because if there is, I've I got a right to know what it's all about. Don't you agree with me? This Martha can account for your time last night, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Every minute. Well, then relax. You've got nothing to worry about. Okay, okay, sure. So, how about taking these things off, huh? Well, I'll tell you, Floyd. Maybe you've got nothing to worry about. But we have. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. After making a thorough search of the room, detectives Vitaly and Scanlon returned to the station house with their prisoner. They took him, still in handcuffs, through the muster room where the desk officer, Lieutenant Gorman, and Sergeant Waters were on duty, through the back room and up the stairs to the second floor where the 21st Detective Squad is located. All right. Back that way. All you got to do is talk to her. Okay. Yeah, we know. Go on inside. Yeah, sure. That way. 21st Squad, Detective Goldman. Okay, hold it here. Hi, Pete. Hi, Goldman. What did you lose it, mister? Yeah. Yeah. All right, you know where the station house is? Yeah, that's right. You come in here and make a report of it. Come up to the uh, detectives. Yeah. Okay, you're welcome. On the second floor. Okay. Well, who's you got here, Scanlon? The champ? You thought he was the champ. He didn't last one round. Is Lieutenant in, Goldman? Yeah, he's in. Anybody with him? No. Sit down there a minute, Floyd. Listen, couldn't you take these things off now? Uh, please sit down. Yeah, I want to talk to the boss, Reed. I'll watch him. Yeah. Hey, uh, how about reaching in my pocket for a cigarette, huh? Which pocket? Yeah. This one right here. Yeah. Vitaly, Lieutenant. Come in. Oh, Reed. Lieutenant. You got that boy? Yes, this camel's got him out there. Does he have to pay for himself? Well, he denies it. Yeah. He says he was out with a girl between 9.30 and 2 in the morning. He was sitting in a bar in Long Island City. That's what he says, huh? Yes, sir. What do you think? Well, he gave Scanlon and me a hard time when we hit the door. The boy wanted to fight. Uh-huh. But both of us had put him down on the bed and get the cuffs on him. He's still full of fight? Uh, well, he's cooled down some, Lieutenant. And what do you think? Is he one of the two that heisted that place last night? That beats me, Lieutenant. He fits. But if his story about being with his girl stands up, I guess he isn't. Well, let's talk to him, huh? Yes, sir. Bring him in. All right. Just a second. Yes, sir. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. First squad, Lieutenant King. Captain Kennelly, Matt. Yes, sir. Matt, uh, I got a call from Inspector McBride. He wants an explanation of my endorsement on that gun permit renewal we were talking about. I guess you'll get a call, too. Just a second, Captain. Yeah. Pete, I'll be with you in a minute. Oh, yes, sir. Bring that boy in when I call you. Yes, sir. What do you say, Pete? He's busy on the phone. He'll be with us in a minute. Look, I got a lot of things to do today, you know. Sister shopping, Floyd? Well, I got plenty to do. Sure. How do you spell lavalier? Never mind how do you spell it. What is it? No, oh, I know. The lady had her stolen. L-A-V-A-L-I-E-R-E. Ah, muchas gracias. Hey, is this going to take long, do you think? Well, that depends on what you've got to say to the lieutenant. Well, what can I say to him? I don't even know what I'm supposed to be here for. What am I supposed to be here for? How do you for? spell, uh, Chatelaine? Stolen from the same lady? Yep. She ought to quit, start over again. I'm not sure. You better look it up. If I'm supposed to have done something, I've got a right to know what it is. Sure you do. So what is it? Chatelaine, the brooch-like clasp or hook from which a watch is worn suspended. Hmm. Didn't get a liberal education in this job. Okay, V. Yes, sir. Come on, Floyd. Come on, Floyd. Just want to know what it's all about. Well, you came to the right place. Inside. Oh, Cannon. Lieutenant. Sit down there, Floyd. Here. Yeah, sit down. Floyd. Lieutenant King. Floyd Benfield. Pleased to meet you. Lieutenant, ask me to take these things off of me. I'll admit I lost my head a little before, but I guarantee I won't give you no trouble. I guarantee it. 
Take the Martin scan. Well, the mine will come in. I'll get them. Hold out your hands, Floyd. I appreciate it. Just hold still. I do. I really do. All right. Relax, Floyd. Excellent. Well, let's get right down to business, eh, Floyd? Yeah, that's all right with me. Good. Now, these detectives came to talk to you this morning, and you tried to fight your way out. Well, it was a mistake. You see, I thought there was somebody else. A couple of hustlers that tried to put the bite on me. All right, maybe you did think that. Now, you told them you were with some girl between 9.30 last night and 2 this morning. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Martha. We, we were in this bar out in Long Island City. Then you couldn't have been one of the two guys that stuck up a bar and grill on Lexington Avenue about 11 o'clock. Well, of course not. Well, sometimes we get information that's a little bit wrong, Floyd. Oh, sure, sure. That could happen to anybody. I appreciate that. This girl's name is Martha, you say? <sighs> yeah, that's right. What's her last name? Well, I don't really know that. She told me, but I had a couple of drinks, you know, and it didn't sink in. Where can we find her? I, I told them she works in this cafe right near there where the bar was where we were drinking after she got off out in Long Island City there. You know where the cafe is? Uh, oh, sure. Now, look, Floyd. Yeah. This was a pretty good tip I got on you. Not to my way of thinking. The guy I came from isn't wrong once in a year. Well, this is the time, believe me. I could put you in the car, and we could drive over to Long Island City. We could look around for this cafe and this Martha. But it could be we'd have a time finding her. Isn't that right? Oh, oh we'd find her. But we might have a time. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I don't know that neighborhood too good. Now, this bar on Lexington Avenue that was stuck up last night, there were two bartenders in there and five or six customers besides the one that was shot. Oh. Well, was he shot dead? Caught him right here. Doctor says he'll be all right. Oh, that's good to hear. Well, the two bartenders say they could recognize both of the stick-up men any time, any place, anywhere. They described them head to toe to a T. Some of the customers in there said they could recognize both. Some said they could recognize one or the other. One guy said he couldn't remember what either of them looked like. Well, that's vicious. I guess some people got better memories than others. I suppose we ride out to Long Island City and we look around for this cafe. Suppose even we locate this Martha you were talking about. Suppose she says she was drinking with you between 9.30 and 2 in the morning. Yeah. Why should I believe her any more than I believe you? Well, it's two people's words. Well, the best thing to do is get those bartenders and a couple of the customers in here and let them have a look at you. If we could only go out and locate Martha... You're the guy they're going to make you. Don't worry about that. Why don't you stop wasting the time of everybody concerned and tell us the truth about this thing. That's what I've been doing. Now, you know, there's nobody named Martha. Just grab that out of thin air. You and another guy put the heist on that bar last night, didn't you? Well, let's use the kidney. That's right. You'd get those witnesses down here. They'd make me in a minute. In less than a minute. Okay. It was me. Who was the other guy with him? Well, if I tell you, what's in it for me? Who was the other guy with you? Oh. His name is Ted Bryan, Bill Ted Bryan. Where does he live? I don't know exactly. What do you mean you don't know exactly? I don't, I don't. He's got a place in New York, a room someplace. You don't know where? Well, he never told me where. The only thing he told me was sometimes he stays with his aunt. Where does she live? Out there in Bayside. What's his aunt's name? It beats me. He never told me. Never told you much, did he? He don't talk much. Where are the guns you used last night? I never had a gun. There was only one gun. Bill had it. You still got it? Well, he had it when I left him. Anything in this room up there, V? No weapons, Lieutenant. About $185 in cash, and that's all. Did that money come out of the bar and grill? Yeah, that's where it come from. When did you see Bill last? Right after the deal. We split up the money. He went his way. I went mine. Did you make plans to meet him again? Well, he knew where I was staying. He said he'd be in touch with me. How many other deals were you with him on? Just this one. This was the only one. In New York, that is. Where else? Well, we worked a little bit in Boston last week. I told you I was in Boston tonight. Yeah, you told me. Well, there was a couple of little small deals up there. Why'd you go to Boston? Well, to tell you the truth, it was Bill's idea. He knows a girl up there. He wanted to see it. It was his idea to do some work to pay the expenses. Where did you go after you left Bill last night? I went and had a couple of drinks. Hey... I bet you I know where you got that information on me. There was a couple of guys I was drinking with. Yeah, I guess I said too much. I guess you did. Yeah, me and my big mouth. My big mouth gets me into trouble every time. That's an unbeatable combination for getting into trouble. A big mouth and a little brain. Lieutenant King continued to interrogate the suspect until he had obtained all the information he believed to be in the man's possession. 
In the meantime, a detective called the Bureau of Criminal Identification at police headquarters, 240 Center Street. The name William Tedburn was checked through the files, and within a few minutes, Lieutenant King received the information that a man of that name, and answering the same general physical description, had been arrested three times on charges of robbery and grand larceny, and had one conviction. The folder which listed the relatives of William Tedburn showed that he did in fact have an aunt residing in Bayside, Queens, and on the occasion of one of his arrests, gave her address as his own residence. The New York County District Attorney's Office was notified, and an assistant district attorney came to the 21st Detective Squad to question the suspect already under arrest and to assist the detectives in arranging a lineup at which the victims and witnesses would have the opportunity to make an identification. Two detectives were sent to check out the other addresses given by the suspect, William Tedburn, at the time of his previous arrest, and the hotel in which Floyd Binfield resided was planted in the event he showed up there. Lieutenant King instructed Detectives Vitale and Scanlon to drive to Bayside to the residence of Tedburn Vant. At 1.15 p.m., they found the street, parked the car down the block, and walked back toward the two-story brick house. Well, this is a pretty nice neighborhood here. Yeah. Must be rough on the ants. Must be rough on the parents. Okay. See those aluminum stumps there? Yeah. That's what I want to get. What? Are you kidding? They cost an arm and a leg. You didn't get them financed, FHA. You still got to pay for them. You've got to pay for everything. You think he's there? He could be. There's someone. Yes? Is Bill home? Well, no, not right now. Where is he? Do you know? Well, no, I don't. Are you friends of his? We're police officers. Oh. Do you mind if we come in? Well, all right. Is Billy in trouble again? Well, we want to see him about something. What's he done? He promised me he wouldn't get into anything after the last time. He went away for nearly three years. That should have been enough for him. Should have been, yes. Yeah. Is it something serious? Well, we don't know. It could be nothing at all. Oh, well, that's good. Was he home last night? Yes, he was home. He came home after I went to bed. And he left early this morning. He didn't even have his breakfast. Do you mind if we take a look in his room? Well, I don't know. We won't disturb anything. Well, do you think you ought to, really? Yes, I think so. Well, it's upstairs. Thank you. I don't know why that boy should get me trouble. He's had a good education and all that. And he's got a trade. He worked at it. He could make good money. Well, that's the way it goes, I guess. It's that one right there. Now, you won't disturb anything. No, ma'am. We'll leave everything the way we find it. Let's try this. Well, there's just his clothes in there. Oh, yes, ma'am. We know. Ah, look at this. Two empty shells. What are they, 38? Yep. That's how the gun was described. What if it's around? I got an idea where it is. It's on his hip. You really have to go through Billy's things. I'm sorry, but we'd like to. Do you think he'll be home today? Well, I don't know. He didn't say. Does he usually come home? Well, usually, yes, but he didn't say. Do you mind if we wait around for him? Well, do you really have to? We should. Well, all right. You really should. Well, you know, that sounded like his car out in front. Uh, can you look out this window and see if it's him? Is it? Yes, it's Billy. Is he coming in the house? Yes, he's getting out of the car. He's staying here. In here? If he calls, do you answer him? Tell him you're upstairs, but stay right here. All right. Come on, Pete. Must I stay right here? Right there, yes. Pete, get in that bedroom across there. Okay, that's a good idea. Are you set? Yeah, all set. Easy. Here he comes. Auntie? 
All right, Bill, get him up. Hey, hey. he's healed. Stop it, Bill. Stop. Get him. Stop. What do you think? Let's go. All right. Watch him. Get his gun. Yeah. is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed the factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Ethel Everett, Santos Ortega, John Larkin, Bill Smith, Larry Haynes, and Bill Lipton. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. John Schaefer speaking. The nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. The officers will be right there. Yeah, and the ambulance, too. Just stay there. Okay. lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. As soon as I turned out the platoon and the men who would patrol the precinct for the next eight hours marched out the front door, Patrolman Bailey, the station house attendant, and Patrolman Winkler, the precinct youth patrolman, appeared with three large corrugated cartons to begin decorating the muster room for the Christmas party, which would be held for neighborhood children in the station house the following afternoon. I went into my office to read and sign reports which would be taken to the 6th Division by the precinct messenger. When I finished the job at 9.15 a.m. and came back out into the muster room, Winkler and Bailey already had the tree up and were beginning to decorate it. I walked around behind the desk where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard desk. 
Detroit Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Captain. Hello, Sergeant. Well, what was he doing? What's going on, Red? Pretty quiet, Captain. All right. Winkler. Yes, sir. Yeah, Isn't that tree smaller than the one we had last year? No, it's just about the same size. No, I think the one we had last year was a little fatter, Red. Yes, sir. I guess that's it. Oh. Uh, Lieutenant. Yeah? Vaquero's got a lost child over there. He's bringing him into the station house. Well, doesn't the kid know where he lives? Vaquero says he's only about three years old. He's been looking around for about 20 minutes in the stores over there. The kid says he was with his mother shopping. All right. Uh, where are you going to put the tables, Winkler? What'd you say, Captain? Where are you going to put the tables? Right here along this wall. Refreshments there and the presents here. I think that'll be all right. Yes, sir. Red, uh, have you got a car to take me on patrol? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Sergeant, have number three come by the house to take the captain on patrol. Okay, Lieutenant. All right. I went down and got for some of you. Now, what are you going to do about it? Do about what, Red? You know very well about what. I told you about what. Did you? I was here yesterday and I told you all about it. You told me there wasn't anything the police could do and that I would have to go down to the magistrate's court and get a summons. That's what you told me. I didn't tell you anything, lady. I didn't even talk to you. Oh, yes, you did. And I did just what you said. I went down to the court and I got a summons out for it. Lady, I wasn't even here yesterday. I was off. Was he? Yes, he was off. He wasn't here. When you were sitting right where you're sitting now... We've got four lieutenants in this job. Well, he looks just like you, except that I don't think he has red hair. He doesn't. I suppose I'll have to go through the whole story again, then. Who's paying for that Christmas tree? Not the taxpayers, I hope. No, ma'am. The men pay for it themselves. Oh, well, that's good. Suppose you tell me what the trouble is. Well, as I told him yesterday, I had a perfectly legitimate complaint. This old man who lives across the hall from me is conducting a business in the building. People come in there all day and all night long disturbing my teeth. Trooping up and down the stairs with packages. You think it was a store on Fifth Avenue instead of an apartment? Well, that's not a police case, lady. So I was told yesterday. And did you complain to the super of the building? Oh, you can't get very far with him. All he told me was, why don't I leave the old man alone? He's not hurting anyone. So I said, he's disturbing my peace. Well, he wouldn't do a thing about it. Not a thing about it. Then I came over here yesterday, and the man without the red hair who was sitting right there told me if I wanted to make a complaint against him, I would have to go down to the magistrate's court and get out a summons, and that's exactly what I did. Here it is. Oh, uh, Winkler. Yes, sir. Uh, you've got too many blue ones together in a bunch there. Wait a minute. Right there. Oh, yeah. I'll fix it. I bet you haven't been paying a bit of attention to one word that I've said. I sure have, lady. I heard every word. Well, I wish you'd look at me when you listen. You, uh, you said you got a summons out for him. That's right. And when I got it, I told them clerks down there at the court that it's a shame I couldn't just get a policeman to go up and arrest him. That it has to be up to a woman like me to act on her own initiative. So he told me what my rights are. He told me I should go to the station house and talk to the desk lieutenant and that the desk lieutenant would have to send a policeman to serve the summons. No, he didn't tell you that. Oh, yes, he did. I know what he told me. He told you that if you were afraid you might be harmed physically, that a police officer would be sent along to stand by while you serve the summons. You're the one who has to serve it. Well, what's the difference? Oh, there's a lot of difference. Are you going to send someone over there with me or not? May I see the summons, please? Of course. Thank you. His name is Ernst Wolfschmidt? That's right. And your name is Myra Beaven. I spell it B-E-A-V-A-N, but I pronounce it Beaven. The address is 761 East 77th. I live on the third floor, and he lives right across the hall. And if I don't get some satisfaction out of this, I'm just going to withhold paying my rent. That's all there is to it. It's just making me a nervous wreck. Uh, do you know whether he's home now? Well, I don't know for sure. I haven't been there myself. Is it uh, Mrs. Bevan? Yes, Mrs. Bevan. I'm a widow. What's this man selling out of his apartment, do you know? He's selling everything imaginable. For instance? Well, I saw some portable typewriters in there, and radios and fountain pens, toasters, electric clocks, watches, fitted cases, everything like that. You were in and looked at it? Oh, I should say not. Yeah, his door opened last night, and I saw into his place. The merchandise is up to the ceiling, and people keep parading up the stairs all day and all night and keep going out with packages. Oh, brand new merchandise? Well, it looks new to me. And did you tell the other lieutenant that when you were in here yesterday? No. How could I tell him if I didn't get a good look inside his place until last night? Did Mr. Wolfschmidt ever offer to sell you anything? I don't even talk to him. How old is he? 
Oh, in his 70s, I'd say, early 70s. Does he work? Not that you could notice, he doesn't. How long has this been going on, Mrs. Bevan? His selling to people, you mean? Yes. Would you mind telling me who you are, please? I came in here to talk to this lieutenant. I'm Captain Kennelly, the commanding officer of the precinct. Oh, thank you. How long has it been going on? About four or five days now. And you never noticed it before, his doing business from the apartment, I mean. No. Winter. Yes, sir. I never uh, noticed. You've got to hold that ladder for him. It looks a little shaky. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea where this merchandise came from? No, not unless he stole it. I wouldn't be surprised if he did. I wouldn't put it past him. Supposed to be such a lovable old man. I bet you he's a thief. <laughs> I bet you that. Well, that's a conclusion you can't jump to hastily. But uh, I wish you'd do us a favor, Mrs. Bell. Oh, what is that? I'd like you to tell the detectives about this. About Wolf Smith? Yes. I would be delighted. Yeah. Will you see that Mrs. Bevan gets upstairs, Red? Yes. Captain. All right. I'm going out on patrol, Red. Oh, Captain, before you go. Yes, Miss Bevan. If I don't see you again, I wish you a very merry Christmas. Thanks, Miss Bevan. <laughs> and the same to you. I went into my office for my overcoat, then out through the front door and down to the curb where patrolman William Coley was sitting behind the wheel of sector car number three. I got in and instructed him to patrol toward the northern boundary of the precinct where I made two stops on precinct business, both at garages in connection with applications for renewal of their tow car licenses. Procedure in these cases requires the precinct commander to personally interview the applicant. After these calls were completed, I instructed Patrolman Coley to make a tour of the retail areas in the precinct so that I could observe the traffic conditions which were aggravated by the holiday crowds. At ten minutes after eleven, a call came over the air for us to ring into the station house. I instructed Patrolman Coley to stop at the closest call box. All right, you stay here, Coley. I'll ring in. Captain Canelli, Box 19. Uh, Lieutenant Gorman wants to talk to you, Captain. Okay. And a Mr. O'Ban from the Corporation Council's office called. He said he'd be here around 4.30. Oh, yes. Uh, there was a woman fell down the steps at the 67th Street station of the 3rd Avenue L on November 10th. She's starting a personal injury suit against the city. Get out the aided card on the case from the UF-18 and leave them on my desk. Yes, sir. All right. Let me have Lieutenant Gorman. Yes, sir. Captain Kennelly. I uh, sent that Mrs. Bevan upstairs to the detectives, Captain. Yeah? Lieutenant King, listen to what you have to say. Was he interested enough to go over to the building? Well, at first he sent an over and scallon over there to have the super let them in for a look around. Then about a half hour later he went over himself. He just rang in here and asked me to get in touch with you. Well, what did he find, Red? address again? 761 East 77th Street, Captain, third floor. Did uh, Lieutenant King say the stuff might have been stolen? He says that's what it looks like, Captain. Well, have they got any idea who the old man has been selling the stuff to? Well, that's what makes the whole thing so funny, Captain. What do you mean, funny? From what they can make out so far, the old man hasn't been selling it. He's been playing Santa Claus. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. The car, after completing my call to the station house, and instructed the operator, Patrolman Coley, to drive to 761 East 77th Street, the address of Ernst Wolfschmidt and the woman whose complaint started the investigation. As we pulled into the block... I saw the detective squad car parked in front of the building, which was an old but clean five-story tenement. After Patrolman Coley parked, I told him to wait in the car, and I walked into the building and up the stairs to the third floor. The doors to the two apartments were open. 
In the first one, I saw Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, talking to another man. Oh, let me see. Hello, here. Captain. Matt, I come here in 1948 to work in the building. That is, he was a tenant then. Captain Kennelly, Mr. Joe Linwick, the super of the building. Mr. Linwick? Oh, I'm glad to know you. So how do you like this, huh? All we got to do is put out a catalog and we're in business around here, huh? Yeah, we sure would be. Three portable typewriters, Captain. Yeah? I count 11 portable radios and clock radios, different makes. Oh, yeah. Half dozen toasters, three waffle irons, seven electric clocks. The five dozen pen and pencil sets, about a dozen Swiss watches, two kitchen mixers. Well, that's only in this room. You should see in there. Do you know where he is, man? No, sir, not yet. Well, he'll come back. He's never failed to come back. Oh, uh, my car is parked downstairs, Matt. We better get it out of there. Yes, sir. Uh, Scanlon's with Mrs. Bevan. He'll take care of it. Good. Scanlon. Yes. Coley's the operator. Coley's downstairs waiting in Captain Kennelly's car. Go down and tell him to pull around the block. Okay, Lieutenant. Well, this looks like stolen goods for sure, huh? Well, I can't make it for anything else, Captain. I don't know what got into the poor old guy. He's the nicest fellow you ever met. Don't bother nobody. Minds his own business. I understand he doesn't work. No, he don't. He told me he's on a pension. He was 25 or 30 years with some company downtown. Pension must not be much, though, because every once in a while he runs short. He comes to me and borrows a dollar, two dollars, until his check comes, he says. I'll give it to him. He never fails to pay it back. Never fails. Have you any idea how he got this stuff? Well, I, uh, I got a sneaking suspicion. What's that, Joe? Oh, it was one afternoon last week. Well, I wasn't around here. I got another job I worked part-time at, you know. My wife told me there was a man knocked at the door and said he had some cartons to be delivered to Ernst Wolf Schmidt, and there wasn't any answer from the bell. Well, she said, all right, she'd let him in. She got the pass key. She went upstairs and opened the door. The first thing you know, she told me, two guys come up the stairs. They're carrying a big box each. They set them down in the middle right here, and she started to lock the door. They said, no, wait a minute, there's more. So they make two more trips upstairs. Six cartons all together, my wife said. They put them inside, she locked up, and that was that. Mm. Did she see the truck they came off of? Well, not that I know of. Did she sign a receipt for them? Well, she never mentioned it. Uh, where is your wife now? Where do you think? Christmas shopping. What time do you expect her home? When they chase her off 34th Street, she'll come home. She's the kind of woman, when she gets inside a department store, she loses all sense of time, direction. You know what I mean? Well, we'll talk to her when she gets home. Did uh, Wolf Schmidt say anything to you about the stuff that was delivered? No. No, he didn't say a word, except like I told you. Well, he gave me a radio, just like this one here, only in black. Didn't you think that was kind of peculiar? Well, I didn't think it was peculiar, but I, I told him he didn't have to do it. He said he wanted to. He said me and my wife had been very nice to him, very nice to him when we didn't have to be. Of course, I didn't know about all this, this stuff at the time. I, I didn't see it yet. I figured maybe he, he hit a horse or something like that. Didn't you think there was something peculiar about all the people coming up to his apartment? Well, to tell you the truth, no. I mean, if a guy goes into business, he goes into business. What's peculiar about selling something out of your flat? What I thought was peculiar was when I found out he wasn't selling it. He was giving it away. When did you find that out? Well, to be honest with you, not until last night. He the worst in the delicatessen down the block told me. It was going on right under my nose, and the kid that works in the delicatessen has to tell me he's been giving it away. <laughs> give this kid a $25 electric razor. How do you like that? Who else did he give this stuff to? From what I understand, he was stopping people on the street right and left. Strangers. Telling them to come on up to the place. He had a Christmas present for them. Well, some of the people came, and some thought he was a little, a little mixed up in the head, which I guess isn't too far from the truth. I don't know. I, I can't figure it out. What is, what is he doing with all this stuff? Where did it come from? When you find out, will you let me know? Yes, Joe, when we find out. I understand Mrs. Bevan complained to you about the people coming up here. Ah, oh, that. Well, she complained about anything. She complains about no heat, too much heat. No hot water, water's too hot. Well, she even complained once about the full moon shining in her window. Like I could turn off the moon, you know? You think I'm going to have to give my radio back? Well, if it's stolen, you will. Oh, I don't know. That's what I get for dreaming. 
I was picturing myself sitting on the stoop next summer and a hot night, you know. Can of beer, that radio that's in the ball game. Captain, <laughs> officer. Speak to the devil. Yes, Miss Barron? He's coming. I saw him coming. Yeah? I was looking out my window and I saw him coming down the block. That thief, that criminal. Are you sure it was him? Of course I'm sure it was him. You get back inside your apartment and close the door. We'll handle it. I'm entitled to stay here, don't you think? No, I don't. I'm entitled to serve my summer. You do that later after we get this straightened out. Now, I suggest you get in your own flat. If that's the way you feel about it, all right. But you don't seem to remember who stopped. Hmm. See what that means, Captain? Yeah, I see. Uh, you want me to get out of here, too? I, I just as soon. I, I kind of like the old guy. No, I think you better stay, Joe. All right. You go out in the hall and take a look. See if he's coming up the stairs. Okay. Come right back in. As soon as I see him? Yeah. Well, I guess you'll get your answer soon, man. Yes, sir. I guess I will. <laughs> sure got hold of a lot of merchandise. Yeah. He didn't buy it. That's a cinch. He's coming up, Lieutenant. All right. Let's shut the door. Did he see you, Joe? No, I don't think so. Poor guy. I, I hate to see him in a mess. All right. Quiet. Here he is. Come in, Mr. Wolfsmith. Oh. What's the matter? Hello, Mr. Wolfsmith. Joe, what's the matter? Why the police? It wasn't my idea, Mr. Wolfsmith. This is Captain Canelli. I'm Lieutenant King. Wh whose idea? Hers across the hall? Yeah. She said she would make me trouble. Mr. Wolfsmith, where did all this stuff come from? I don't know. I don't know where it came from. What do you mean you don't know? I came home one night. It was here. You don't know where it came from? No. Well, don't you have any idea? It was delivered. From where? I don't know. Now, look, you just don't get three or four thousand dollars worth of merchandise just like that. I did. Brand new stuff. It's nice, isn't it? It's all very nice. Where did you think it came from? I don't know. Don't you care? It was here. It had my name on the boxes. It had my address. Did you order it from anywhere? Where would I order it from? Look, could we sit down and talk? I've been outside since nine o'clock. My feet hurt me. You sit down. There are plenty of more chairs. Take the fountain pens off the chair there. Would you like a fountain pen? Put one in your pocket with a Merry Christmas. Now, look, Mr. Wolfsmith. Joe, maybe we all have some coffee, huh? Go in the kitchen, put the water down for the coffee, huh? I, uh, I, I don't think I care for any, Mr. Wolfsmith. The, the captain would like some? And the lieutenant? No, no, we don't care for any, thank you. So there's no use having coffee alone. I'd like you to tell us how you got all this merchandise, Mr. Wolfsmith. It, it came, that's all. Did you steal it? Me? Did you? No. Did some friends of yours steal it? My friends don't steal it. If my friends stole, they wouldn't be my friends anymore. Well, where did it come from? It was here. I found it here. Well, did you care where it came from? It came to me. My name was on the boxes. Well, who do you think sent it to you? I don't know. Do you have any idea? I thought who might send it to me. I thought and I thought. I, I couldn't think of anybody. Then how do you think it got here? In the carton. Uh, didn't you think it was a good idea to make some inquiries about it? But my name was on the boxes, my name and my address. And you did nothing about it? Oh, sure, I did something about it. I, I did a very lot about it. And what did you do? Well, I had no idea what was in the boxes. I opened them up and I saw all the beautiful things, things that people want and need and love to have. So I did something about it. What? Well... Whoever sent it knew that I couldn't use five typewriters. I couldn't listen to 11 radios. I couldn't write with all those pens. So I thought I was the one who was chosen to make people happy for Christmas. To give them away to good people who wanted them and needed them to use. Well, who do you think chose you to do this? Well, it could have been some good person who chose me, but then I... I don't know anyone who would have that money to spend. So I thought... What did you think? Oh, it would sound silly saying it to you. 
But thinking of it, it doesn't sound so silly. I thought maybe God sent them. Oh. To make people happy with? I see. There are so many people that can be made happy and need to be made happy. When all this arrived, I, I thought that was what for. I went out and found people who needed it and could use it and deserved it. I didn't care about any of it for myself, really. Listen, I... I think I, I could use some coffee. I'll, I'll go put it up. Can, can you find everything, Joe? Yeah, sure. It wasn't right to give it away? We'll get it all straightened out. I'm sorry if I did something wrong. Well, at least your heart was in the right place. In another few minutes, I left the apartment and resumed patrol. I instructed Patrolman Coley to make another tour of the shopping districts in the precinct to check the patrol conditions. We were headed for the station house when a call came over the radio concerning an automobile accident, ambulance responding on the East River Drive. We made the run. A car had overturned attempting to avoid a collision and the driver had been injured. I remained at the scene until the victim had been taken to the hospital and traffic restored to normal. It was nearly one o'clock when the car pulled up in front of the station house. I got out, crossed the sidewalk, and walked up the worn stone steps into the muster room. I headed around behind the desk to sign the blotter. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Captain. Hello, Sergeant. Okay, seventeen. Well, they did a good job decorating in here, then. Yes, sir, they sure did. What's doing? Nothing much, Captain. Except that Matt Keen came in with that old man. Oh, yeah? Did he uh, find out where that merchandise came from? Uh, not that I've heard of, Captain. All right, I'll be in my office. Yes, sir. I'd have some messages on your desk, Captain. Okay. Would you tell Fallon I want to see him, Sergeant? He's taking his meal, Captain. Is there anything I can do? Just tell Fallon to see me when he gets back in the house. Yes, sir. I'll be in my office. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Uh, yes, sir. Captain? Yes? Lieutenant King is bring it down for you. All right, put it on my line. I'll take it in there. Yes, sir. Twenty first precinct, Captain Canelli. Lieutenant King, Captain. Yes, Matt. We've got that old man, Mr. Wolfschmidt, up here on the detective squad. Yes, I know. I found out where that stuff came from. Where? Well, Scanlon had a brainstorm. Yeah? Same number on the west side. Yes, sir, that's right. I called over there. The Wolfschmidt who owns the store told me he bought a bankrupt stock in Jersey last week in order to chip in by truck. This merchandise, all right. He was wondering what happened to it. As a matter of fact, he'd already called the trucking company. And they addressed the shipment East 77th instead of West 77th. Yes, sir, that's what it looks like. And the similarity of names clinched the deal. How about our Mr. Wolfschmidt? Santa Claus. Too bad that stuff didn't come from where he thought it did. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah. Well, what's the address? Two oh five? Two oh nine. Yeah. Yeah? Was anybody hurt? They have a gun? Yeah. Yeah. Which way? Was he on foot? What kind of car? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 
21st Precinct transcribed a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Santos Ortega, Bill Zucker, Abby Lewis, and Bill Smith. Written and directed by Stanley Niff. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Bob Pfeiffer speaking. 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 Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. The shooting where? Yeah. Yeah. Who shot? Who? Well, you are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, yeah. the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. Stay right there. I'll send the officers right over. And an ambulance, too. Yeah. Right away. Don't worry. 21st Precinct, transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was off duty and not due on the job until 8 a.m. Among the 53 men on the job in the precinct was patrolman Raymond Dowd, age 43, 17 years in the job and nine in the 21st precinct assigned to post number six, which consisted of five blocks along 2nd Avenue in the 70s. When he reached his post a few minutes after midnight, he relieved patrolman Louis Barron, who had been on the job since 4 p.m. Then, as regulations require, he began trying the doors to shops, checking street lights and traffic signals. Halfway down the avenue, he noticed a figure standing in the doorway to a butcher shop across the street. He went over. As he approached the opposite curb, he saw the figure was that of a man, a young man. A young man dressed too lightly and shivering with cold. A young man with a suitcase. No trouble. What are you standing out here in the cold for? Uh, I'm waiting for my brother. He's supposed to drive by and pick me up here. Where do you live? Downtown. Have no way. What are you doing up here? Oh, I was just visiting somebody. A friend of mine. What's in that suitcase? Huh? Oh, a tuxedo. Yeah? I borrowed it from my friend for New Year's Eve. Yeah? What's your name? Elliot. Elliot what? Elliot's my last name. Jack Elliott. You got any identification, Jack? Oh, what do you mean? Like a driver's license? That'll do, yeah. Oh, sure. I, I got a driver's license. Uh, let's see it a minute, huh? Well, I'm, I'm just waiting for my brother. Well, let's see the license. Okay. I think I got it in my wallet. That's where I... Okay, get back there. Now, look, boy. Get back there. I'll kill you, I swear. Give me that gun. Get back. Give it here. Get away from me. I told you. were heard by patrolman Ernest Pagano, who was patrolling an adjacent post. Within minutes, two sector cars, the sergeant's car, a detective squad car from the 21st squad, and an emergency service car arrived in response to the radio call. Under supervision of the detectives, a search of the neighborhood was begun for the assailant. In the meantime, an ambulance arrived and patrolman Dowd was taken to Bellevue Hospital. The suitcase left at the scene by the assailant was taken to the station house. As soon as he had a report of the occurrence, Lieutenant Snyder, the desk officer on the job, notified me at my home, and I arrived at the station house at 1.15 a.m. I conferred with Lieutenant King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, who told me that Patrolman Dowd's condition was serious but not dangerous, 
that the officer had fired three shots at the fleeing assailant and believed that one had hit him. While I went to Bellevue to visit Patrolman Dowd, officers were called to Lenox Hill Hospital Emergency Ward where an unconscious man suffering from loss of blood due to a gunshot wound in the thigh had been brought in by a taxicab driver. Detectives reported that although the man was in no condition to be questioned, it appeared from his clothing and general physical description that he was the fugitive. At 2.55, I returned to the station house and lay down on the couch in my office with instructions that I be awakened if there were any developments in the case, but in no event later than 7 a.m. Captain. Uh, Captain. Yeah. 7 o'clock, Captain. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. Yeah. Mm. Sounds nice. Yeah. We've got some hot coffee going. That's good. As soon as I wash my face. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Snyder spoke to the doctor down at Bellevue. Uh-huh. Doc's going to be okay. Definitely. Good. And that boy in Lennox Hill. Yeah. He's regained consciousness. Uh, does he admit shooting down? I don't know if the detectives have been able to talk to him, Captain. But his wife's here. Oh? Yes, sir. There was an address in his pocket. Detectives went up there, they found her and brought her back. It's uh, her husband in the hospital? Yes, sir. They took her over to Lennox Hill. She identified him. He was under anesthetic. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, Lieutenant King asked if he can come upstairs when you wake up. She wants authorization to visit him this morning. All right. Is uh, Lieutenant King up there now? Yes, sir. Oh, I'll go right up. Oh, uh, there's the tally. He's carrying the squeal. The tally? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Captain. Are you going upstairs? Yes, sir. Well, i got to get back on the board. Okay, Sergeant. How does it look, V? Well, for one thing, whoever it was shot down was a burglar. Yeah? Yeah, the suitcase full of goods at the scene came out of an apartment on 79th Street. The victim identified it and reported its flat was broken in there sometime between 10 last night and when he got home at 3.30 this morning. What about the boy in the hospital? Well, he denies shooting down. But we'll, uh, we'll know about that for sure in a little while. The ballistic squad has got the slug that came out of his thigh. They're comparing it with a test slug from Dow's gun. If it matches, that's the boy. Do you have any doubt about it, Lee? No, sir. He didn't have the gun on him, the one that shot down? Well, we figured he threw it someplace before he hailed a cab. We got men out looking. Oh, oh that's, uh, that's the wife. She's young. Yes, sir. I'm pretty yes, sure. Yes, I'll let you know that. Yeah. It's sort of rough, but uh, what can you do? Mrs. Wagon, this is uh, Captain Kennelly. Oh, how do you do? Miss Wagon? Are you the one I'm supposed to talk to about getting into Cleveland? Yes, that's right. Oh, well, can I? Oh, it's up to me to issue the authorization, but this is a felony case, and I have to talk it over with the lieutenant of detectives. Oh. What does that mean, felony case? That your husband is suspected of a serious crime. Oh. Two serious crimes, as a matter of fact. Burglarizing an apartment and shooting a police officer. I don't think Jack would do anything like that. Are you sure about it? I mean, he never said anything to me. Oh, well, it seems uh, that would be the last thing he would do, say something to you. I guess so. Would you tell me something? If I can, sure. I don't know anything about the police or what's supposed to be done. What happens to him now? Well, he's in a private hospital under a police guard. He'll be taken to Bellevue Hospital Prison Ward as soon as he can be moved. Doesn't he get a trial or something? Yes, he'll be booked on the charges and he'll have a hearing in felony court. They're not going to take him to court when he's so sick. No, it'll wait. Let's go in, Big. Thank you very much. That's all right. I- I'm sorry if I was any trouble. No, you aren't. Oh, just, uh, just sit right there. All right. Yes? Captain Canelli. Come in, Captain. Morning, Matt. Captain. Come in, Big. Yes, sir. Sit down, Captain. Yep. Well, is that the right boy in the hospital, Matt? Yes, sir, that's him. I just got a call a few minutes ago. The slug in his leg came out of Dowd's gun. This one's name is Jack Wigan, hmm? That's right. W-Y-G-A-N. Where'd he get the name Elliot he gave to Dowd? He must have pulled it out of thin air, Captain. Have you talked to him? No, sir. I'm going over there right away. 
understand he's all right. Isn't that what you said, Lee? Yes, sir. I spoke to him for a little while. The doctor said you can talk to him as long as you want after 7.30. That's after the nurses get through straightening things up. And uh, the stuff in that suitcase came out of a burglary. That's right, Captain. He broke into a flat over there on 79th Street and cleaned the place out. That's probably why he was on such an edge when Dowd walked up to him. He'd just gotten away from there. Does he have any record? We haven't printed him yet, Captain, but Z checked out the name through BCI. What do they have on him, V? Well, a man of the same name, John P. Wagon, also known as Jack Wagon. Same address. Five arrests. One is a juvenile for car theft. Mm -hmm. Four others, uh, 1897 and grand larceny. Two convictions, probation the first time. Second time he pulled two and a half to five in Elmira, plus 11 months he owed on the probation. Yeah. Well, he was up there 19 months altogether. Released last August. I see. What does his wife say about all this? She says she didn't know he was ever in a jam. Yes, sir. She was pretty surprised and upset when we hit the door up there. What do you say about her seeing him, Matt? Well, I don't see why not, Captain. I want to talk to him first, then she can see him. Okay. Let's have her in here, Pete. Yes, sir. I'm glad Dow's going to be okay, Captain. Yeah, he's lucky. Very lucky. Well, I don't know whether I'd call it lucky, Captain, to get his plug in you. Do you want me in there? That's right, in here, please. Want to sit down over here, Mrs. Wagon? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. How long have you been married to Jack? About three months. We're married in September? Yes, September, September 23rd. Uh, how old are you? Nineteen. Did Jack ever tell you he'd been in trouble before? No. He never told you he was away for a while, that he's on parole now? No. Does he have a job? Well, off and on. He did work on the docks, you know. More off than on, though, huh? Yes, I guess so. Where do you think he got the money to support you? I don't know. I never asked. He just brought it home. Didn't you care? I just never asked. Can I go over and see him? That's what I'd like to do if I can. You can see him, yes. If that's what you want. You are listening to 21st Precinct, the factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. As I was required to interview the suspect in connection with my report on the injury to Patrolman Dowd, I rode to the hospital with Lieutenant King, Detective Vitale, and Anna Wagon in the detective squad car. The girl said nothing on the way, nor after we got out of the car and walked into the hospital. When the elevator stopped at the floor and we got out, she still had said nothing. It's down that way. Uh-huh. You better wait right here, Mrs. Wagon. I won't see him. You'll get to see him. Please. You sit down here and wait till we get through talking to him. All right. Right here. It'll be okay, yeah. You won't forget it? No, we'll call you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, she must be kind of rough on her. Yeah, Captain, it must be. What kind of place do they live in, Zeke? Uh, nothing fancy, Captain. Furnished room. Who's on the job as a guard here, Zeke? The Meister was, Lieutenant, but that was the 12 to 8 to I don't think he's had a chance to be relieved yet. Oh, yeah. in there. Hello, Meister. Captain. How's the patient? He seems okay, Lieutenant. He ate. Well, that's a good sign. How are you doing, Jack? Great. Yeah, I can imagine. This is Captain Kennelly and Lieutenant King. What do you say? Jack, how are you feeling now? Like a million dollars. You want to tell us how you got that bullet in the leg? Some guy was drunk and playing with a gun. It went off. I didn't come over here to listen to that kind of stuff, Jack. Well, what do you want from me? That's what happened. You're going to stick with it, huh? It's the truth. Excuse me, Captain, while you're here, can I be excused on a personal... Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Master. Yes, sir. And uh, while you're out there, ring in and find out where your relief is. Okay, I will, Captain. Yeah, what a deal he's got, huh? You think so? Sitting in a nice, soft chair, drawing a salary to see I don't run away. A big hole in my leg, and you need him to see that I don't run away. That's the job of the year. Who does he know? He knew a guy like you, Jack. A thief. A thief struck him in the chest with a knife. He was in the hospital six weeks. He's not over it yet. That's why he gets the soft job with the soft chair. Well, I sure walked into that one, didn't I? You sure did. Now, let's stop wasting time, Jack. I got plenty to waste. You're going to have a lot more. We'll see about that. Just because some guy got drunk and was playing with a gun. Now, come off it. We got the slug out of your leg. We're getting it matched up with the cop's gun. The 
that's not good enough for you. That cop will pick you out of a lineup with one eye closed. Now, you might have all the time in the world to waste, but I don't. How'd you get that bullet in the leg? All right. You win. I won before I started, Jack. I shot the cop, but I warned him. I told him to stay away from me. He can't say I didn't give him a warning. What's that supposed to get you? I don't know. Why'd you shoot him? It was just one of those things. Listen, will you hand me one of them tissues there? These? Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I don't know why. It was just one of those things. You shot him because you had a bag full of stuff you took out of that apartment on 79th Street there, didn't you? Oh. We got that worked out, too, huh? We've got everything worked out, Jack. Okay. I don't guess there's any use holding back anything. I made this apartment, see? I piled the stuff up and got a suitcase out of the guy's closet and put it all in there. Then I walked out and went over to 2nd Avenue. I wanted to get a cab and get out of there fast. So just my luck, where are the cabs? Not a cab in sight, no place. Yeah. So it's cold and I step back into the doorway there to keep a little bit warm while I'm waiting for a cab to come. And all of a sudden, a cop comes across the street. I didn't do nothing to attract his attention. First thing I know, he wants to talk to me. He asked me what I got in the bag, what my name is, and where I live. You told him your name is Elliot. Where'd you get that? Oh, I don't know. It was the first thing come into my mind. I, I got a friend, Elliot. Then he wants to see some identification. Well, I got no identification with Elliot on it, so I figured here I am. Unless I do something, I'm hooked. I got a bag full of goods. I got this gun in my pocket. I figure I'm dead for burglary. I'm, I'm dead for having a gun on my hip. I owe him a lot of short time. I mean, I can see him throwing away the key. So I, I decided to do something. To kill him? No. No, I swear. I swear not to kill him. All I wanted to do was get away from there clean. That's all. I mean, you can ask him. Ask the cop. Didn't I tell him to stay back from me? But he... He come at me. And you shot him. Oh, he asked for it. Has anybody ever asked for it? He did. I could have killed him if I wanted to, but I didn't want to. I just wanted to get out of there. So he sort of bunched up and I lit out. I ran down the block. Well, the first thing you know, he was shooting after me, and one of them shots caught me. But I kept on going. I knew it'd be crawling with law around there in a minute. So I cut over toward Third Avenue. Oh, boy, it was killing me. That leg was just killing me, bleeding. Just bleeding like crazy. What'd you do with the gun? I don't know. I threw it someplace. Down some cellar steps over there, I think. I threw it and I kept on going. I, I didn't even want to see it anymore. And I tried some doors and I went in the hallway and just sat there for about a half an hour, an hour, I don't know, until I thought it was okay. When I thought it was okay, I got up and I could hardly stand. That's how bad it was. But I got out on the street and went on over to 3rd Avenue and there was a cab there and I got in it. He just went a couple of blocks, maybe three. Started to get dizzy and that's that. And the next thing I know, here I am. Lennox Hill. The cab driver brought you in. <laughs> a big favor. Yeah, he's looking for you. It was 65 cents on the clock plus a mess in the back of his car. That chance he's got. So what happens to me now? I'll probably move you down to Bellevue this afternoon. Oh, this is so delightful. I'll enjoy it while you can. Captain, Lieutenant Gorman wants you to ring in when you get a chance. Okay, Marcia. Nothing urgent, he said. Somebody down in the Motor Maintenance Bureau wants to talk to you before noon. All right. Where's your relief, Marcia? On the way, Captain. You've been hitting a lot of flats in this precinct, haven't you, Jack? No. I ain't been working around here at all, I swear to you. Where have you been working the flats? I ain't been working any place. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with you, Jack. I've got a fistful of squeals on burglaries the last three or four weeks. I'm going to bring them over here this afternoon before you get moved to Bellevue. We're going to go over them one by one. You're going to tell me what flat you were in and what flat you weren't. I wasn't in any. And we'll have to take another look around your room. You must have a load of pawn tickets someplace. Another look? Were you there already? I was there, yeah. I just find out where I lived. It was in your pocket. Oh, yeah. Uh, did you see Anna? Yeah, I saw her. Did you tell her what happened? Yeah. 
Oh. Well, I guess she had to find out sometime, huh? She's all right, that kid. You know that? She's okay. Yeah, she looks all right. Too good for you. That's the truth. That's the sad truth. Does she know I'm here? I mean, that I was hurt? Yeah, she knows. What'd she say? Nothing much. Well, she must have said something. Well, I told her, but uh, she didn't believe it. That's Anna. <laughs> That's Anna for you. But she believes it now. She's outside there waiting. Oh? Is she? Yeah. Well, can I see her? Why not? My sister. It's all right, Captain. Pete and I are going. We'll send her in. Okay. You want to ride back to the house? No, I'll ring in and have a car come by. I have to go on patrol. Okay. We'll see you this afternoon, Jack. Yeah. See you later, my sister. Yeah, yeah. Take it easy. Oh, boy. Hey, listen. Could you give me another piece of that tissue there? I don't know where I got this coal. Must be from breaking into drafty flats. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's very funny. Yeah. Oh, and a baby. Can I come in? Yes, come in.
We'll be right in, my sister. How did you think he could get out even if you succeeded in passing him this gun? It wasn't for him. Obviously it was. You brought it here. Where did you get it? It was at home. He kept it at home. You carried it from your home to the station house to here? Yes. You see, when the detectives came and told me what happened, I, I didn't know what to do. They were searching all over the place, but he didn't look where it was hidden. Who hid it? You were Jack. Jack? He hid it, but I found it. I knew where it was. It was 3 o'clock in the morning when they came. I was asleep, so they asked me to get dressed and come with them. When they stepped out of the room, I went and got the gun and put it in my bag. To give to Jack? No. That's not so. Then why did you want to see him alone? To tell him I... I think I'm going to have a baby. Oh. The detective told me he out a policeman and that he was in terrible trouble. And he was going away. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to take care of the baby all alone. What people would say. I was back with worry. So I made up my mind. You were going to use it on yourself? Well, I'm saying to say it. That's the reason I brought it. Not to give to Jack. He had so much to worry about. I just wanted to get some of his worries out of the way. Do you want to go tell him now? Before we go? No. I don't think I'll tell him at all. I don't think it would make any difference to him. I wish there was some other place to go. Believe me. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, transcribed, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast, Lawson Zerbe, Frank Campanella, Elaine Roth, and Frank Moss. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hannah speaking. First Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Chasing him where? Now, who is it, a police officer? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what building did he run into? What is that, 452 or 492? Oh, was he man armed? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. No, you just stand there in front of the building. Tell them where to go, okay? Yeah. Thanks. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour 4 p.m. to 8 a.m., the weather had turned exceedingly cold, and consequently it had been a quiet night in the precinct. Cold weather, like rain, keeps the troublemakers off the streets. After my meal, I had gone out on patrol of the precinct in sector car number two with patrolman William Coley as operator, and I remained away from the station house until nearly 10 p.m., inspecting various conditions in the precinct and responding to several radio calls along with the sector cars and the sergeant. At 9.50, a call came over the air to ring into the station house. 
I instructed Patrolman Coley to stop at the nearest call box. Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, informed me that Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, wanted to see me as soon as possible on an urgent matter. I told the desk officer to inform Lieutenant King that I was on my way in. I instructed Patrolman Coley to drive to the station house, where, after stopping at the desk to sign the blotter, I walked through the back room, up the stairs to the second floor, and into the office of the 21st Detective Squad. Hello, Captain. Hello. Where's Lieutenant King? In his office, Captain. Uh, he asked me to ring in there when you got here. Okay. Who's with him? It's Patrick, Captain, and a suspect. Sergeant, would you ring Lieutenant King's line? Yeah, thank you. What's doing tonight, Pete? Oh, nothing too much, Captain. It's been pretty quiet. Battalion, Lieutenant. Captain Kennelly's out here. Okay. Yes, sir. He's coming right out, Captain. All right. Three guys were in here within an hour. Every one of them had his overcoat stolen. Mm, that's a sure sign of winter, Pete. Yes, sir. It's better than the calendar. Mm. Well, I'm glad you'd come in, Captain. It's all right, Matt. What have you got? Did you come over here a minute? Yeah. Pitts brought a boy in here. The boy's got a pretty wild story. About what, Matt? About a cop taking $700 off him. Yeah? Where? Up on Lexington Avenue. Well, can he identify the cop? He says he can. Who's he supposed to be? He just says he can identify him. He doesn't know who it is. Okay, who is this boy, man? His name is Augie Bookham. Yeah? He's been pushing narcotics up there as long as we know him. He's done two bits on it. Fitz spotted him on the street and went over to talk to him. He lit out. Fitz chased him into a building and collared him on the roof. Well, how does a cop taking $700 off him figure into it? Maybe you want to hear that from Augie. I'd like to. You think he's giving you a straight story, man? I don't know, Captain. But, Tally, Yes, sir? Hold up my calls for a while. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Captain. Oh, Fitz. Captain? Captain, this is Augie Bookham, Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the precinct. Glad to know you, Captain. You told these detectives a cop took $700 off you? Is that right? I wouldn't have told him if it wasn't. When was it? Tonight, about 8.30. Just a little while before he jumped me, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Where? Right up there, near there. He said he was standing under the marquee of that old picture house there, Captain. I was waiting to meet a fella. The car drove up and the cop got out to talk to him. The police officer was all alone? Yeah, all alone. By himself. And he was in a car? Yeah, squad car, you know. Do you know who this police officer is? Well, I don't know his name. I've seen him around the neighborhood. He's been around a long time. Was he in uniform? Yeah, he's in uniform. What kind of car was it? Regular police car, I told you that. Well, what did it say on the side of the car? What do you mean? Well, what was written there? Oh, uh, 2-1 precinct. I saw that, 2-1 precinct. All the men in cars ride with partners. Where was the other police officer? Listen, don't ask me. There was only the one. How come he stopped to talk to you? Were you causing a disturbance there? No, I was just standing there waiting for this friend of mine. Well, then how come he stopped? Listen, I'm the kind of a guy when a cop sees me, he stops to talk to me. Ain't that right? Ask Mr. Fitzpatrick here. I got a natural attraction for cops. All right. The car pulled up and he got out. What happened then? Well, listen, I told these fellas all about it. Let them tell you. I don't feel like going over and over it. You'll go over it plenty. You've come in here, Augie, and made a statement about a police officer being guilty of misconduct. The captain's job to find out the identity of that police officer. Oh. Well, you answer his questions. All right. If I got it, I got it. You got it. He got out of the car and walked over to you. Yeah. What did he say? I said, hello, Augie. He knew your name? I told you. Everybody knows my name. But you didn't know his. No, I didn't know. I didn't care. All right. Then what did he say? He said, when'd you get out? You see, I've been doing this bit over Rikers Island. What for? For the same old thing. Misdemeanor, Captain. Reduced from a felony on a plea of guilty. Then what? Well, I told him when I got out, so he said, maybe I'm going back. He said, stick my hands up against the wall there, and I did. He looked me over. Oh, what did he find? He found a $700. And what else? Well, I had six quarters of eight in my shed. He found them. An ounce and a half of heroin. Yeah, so he said, Augie, this time you get the book. No more Rikers Island. This is a big time rap for sure. And I said, well, what can I do? So he said, go on, get in the car. I started to go over and get in the car. Then he said, wait a minute. So I waited a minute. Yeah. And the cop said to me, he said, look, Augie, you're an idiot. I told him I agreed with him because I can count on myself to get in a jam like this every time. So he says, why do I lay myself open for a felony by carrying more than a quarter ounce? You see, the guy's called with more than an ounce. They got some gimmick that he's got it to sell, prima facie, something like that. Yeah, we know what the law is. Well, that's two to 15 years. Between a full ounce and a quarter ounce is still a felony, possession. 
But under a tort is a misdemeanor. It's just another couple months at Rikers Island. So? So I agreed with him I was an idiot. But I had to carry all that good because I was just going to make a meet. It was only my wish I had less than a quarter on me, or preferably none at the time. So he says, how would I like that wish to come through? I said, what do you mean? Then he says, supposing we only take a quarter into the station house. I was beginning to get the idea. I said, how could that be arranged? So he wondered, wouldn't I like to trade the 700 for about seven years? Yeah. Well, that didn't seem like too bad a trade to me. So he took five of the quarters and threw them in a pile of junk there. And he took the other quarter and the seven bills and put them in his pocket. And he said, come on. So we walked over to the car. Why didn't he bring you in? Wait, I'm coming to that. We walked over to the car. He opened up the door. He was thinking, I guess, when we walked over there. He had the seven bills. He didn't need me. So he, he put his foot up in the car. He said to me with a wink light, he said, Augie, I got to tie my shoe. When I got my back turned, don't you go walking away. Well, the way he said it, I figured that was just what he wanted me to do. Well, Rikers Island is better than 2 to 15, but nothing is better yet than Rikers Island. And so by the time he got through tying his shoe, I was halfway down the block already. Then what did you do? Well, I stood in the door down the block there till I saw him get in the car and take off. So I figured I'm out seven bills, but I'm off cheap. The five quarters were still laying there on a pile of junk where he threw it, under the old movie house there. So I walked back to get it. Why shouldn't I? I just picked it up. I'm heading back out, and somebody hollers, Augie. I looked around. It's him, Mr. Fitzpatrick. There I was with five quarters on me and not another cent to make a trade. So what was I going to do? I lit out. Him after me. Ain't that right? I took out RCRT, yeah. How far did you chase him, Fitz? Around the corner, Captain. I saw him duck into this tenement building. Started up the stairs and went all the way to the roof. I'd have been all right, too, except I didn't know the building. There was this big iron railing on the roof, so I couldn't jump the next roof. Did you still have the evidence on him when you called on him? Yes, sir. Now, that's the shaver, but I was so worried about getting away, I forgot all about it. I was carrying a load. What did he say to you when you called him? He wanted to know why we couldn't leave him alone. I told him if he'd stop pushing H, we'd leave him alone. Did he mention the $700 then? No, sir. Not until I was on the way back to the station house with him. What did he say? He said he'd take care of me if he had the money, but he didn't have the money just then. And he got high and mighty, so I told him about the other cop. What time was it that you called him, sis? About ten minutes after nine, Captain. And then it uh, would have been approximately between 8.45 and 9 o'clock that he met the officer under the theater marquee. Yes, sir, approximately. Would you say that's right, Augie? About right, yeah, approximately. Augie, would you be able to recognize this officer that took the $700 on you? Any place, any place in the world. Fitz? Yes, sir. Take him outside, Fitz. Get it down on paper. Again? Yeah, again. Yeah, all right. Come on, Augie. Hey, listen. Hey, what's all this going to get me? What do you want it to get you, Augie? Well, I mean, I'm entitled to some consideration, don't you think? You were colored with an ounce and a half of heroin in your possession. You know what that'll get you. All right, you got a cop that took $700 off me. You want to get that straightened out. You got me with an ounce and a half of H on me. I want to get that straightened out. I'll help you on that. You help me on this. We can trade out a little bit. Augie, you've done enough trading for one night. Take him outside. Yes, sir. Outside where? Come on, Augie. Come on, let's go. I'm going. Looks like a rough one, Captain. Yeah. I don't know. He tells a pretty straight story. With these bums, you can't believe a word they're saying. Don't kid yourself, Matt. He was pretty convincing. Oh, can I use this? Yes, sir. Police, police, precinct, Sergeant Waters. This is Captain Canelli, Sergeant. Yes, sir. How long have you been on TS duty? Since 8 o'clock, Captain. Have you taken your meal? All right, tell Lieutenant Gorman to get a man to leave you on the switchboard. Yes, sir. Then bring the radio log and the telephone switchboard record up to Lieutenant King's office. Right away, Captain? Yes, right away. Okay, Captain. Have you got any idea who it might be, Captain? We will have, Matt. As soon as we find out who it couldn't have been. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. Allegations of misconduct by members of the force are handled according to established procedure. In an organization of more than 20,000 men and women, incidents of this sort are anticipated and appropriate action is provided. In the event of delinquency, a delinquency that is of a minor nature, machinery is provided for disciplinary action following a departmental trial presided over by a deputy commissioner. On a determination of guilty at this trial, the punishment can range from a reprimand to dismissal from the department, depending on the nature of the complaint. 
If, as in this case, the allegations are of a criminal nature, a full investigation is made and the facts turned over to the district attorney concerned in one of the five counties that make up the city of New York. When the charges against a member of the force originate with a civilian, the desk officer of the precinct enters the complaint in the blotter exactly as recited. A transcript is then prepared and forwarded to the inspector commanding the division who assigns a superior officer above the rank of lieutenant to make an investigation. When the identity of the police officer concerned is unknown or uncertain, the commanding officer of the precinct must conduct a preliminary investigation to determine the identity. It was in this connection that I instructed Sergeant Waters to bring the telephone switchboard record and radio log to Lieutenant King's office. Yes. Sergeant Waters. Come in. Oh, come in, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, sit down here. Where do you want these, Captain? On the table, sir. Okay, Lieutenant. All right. Let's see your entries in the telephone switchboard record. For this tour? Yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, you've got five sector cars on the street. Yes, sir. Who's in them? Meister and Farrell are number one. Coley and Mercado are number two. And Hein and Ziegler are number three. Kane and Scully are number four. And Bolney and Barr are number five. Who's the operator of the sergeant's car? Romano, Lieutenant. Uh, was the sergeant's car on a job between, say, uh, 8.30 and 9.15? Look in the radio line. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They were down at Bellevue on an aided case. An auto accident on First Avenue. Child injured. They were at Bellevue from 8.40 to 9.05. Then back in 7. Well, that puts the sergeant's car out of it, Captain. Yep. Sectors 2, 4, and 5 come together pretty close up there. Uh, sergeant, were any of the men in sector cars 2, 4, or 5 taking a meal around that same time? Yes, sir. Bauer in car number five was on his meal period from eight to nine. Well, that means that Bolney was on patrol alone in the car during that time. Yes, sir. Oh, and McCarter was also taking a meal eight to nine. Coley was number two. And I was on patrol with Coley during that time. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. What about number four, Sergeant? Well, neither of them had a meal during that time. As a matter of fact, they were on a job. They had a case on 93rd Street, an old lady overcome from a gas case, one of those defective hot water heaters. Well, that kept them pretty well tied up until about 9.15. Yes, I was over there for a while. I saw them. Uh, Sergeant, you had these two jobs, the gas case and the child injured. You didn't instruct any of the other cars to move up into that territory during that time. No, sir. We were adequately covered up there. And see that telephone record, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Oh, see, this shows car five's ringing time is 35. Boldy rang in five minutes late, 8.40. Yes, sir. And what was his explanation? He told me he was on a job. There was a fight in the candy store, and he had a time breaking it up. His partner was taking his meal, then. Bolney was alone in the car. Yes, sir, that's right. Well, did he make any arrest? No, sir. He said it was just uh, three or four kids. He broke it up and sent them on home. And that's why he rang in five minutes late. That's what he said, Captain. That call box 14, that's up on Lexington near the closed movie house there, isn't it, Sergeant? That's right, Lieutenant. This fight, uh, did you get a call on that job, Sergeant? No, sir. Well, it wasn't broadcast. It doesn't show in the radio log. Well, Bolney told me he was riding by and someone flagged him down. What candy store was it, did he say? Yes, sir. He mentioned it was Mrs. Protea's yes. up there on 98th Street. You know the one, Captain. Yes, I know it. Okay, get back on the job, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Over. Oh, uh, should I take these with me, Captain? Yeah, take them along. Uh, thank you, Captain. Okay. Shut the door, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. You figure it might be Bolney, eh, Captain? Well, from the records, it couldn't have been anyone else. And he was alone in the car at the time. Partner was taking a meal. It all fits. Yes, sir. It all fits. It all fits too well. With Lieutenant King, I went downstairs into the muster room and around behind the desk where I signed the blotter. On the street, Lieutenant King directed me to the spot where the detective squad car was parked. We got into it and drove uptown on Park Avenue past block after block of fine apartment houses until we reached the point where the New York Central Tracks emerge from the 50-block tunnel to Grand Central Terminal. There, Park Avenue becomes a thoroughfare through the slums. We turned into 98th Street and drove until we came to the small candy store run by Mrs. Angelina Portia, a middle-aged widow who succeeded her husband in the business. Yeah, she's still open, Captain. Good. You want to talk to her? Or should I? Oh, I'll talk to her. Okay. What about Balney? Any previous complaints against 
No, nothing of any kind. Yeah, good. He's alone in there. Lieutenant King. Lieutenant King, Lieutenant King. We've met, we've met. Yes? When you caught the robbers, they came in here and took my money, and I came to the police station. Last year, remember? Remember when you caught the robbers, the two men? Oh, yes, I remember. Not the last time, when there was only one robber with a knife. It was the time before, when there were two robbers, one with a gun. Uh, the two boys from 113th Street. That's right. <laughs> What's the matter? You could never find the one robber with a knife, huh? He got more money from me. Maybe we'll still get him someday. Uh, Miss Portia. Yeah. Yeah, Captain. Oh, a nice soda, gentlemen, huh? A plain chocolate all with ice cream. No, no, thank you. Oh, go on, have a soda. No, thank you, Miss Portia. All right. Miss Portia, was there a fight in here tonight? A fight? Yeah, in the store here. Was there any kind of disturbance? Not a fight, exactly. The boys were in here, the boys from the block. An argument. There wasn't a fight? All right, it was a fight. But they didn't fight much, they didn't hit hard. The boys fight almost every night. Did a policeman come in and break it up? A policeman? Yeah, was there a policeman in here tonight? No, no policeman came in here. Excuse me, the telephone. You're sure? I'm positive. Hello? Who? Oh, he don't live here. This is the candy store. He lives upstairs next door. What? Yeah, you're sure? I'll tell him. What? Well, wait a minute. I I've got to write it down. Academy 2... What? Academy 2, 3098. I've got it. Who? Jose. All right. All right, I'll tell him. Very important. I won't forget. Goodbye. Yo, goodbye. Telephone numbers. I've got to take all I've got to do. Telephone numbers. No, uh, let me get this straight, Miss Portilla. You said that no policeman came into the store tonight. That's right. No policeman came into the store. Now, what about the fight? In here, it was no fight. Didn't get to be a fight until it was out on the sidewalk. Was there a policeman there? Yeah, sure. Who do you think stopped the fight? They would have been dead, those boys. Well, the fight started in here. In here, it wasn't a fight yet. It was still an argument. It was between Phil and Ricardo. Only this little Fernando butted in. Fernando was always turning an argument into a fight. <laughs> a big fight. I said, boys, boys, not in the store. So they went out on the sidewalk, and they hit and they poked. Well, they were killing each other with little Fernando right in the middle. I was out there. I tried to stop them. Man from next door tried to stop him. Nobody could stop him until the policeman came. How did he come? In a car. I saw the car come down the street. I got out in the middle and yelled and screamed. He stopped the car and he got out. He stopped the fight. Was he all alone? You mean any other cops? Yeah, more than? No, no, himself, that's all. Just himself. Now, how long did he stay here? Oh, a long time. Bill and Ricardo, as soon as he said stop, they stopped. But this little Fernando, he wanted to fight. He wanted to fight Phil. He wanted to fight Ricardo. He wanted to fight with everybody. Uh, was the officer here uh, 15 minutes, would you say? More. More. He had to first get Phil to go home, and then Ricardo. Fernando, he didn't want to go home. Policeman had to stand there with him and talk to him and talk to him. 15 years old, and he wants to fight like a bull. <laughs> so little like this, and all he wants to do is to punch and fight and hit. He, uh, was here about uh, 20 minutes, you'd say? The policeman or Fernando? The policeman. At least, at least 20 minutes. You remember what time this was, Miss Portia? Oh, tonight. It was tonight. Yes, but do you happen to remember exactly what time? Exactly what time. Now, let me see. All the news in the mirror went up yet. What time did the papers get here? Quarter to nine. Nine o'clock usually, sometimes in between. Oh, when the boys came in, I was listening to the radio to that, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. North. You know who I mean, uh, Pam and her husband. What time is that program on? It's 8 to 8.30, Captain. Yeah, Tom. yeah, 8 to 8.30 is right. And the fight started, and they ran outside, and I ran outside, and... I didn't get to hear who killed the lady of the program. Did you hear it? Do you know? No, I didn't hear uh, it. Were you out on the sidewalk until the policeman left? Then he left. Everybody left. I came inside the store, and Arthur Godfrey was on already. You know, with the contestants, I missed the first contestant. Beginning of the first contestant. I heard the last of him. Oh, and that must have been about uh, 25 minutes to 9. About, uh, yeah, about. Uh, you know this policeman that was here? Uh, not here. On the sidewalk, outside. Yeah, do you know him? To say hello, not his name. Okay, Matt. You're a captain. I don't think we need anything else. Thanks a lot, Miss Portia. You're a lot of help. Are you sure no soda? Positive, thanks. Bye. You keep your eye on that little Fernando, huh? We will, Miss Portia. Well, you better. So long. Bye, Miss Portia. Goodbye. 
Well, Captain, it just about puts everybody in the clear. Yeah, sure does. You got a match? Yes, sir. Sure. You know what I think, Matt? Here you go. Thanks. I think Augie was telling one great big lie from beginning to end. Well, there's no doubt about that, Captain. I'd just like to know why. What do you say we go and find out? We walked to the car, got in, and drove back to the station house. I stopped at the desk to sign the blotter, and Lieutenant King went on upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad, where Detective Fitzpatrick had Augie Bookham in custody. At the desk, Lieutenant Gorman told me that things were quiet in the precinct, and I walked through the back room, up the stairs, and into the Detective Squad office. Did uh, Lieutenant King go into his office, Deed? Yes, sir. He and Fitzpatrick uh, and that suspect. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Yes? Captain Canelli. Come in, Captain. Hello, Fitz. Captain. Captain, Augie's got a one-track mind. He still says the cop took $700 off him. Isn't that what you say, Augie? What's the truth? The honest to goodness truth. Now, look, Augie. You came in here with a wild story. We wasted an awful lot of time looking into it. There were five cars in this precinct. At the time you said you talked to that cop, every one of them was on a job or otherwise occupied. It's all a matter of record, black and white. Now, how about telling us the truth? You guys just want to protect this cop, that's all. I don't want to protect anyone, Augie. But I'm telling you that I'm not going to stand for a bum like you coming in here and giving us some line of bull about something that never happened, that he dreamed up. I wasted a lot of time on this, Augie. I want the truth right now. How about it? Okay, you want the truth. I'll give you the truth. That's what we want. Nobody took any 700 off them. They didn't, no. no. All right, tell me how you happened to dream it up. I was supposed I had 700. I was holding it for some guy, but I dropped it in a crap game. The tough guy's a real brute. I didn't know what I was going to tell him. So you figured the best thing to tell him was a cop to the office. Well, that'd be reasonable for him to believe, wouldn't it? I don't know, would it? Yeah, he'd believe that. See, he got collared yesterday. He's down the tombs now. I was supposed to take the 700 to a bondsman to make his bail. He's laying down there in the tombs getting madder and madder. What do you think he's going to do to me when I show up in the same jail? He's going to get the 700 out of my jaw one tooth at a time. i got to have a reasonable story for him. Yeah, sure. And almost ruin an officer's life. Well, I'm sorry about that. Augie, you've got a heart of gold. That's my big trouble, you know. But not your only trouble. You're telling me I'm up, I'm up to here with troubles. I'm sorry. What more can I say? Nothing, Augie. I think you said just about enough for one night. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, what do you mean he's missing? Missing from where? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how old is he? Twelve years or twelve months? Well, is that the residence there? What apartment number? What? All right, take it easy. Talk into the phone. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. And so it goes. Around the clock. Through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry go round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department. City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly. Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were John Shea, Bill Quinn, John Sylvester, and Abby Lewis. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Artana speaking. Artana speaking. Artana speaking. Artana speaking. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. We've got her here. Agent, what did you say your name was? 
Yeah, we've got the note here, too. It was a 20. Yes, sir. Let me connect you with the commander. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. We'll hold the suspect here. What time will you be here? Okay. Yeah. All right. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was a quiet morning in the precinct until 11.10 when Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, rang into my office to inform me that the second alarm had hit on a fire on York Avenue. Before a car could come by the house to take me to the scene, the third alarm had hit. When I arrived, the fire, which was in a dry cleaning plant, was under control. The fire officer in charge told me that he had ordered the third alarm turned in as a precautionary measure because of the highly combustible material in the place and the proximity of the blaze to a public school. The fire was out at 12.10, and I returned to the station house to clean up my paperwork. At 12.35, I went out into the muster room, signed the blotter, and walked out the front door of the station house to take my meal in a restaurant on Lexington Avenue. As I turned the corner into Lexington Avenue, I saw a man in shirt sleeves holding on to the arm of a young woman. He struggled to get away as I hurried toward him. Oh, no, you don't. All right, what's the trouble here? Oh, don't. Oh, Captain, come on. Let me go. I might be able to see you. All right, what's the matter? You're hurting my arm. Please. Oh, I'd let her go, Mr. Silken. She won't run away. I don't even know what I'm supposed to have done. Any counterfeit money, that's what you did. Counterfeit money. I did not. Look at this, Captain. Just look at it. Does this look real to you? Did you give him that $20 bill? I don't know whether I gave him that one. I gave him a $20 bill. I went in and both had the cigarettes. You bet your life you gave it to me. Where else would I have gotten it? When did this happen? Just now, Captain. Just this minute. Well, we'd better get inside your store and talk this over, Mr. Token. You're standing out here in your shirt sleeves. It's kind of cold. Yeah, it is. I'll agree with you. All right, let's go in. I don't see why I have to go any place. Well, you'd better come inside. Has uh, she been a customer before, Harry? I've never seen her in my life, Captain. Never. I don't have to be a customer. I wanted a pack of cigarettes, and I walked into a stationery store. I have to be a regular customer to buy a pack of cigarettes. All right, let's go in. What would I be doing with that? I don't know, but I'm not going to get stuck for it. Now, what happened? Well, I, I was right there, Captain. I was behind the counter, and she came in, and she gave me this phony I bill. I did not give you a phony bill. Well, what do you call this? Look at it. Why didn't you notice it at the time? Yeah. Why did you wait until she got out on the street? That's what I'd like to know. Well, because she was talking to me. She was talking to Blue Street. I was just asking the best way to get to the Bronx from here. Yeah, and I keep telling her, but she don't understand, and I keep telling her again. Meantime, she's got the cigarettes, and I'm making change for the 20. Go on, search her, Captain. Search her right now. I bet she's got a fist full of them with her. I have not. Go on, go on, search her. I can't do that, Mr. Silver. Well, this 20 is definitely a fist. You can see that. Anybody can see that. All right, now, just a second. We'll get it straightened out. I'm willing to get it straightened out. So am I. What's your name, Miss? Gloria Combs. Where do you live? 16 Perry Street. In uh, Greenwich Village? Yes. Yeah. Well, what are you doing in this neighborhood? You passed with the 20 on me. That's what you were I was doing. not. I was on my way to the Bronx. Well, this is a long way from the Bronx. I know it is. I took the wrong train at 14th Street. Somebody told me I should have gotten the 8th Avenue subway instead of the Lexington Avenue subway. So I got off and I came up and I was going to take the cross-town bus to get the 8th Avenue. That's why I got off here. Oh. What were you going to do in the Bronx? I'm on my way to see somebody. Yeah, and on your way, you got to stick me for $20. I did not. You did come in here and buy a pack of cigarettes. Yes. And you did give him a $20 bill. Yes, of course I did. I gave him a good $20 bill. You gave me this. I did not. All right, all right. Now, uh, Miss Combs, would you mind opening your purse and emptying the contents out on the counter? Do I have to? Uh, now, now we'll see something. No, you don't have to, but it would help. You want to see if I have any counterfeit in my purse. Is that the idea? If I have any more of those? That's part of it, yes. Well, I don't. Well, why don't you show us? Well, all right, if that'll get it straightened out. It'll help. <laughs> it's perfectly 
ridiculous. Now, you see, there's the chase in the 20, Captain, that I gave her. But she didn't even have time to put it in the wallet. She was in such a hurry. All right. You can put those back in your bag. The lipstick and the comb. All right. And the cigarette. Uh, would you mind opening up your compact? There's nothing in there except powder and a powder pack. Well, would you mind opening it up anyway? All right. Ding. Okay. Put that back in your purse. Now, look in the wallet, Captain. We'll get to it. Let's see inside your change purse, Miss Stone. There's nothing but change in there. Well, let's see. All right. There. Do you have any identification in your wallet? Well, I got this card. No, in case it gets lost. Please, where it comes, see if it's too safe. Do you have a driver's license? I don't drive. Do you have any other identification? No, that's it. This is good enough, isn't it? That's the identification I've got. All right. Can we see what bills you have inside your wallet? I don't see why I have to go through all this. I mean, honest to goodness. This is why you have to go through it, young lady, because you give me the fifth, that's why. I did not. Let's see the bills that you have inside the wallet for money. All right. Empty everything out of your wallet, if you don't mind. I don't have much. Mm-hmm. How much is that? Count it. Five, six, seven, eight, nine dollars. Now, look, I know I didn't give him that $20 bill. I, I, I just know it. I gave him a good win. I'm sure of it. But rather than stand here and be humiliated, I'll give him the $20. I'll, I'll just give it to him. Well, that, that's, that's a fair proposition. And I have the change from the 20 and nine dollars more, and I'll give him back his 20 I just know that the $20 bill I gave him was fine. It was perfectly good. Oh, I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing to let it go with that, Captain. I don't want to cause him any trouble. It's just that I don't see why I should get stuck with a fist. Well, it's not that easy, Mr. Silver. Oh, it's simple enough for me if that's what she wants to do. Miss Combs, when you came in here and bought a pack of cigarettes, you had $9 and the $20 bill. You had $29, right? Yes, that's right. Why didn't you pay for the cigarettes with a $1 bill instead of the 20 I don't know. I just did. There's no law against changing a 20, is there? No. Oh, uh, Harry, take that pen and write your name and address across the face of the bill. What for? Just so you can identify it later. Oh, I can identify it. Go ahead, write your name there. All right, if you say so. I just don't want to spoil it. Well, if it wasn't worth anything in the first place, you can't spoil it. The question of all counterfeiting of United States notes, coins, securities, and all other obligations of the federal government is the job of the United States Secret Service, one of the several law enforcement agencies of the Treasury. In accordance with the sections of the manual of procedure relating to such cases, I took the counterfeit $20 Federal Reserve note into my possession from Harry Sokin, the stationary store proprietor, and requested that the young woman he claimed passed it on him accompany me to the station house. There, when we walked into the muster room, Sergeant Waters was sitting in his desk office, and Patrolman Mercado was on telephone switchboard duty. All right, step right up to the desk, Captain. Captain. I mean, what's this all about? You're, you're not arresting me, are you? No, you're not under arrest. Where is uh, Lieutenant Gorman, Sergeant? Taking his meal, sir. Oh. Well, Harry Sultan claims this young woman passed a counterfeit $20 note on him. Yes, sir. I did not. I gave him a perfectly good $20 bill. Ring down to CB and tell them to notify the Secret Service. Yes, sir. Uh, have you got the note, Captain? Yes. Uh, Avocado, give me CB on here. I think that's awful, causing such trouble for someone who comes into his store. A customer. Well, we'll get it straightened out. I hope so. Hello, CB. I only hope so. Roger Waters at the 21st. Did you notify the Secret Service that we're holding a counterfeit $20 note in the suspect? A suspect? Is that what I want? Okay. A suspect? Yeah. Well, that's the general description for you. Oh, this is a fine how do you do. I know I didn't give him any counterfeit money. I, I swear it. And even supposing it just happened to be. I mean, just supposing. Then all that happened was somebody gave it to me and, and I didn't know it. And here I am in a police station under arrest. You're not under arrest. Well, at least I'm a suspect. That's what he called me, a suspect. I don't want to be a suspect. I really don't. Captain. There's Lieutenant King. Oh, Matt. Hello, Captain. Uh, this is Miss Gloria Combs, uh, Lieutenant King. Miss Combs? How do you do? Lieutenant King is commander of the 21st Detective Squad. What's the trouble, Captain? You know uh, Harry Silken? Warns the stationary, sir? Yeah. 
He claims Miss Combs used a $20 counterfeit note to buy a pack of cigarettes. Is that the note? Yeah. We'll take a look at it. Yes, yes. I bought a pack of cigarettes with a $20 bill, but I don't know whether it was that one or not. Looks pretty good. Until you look close. I guess that's the idea. Sergeant, did you notify the Secret Service? Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Who's I'd like to know what happens to me. After all, I can't stay around here all the time. I have things to do. You know, you just can't hold somebody in here with no reason at all. I, I mean, after all... It won't be too long. It's been too long already. I was so embarrassed on the street there. And then coming to the police station like this. I don't see what I did anyway. I'll tell you what you did. You had $9 and lots of change in your pocketbook. And you use that 20 to buy a pack of cigarettes. Well, what's that? I mean, you're not going to hang me over something like that. No, but you came pretty close to hanging yourself. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. People who smoke for relaxation are the most liable to relax themselves to death by smoking in bed. In spite of frequent warnings, some people go right on doing it and getting away with it until that one time. That's all it takes. They relax themselves to sleep, leaving unguarded cigarettes to smolder, to start fires, to claim their lives. Never smoke in bed. It's fatal too often for gambling. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Tonelli. Within five minutes, Sergeant Waters, acting as desk officer, received a telephone call from Agent Theodore Moss of the United States Secret Service, Treasury Department, which had been notified by the Communications Bureau. Sergeant Waters transferred the call to me, and I informed Agent Moss of exactly what had happened. He asked me to describe the counterfeit bill to him over the phone. I did. It was a $20 note on the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. It appeared to be a reproduction from a photo engraving. I gave him the serial number, the check letter, the faceplate number, the backplate number, and the series in Bicia. He told me that he was familiar with this counterfeit, that it had appeared in some quantity in the Chicago area and on the West Coast, but it was beginning to turn up with some frequency in the New York area. He said he would come uptown to the station house immediately and ask that we detain the young woman, Gloria Combs, so he could interrogate her. While we waited for the Secret Service agent to arrive, I took her upstairs to Lieutenant King's office in the 21st Detective Squad on the second floor. She complained that she was hungry, and I sent her the luncheonette around the corner for sandwiches. As she ate, Lieutenant King continued the effort to get some information from her. And how long have you lived at 316 Perry Street? Oh, they didn't put any mustard on this sandwich. I specifically asked for mustard. Yeah, well, that happens sometimes. Oh, I guess it's better than nothing. What did you say? I asked you how long you lived at 316 Perry. Oh, about a month, I guess. What have you got there, an apartment? Mm-hmm. You want to call it that. It was really just a furnished room. Very tall in the apartment. So where did you live before that? Mm-hmm. Before 316 Perry? Excuse me. Yes. Um, that's as long as I've been in New York. Where'd you come from? Indianapolis. Are you working? Well, I haven't been. That's why I was going to the Bronx to see about this job. There was this ad in the paper for a key punch operator, and that's exactly what I did back home. So I thought that would be ideal. Hmm. It's really kind of dry without my skin. I mean, if I could have at least put a little butter on it. Have you been working since you got to New York? Oh, I really haven't looked. What have you been living on? Well, I had a little money saved, and I worked back home for a year without a vacation, so I had a vacation money, too. I mean, I'm entitled to a vacation, don't you think, so I go look for a job? Why did you come to New York in the first place? Well, to be honest with you, there's this boy from back home. He's in the Coast Guard and he's stationed here. I mean, he's on a boat. When the boat comes in, it always comes into New York. We're, we're thinking of getting married. Well, this, this is really getting very silly. I mean, to be sitting on a police station like this, all because that stationary man's word. I didn't give him any counterfeit money. Where would I get it? You said you had a little money when you came to New York. How much did you have? I'm not kind of personal. Well, we're just trying to find out where that bill came from. Oh. How much did you have? Well, after I got my ticket, there was about $250. Running close to that one way or the other. You had that much cash when you came to New York? Mm, stop. Did you deposit the $250 in the bank when you got here? No, I didn't deposit it. I thought I needed to live on it. I've been using it to live on. 
Well, what's the use of depositing it when I, I have to take it right out? Were there $20 bills in that $250? Sure, there were $20 bills. There were $20 bills and then tens and fives. Then you must have brought this $20 bill from Indianapolis. Oh, I don't know. I guess so. Only I mean, I'll keep track of every bill. How do you like that? I know where I got it. Where? When I quit my job and got my last paycheck. It was for the last week of work and two weeks vacation pay. It was a pretty good check. I mean, it was about... $150? Yes. Well, I was getting ready to come to New York, and I owed this little bill in the grocery store. So I gave him the check, and he took out the amount for the little bill and gave me the rest. About $135, 140 gave me. That's why I must have got it. How do you like that? I don't think he'd do anything like that to me. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, well, maybe he didn't realize it. You, you know what I like about sandwiches in New York? We get such good rye bread. I mean, they, they don't put so much meat on it they do back home, but I like the rye bread. Yeah. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Mm-hmm. Well, of course. Yes, yeah, he's here. Captain Sergeant Waters on the line for you. Okay, thanks. 21st Precinct, Captain Canelli. Sergeant Waters, Captain. Agent Mark of the Secret Service is down here at the desk. Okay, ask him to come up. He wants to know if he can meet you out in the hall first. All right. Outside the squad office at the head of the stairs. Yes, sir. I'll tell him. Okay. It's Moss. He's here. Good. Moss, who? Is that about me? It's the Secret Service man. My goodness. This is a lot of trouble, isn't it? All I did was buy a pack of cigarettes. Is he coming up, Captain? Yeah. Uh, you got to meet him out in the hall. I'll take him home. Yes, sir. I can't help if that fell out in Indianapolis saving that $20 bill. I'll be right back. Can I help something like that? That's not my fault. That's right. I'm glad to know you, Captain. Thanks for helping us out. That's all right. Here's that note he shoved. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the cargo stuff. What I told you about. How about the girl? What did she have to say for herself? Well, we've been talking to her. She says she brought about $250 in cash from Indianapolis a month ago. Mm -hmm. That's why she thinks she might have gotten it. Mm -hmm. She didn't have any more in it? No, there wasn't any more in her pocketbook. What she had in there was just what I told you, the change from the 20 and $9 more. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a possibility there might be some more hidden in her clothing, but we'd have to book her and get a policewoman up here to search her. You want to go in? Uh, yes, sir, Captain. That way. Thank you. Are they keeping you fellows busy down there? Well, they've been getting busy since these 20s began to show up. Mm -hmm. Captain Canale, come in. Go ahead, Miss Moore. Thank you. Lieutenant King, Mr. Theodore Moss. Moss, glad to know you, Lieutenant. And this is Miss Gloria Combs, Agent Moss of the United States Secret Service. How do you do? Gloria Combs, huh? Yes, sir. Well, that name is as phony as this $20 bill, isn't it? No. What gives you that idea? I mean, that's my name, Gloria Combs. When did you change it from Annette Spriggio? Me? Yeah, you. My name has always been Gloria Combs. I mean, I don't, I don't know what gives you the idea of something else. This does. This picture. Oh. Now, oh, where's Phil? Did he come to New York with him? Now, look, Annette. Let's not waste any more time. You've been lying to these officers all morning. I know all about you, so let's have it straight. All right, if you want it straight. Uh, uh, where can I put this? It's a very good sandwich. Thank you very much. She and her husband, Mr. Phil Spriggio, have been shoving this stuff from Chicago on east. He made a good pinch, Captain. It wasn't his fault. It was that stationary store man. He kept screaming. He came out on the sidewalk and grabbed me. Where's Phil? He gave an address, 316 Perry Street. Well, he's not there. You can count on that. Isn't that right, on that? He's not there. I'll tell you how they've been working this. Her husband's got to take it down to some fine points. He gives her one counterfeit note, just one. She goes into the store and he waits across the street. She makes a small purchase and gets changed. Most of the time it works. She comes out, walks down the block. Her husband crosses over and they meet. He gives another note and she goes into another store. Well, not so close to the first one. Yeah, it has to be 
pretty far away. Yeah, well, the idea is that if the person she tries to show the counterfeit on screen, she says a mistake and gives back the money. Usually they take the money back. If they ever do call the cops on them, she's got no more counterfeit on a person. She rolls those sad eyes and says she made a mistake or somebody gave her the bill or some long, sad story like that. And she winds up hitting the bricks. It didn't work this time. Better than that. No. Yes, it didn't. Where'd you get that name, Gloria Combs? I don't know. Just decided it was a nice name. Where are we going to find film? I don't know. Now, look, Annette. We're not going to waste any more time with you. Where are we going to find him? I don't know. I have many ideas. Want to see you across the street when you went into that stationery store? Yes, there. You think he saw the man come out of the store after you? I guess so. I mean, that's, that's what he's supposed to be over there for, to watch and see what happened. You think he saw me? Yes, I'm sure he did. Well, where is he? I don't know. Now, look. You're in here. He's out there. You love him enough to take all this by yourself? I love him. I love him plenty. I mean, he's my husband. Yes, but uh, what kind of marriage would it be with you in and him out? It wouldn't be any kind of marriage at all, would it? Where can we find him? Well, I don't know that exactly. I don't know where you can find his car. Where? He left it over there to be six. Not very far from here. On what street? I don't know exactly which street it is. It's the next one after the street was the elevator train. Second Avenue? Yeah, I think so. Second Avenue. Where on Second Avenue? I don't know. I mean, not exactly. Can you show it? All right. I'm so good. But it's a shame. I think this is going to bust up on that. Well, don't worry about it. You'll do for a long separation anyway. The counterfeiting suspect, Annette Spridgeo, alias Gloria Combs, was taken downstairs and put in the detective squad car. After driving down 2nd Avenue twice between 79th and 57th Streets, he finally pointed out an auto repair shop. Lieutenant King and Agent Moss went into the place and talked to the proprietor. A car answering the description given by Annette had been left for repair and promised at 5 p.m. A plant was put on the place by detectives of the 21st Squad and Secret Service agents. The suspect in custody was returned to the station house and booked on charges of violation of Title 18, Chapter 25, United States Code. A policewoman arrived from the 19th Precinct and searched the prisoner. No additional evidence was found on her person. Federal law put certain restrictions on the action of government law enforcement officers in making an arrest and searching a suspect without a warrant. These restrictions do not apply to New York officers operating under state law if they have reason to believe the suspect guilty of a crime. It was planned, therefore, that detectives make the arrest of Philip Spriggio with Secret Service agents assisting. Lieutenant King and Agent Moss were sitting in a parked car just up the block from the garage. Other detectives and agents were planted across the street and down the block. The suspect had not shown up by 5 p.m. At 5.20... He had still not arrived. What time does this fellow close up the garage? Six o'clock, he said. Said he told still there. Mm-hmm. Said he told him the car would be ready by five, and that he closed it at six. No, oh, this fellow has got any sense. You forget about the car. I'm not sure. Oh. If we make this collar, it'll cure an awful lot of headaches, huh? <laughs> You're telling me. They're starting to hang that paper all over New York. We got the press and the plates back in Chicago about six weeks ago. Phil and his wife made a buy of this counterfeit just about three days before we got the place. What do they have to pay for this stuff? Well, the information we got shows they made a pretty good buy. Thirty cents on a dollar. They bought a thousand of them. man coming. Brown coat, brown hat. Yeah. That him? Wait till he gets a little closer. Yeah, it looks like him. Yeah. Going in the garage. All right, let's go. Yeah, that's him. That's him for sure. Okay, let's get him.
Tokyo. Me? Police officer, hold still. Well, listen, what's the idea? Get up against that car. Lean over there. Well, listen, Can you hear me? Lean up against them. All right, hold still. I want to know what this is all about. Let's find out what this is all about. That's what you're looking for, Morris? A roll big enough to choke a horse. Yeah, this is the stuff. All right, straighten up. Come on, straighten up. Okay, take it easy. What did you come back for, Phil? Didn't you know she'd tell us we'd be waiting? I don't know. You got me. I don't know why. You already lost a wife today. Losing his wife and his car on the same day would be just too much. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah? Well, who is it? His wife? Or do they live there? Can somebody stop him from beating her up? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone.